Hey everyone, I hope everyone is having a good week so far. I just wanted to let you all know that this video will contain two new stories in the beginning. And the third story will be my original story that I wrote from the previous video. I know some of you all were having issues with it and I really do apologize for this. I did contact YouTube and they basically said it was a listener error, which was weird because I know some of you all could listen while others couldn't. Again, I'm really sorry for this and I hope you all can listen to it on this video. The rest of the video will contain all my news stories from the month of July, giving everyone the opportunity to catch up. If you have been listening, then I hope you all can enjoy the first few stories and just let the video play as you fall asleep. Thank you all so much again for your support, every single second and every comment that you all drop and give on this channel. I really do appreciate it. And just remember, as you're falling asleep, do not be swayed by the voices that you think you know. As many of you might already know, many Navajo people, including my own family, are very reluctant to speak about skinwalkers because it is believed to attract their attention. However, I grew up away from the Navajo Nation and was very naive about the subject. When it came to skinwalkers, I was an absolute skeptic. My mom used to tell a story of how back in the 80s when she lived with her siblings and my grandparents, who are still in Shiprock, about how she and my aunt saw a skinwalker just outside her driveway under a street light. She described it as a black dog with dirty fur, a twisted noodle-like front leg, and these unnatural eyes with a soft burnt orange glow. Me, being my own close-minded self, doubted every word. But I never said my doubts out loud. But these doubts totally changed last year when I went to my grandparents' house last October. Me and my family had just finished coming from the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair. The house was close enough where we could walk home in just 10 minutes. So we did. When we got there, it was around 9 p.m. And we stayed up until 2 a.m. Catching up about family affairs and the local news. It was at that time that I decided to open my mouth and ask the question. Are skinwalkers real, y'all? I asked. You shouldn't be speaking about that, my grandma said with a disturbed tone. So she and my grandfather both decided to go to bed. After being scolded by my mom, one of my aunts chimes in with a very cautious tone and says, Oh, they're real. I had a few stars screaming outside my trailer in Farmington just a few nights ago, and your cousin had nightmares the whole night and woke up crying that morning. Not wanting to push the discomfort any further, we all decided to go to bed. Now the trailer home is pretty old and it was a really nice night, so we slept with the windows open with screens to prevent bugs coming in. Everyone had drifted off to sleep, except me. Why? Because my mind was still going on a million miles about skinwalkers. And I wonder if I ever encounter one while here on the reservation. As a kid, I was told it's taboo to think about skinwalkers because it can still call their attention. And that's when shit totally hit the fan. Just as I was finally getting relaxed for sleep, I started to hear something moving outside. I get up from the couch and start walking towards the kitchen window. In the trailer, all the rooms have the lights out. So the only visible light that can be seen is from the porch light out front. I was thankful for this because I told myself that if it was really a skinwalker outside, then hopefully it wouldn't notice me seeing it. So I muster up the courage and take a quick scan of outside. From the porch light, all I can see is the dusty ground and the vehicles that my family drove along with some old metal trash cans that stood beside the road. Looking for about a good five seconds, I wasn't able to see anything, so I was getting ready to turn around and walk back to bed, thinking it was just a stray cat or something. I must have only taken about two steps, 
when I hear what sounded like a distorted scream coming from outside, definitely close by. With fear rising, I look outside again and there I see it. A coyote-like figure was staring at my direction from behind the cars, just outside of the reach of the porch light. Only, it looked wrong and gave off an evil vibe just from seeing it. It was gray with a horrific orange-red soft glow that came from its eyes. I ran back to the bedroom. It was at this moment that I began to notice an awful stench in the air that smelled like rotten meat. I started trying to wake up my mom who was like, It's almost 3 a.m. What do you want? I immediately began in a shaken voice. There's something scary outside. Then she said, now annoyed because I woke her up. It's most likely a stray animal or something. It's the rest. Animals wander all the time at night. She obviously wasn't getting the drift of what I was saying. So I screamed. There's some Blair Witch Project shit going on outside, mom. That got her attention. What the hell are you talking about? She said. Then we heard it. The thing outside started making more of its dreadful like screams and started what sounded like trashing outside on the ground. You hear that? That's what I'm talking about. So both her and I got back up, looked outside the window, and the coyote thing was making its way to the door. It was walking with an odd limp and dragged its back right leg. We could hear it start to scratch against the door. My mom went and got my dad, and they both started shouting in Navajo, all sorts of words telling the thing to go away and saying it's not welcome here. All this commotion was enough to get the rest of the trailer up as they came out into the hallway. The only thing my mom did was turn to them and said, Skinwalker, while proceeding to point to the door. Apparently, they already knew exactly what to do, as my grandfather got out a handgun from a drawer and a bag of ashes. He coated a few bullets and loaded them into the gun and went straight to the door, yelling out more Navajo that was too fast for me to comprehend. He swung open the door and fired twice. Nothing. The thing was able to escape. That's the fastest one I ever seen, said my grandpa. Next thing you know, the rest of my family and my parents are freaking out about what just happened, saying stuff like, what if it comes back tomorrow? And it saw all of us. Does that mean we're targets now? Afterwards, my grandparents calmed everyone down, myself included, saying that we'll all be fine. The morning comes, and my grandparents call one of their neighbors and explain to them what happened. Apparently, one of them is a medicine man who used to partake in Navajo ceremonies used for healing and curing sickness. And so he came over to bless each family member and also the grounds outside. So this happened last year in Virginia and it's also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time and we ended up with a three day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and I let my roommate and my family know where I was going. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail would stop. I went inside to grab a map of the area just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned the trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and swimming area. This piqued my interest so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and parents about the new trail and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was gonna be a side trip for my journey. I was planning three days, two nights, I started on part of the Appalachian Trail and it was pretty packed with people and some of them were actually really fun to talk to. 
As I got more far from the main trails, I saw less and less people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even the wind, and I had this eerie feeling. I shook everything off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and to be honest, it wasn't all that, but it was pretty cool to look at. Plus, it had a good sized area to swim in. So naturally, I ended up taking a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. It was chill bill because it was stuck in my head. And that's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me. So I went back and forth with it and it would just repeat whatever I whistle. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I had this eerie feeling again, but this time it felt like somebody was watching me. As night fell, I ended up building a small fire and let my jet boil to make dinner. As I was doing this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just silence. Some part of my brain was actually telling me that I'm not safe and that I should leave, but I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my campsite was completely trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was a crafty animal chewed through the rope and got at the bag, but I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bare footprints all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from a road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look that way, but I saw nothing. But then, I heard the whistling again. My same whistle from yesterday, but it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end, and this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed my camp as fast as I could. The whistling got closer as I finished packing my tent into the bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away correctly. The whistling was getting louder, and it sounded like it was coming from all directions. I actually got fed up with the whistling, and I yelled into the woods. What the fuck do you want? Then, the whistling stopped, and it was quiet for a moment. Then it repeated what I said. What the fuck do you want? In my own voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted. Like it came from an old TV. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on, and ran the direction I came. I heard it moving just behind me, fast, switching between the whistle and my voice. Whoever, or whatever it was, it felt like it was playing with me. Not coming too close, but not being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got further and further away from me. Then it stopped suddenly. I stopped and turned around. I wish I hadn't. The most bone-chilling screech ever coming from right next to me. That's when I quickly just started running again. I didn't even look where I was going. I just ran. After what felt like hours of running, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of fear in my face and asked if it was me that screamed. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down the same area I had just come from. The three of us ended up moving to a more populated trail as quickly as we could. And as soon as I got back in my vehicle, I drove to one of the park ranger stations and reported what happened. Because the campsite was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction. However, they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. And when I was getting into my vehicle, that's when I heard it. The chill bill tune coming from the woods just in front of me. I quickly sped away 
and I never drove so fast in my life. When I got back and told my roommate what happened and why I was already back after one night, the only thing he said was, bro, what the fuck, I'm never going camping with you. Our annual camping trip was always a perfect time to get away from the daily busyness of life. A way to reconnect with nature and each other. It's something we had been doing since we had gotten out of high school. Every summer, my friends and I would choose a different, often remote location to explore and go camping. And so this summer, the six of us, Sarah, Mike, Jennifer, Luke, Emily, and I decided to go further up north in Utah into the Wasatch Cache National Forest. When the day finally arrived, we met at dawn. We had decided to take my beat up old van that my father had given me as a graduation gift after high school, around six years or so. It was a family possession that was being passed down, so you can imagine what it looked like. I do gotta say, even though I was embarrassed about it at first, it is still running and getting me from point A to point B without any issues. It was spacious and had enough seats for all of us to ride together, even with all of our gear, which included all of our tents and camping stuff. The drive to the National Forest was beautiful and it also had amazing views. The road stretched before us as hours passed and the landscape shifted from small roads to being surrounded by dense trees. We share stories and the occasional debate about the best path to take to reach our destination. Sarah, who was sitting in the front passenger seat, looked at the map that she had spread out, her finger tracing the various roads they could take. All right, folks, we got a couple of options here. The main road will take us through the heart of the forest but this secondary road might offer a more scenic journey. Before venturing into the wooded pines of Utah, we stopped by one of the local forest offices to gather information. Google and iPhones couldn't always be relied upon in these remote areas, so Sarah had purchased a detailed local paper map. She was always the one planning every trip down in detail. I know we're used to having technology guide us, but out here, it's best to rely on good old fashioned paper, she said holding up the map with a grin. Mike, who was sitting behind me leaned ahead, squinting at the map. Scenic is good, but how well maintained is that secondary road? The last thing we want is to get stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. Well, the map does say it's a bit longer, but it looks like it leads through some interesting landmarks. There's an old bridge marked here and it seems like a more direct path to the campsite, Sarah said. Luke, who was sitting in the far back, raised an eyebrow with a grin. An old bridge, huh? Are we talking wooden planks or Indiana Jones-style adventure? Jennifer laughed. Let's hope it's somewhere in between. I'm all for adventure, but I'd rather not end up in the river. Leo, as the driver, what do you think? Sarah asked me. Well, seeing that we still have sunlight on our side, I say we take the scenic road. I mean, what's the rush, right? I vote for the old bridge. I'm gonna say the old bridge as well. Why don't we take a vote, Emily said. Everyone raised their hand except Mike. Sorry, Mike. Maybe next time you'll win, Sarah said. A decision had been reached. The secondary road, with its promise of scenic beauty. I veered onto the road, the wilderness and trees closing in. The path was narrow flanked by dense woods that only gave way to small rays of the sunlight. After hours had passed and the sun began to set, we found ourselves coming across the bridge that spanned the river, the water reflecting the fading light, a contrast to the woods that lay ahead. It looks like this is the old bridge Sarah mentioned, Mike remarked as I slowed down the van. Sarah peered out of the window, her eyes scanning the bridge. It definitely has that rustic charm, but I hope it's sturdy enough to support the van. Luke's grin returned as he leaned, his excitement evident. Well, there's only one way to find out. Jennifer laughed. All right, but if we end up in the river, Luke, 
you're swimming back to the campsite. I'm not gonna lie, I was nervous. The bridge looked like it was a mixture of concrete and wood. What if we didn't make it? When was the last time this bridge was used? I eased the van slowly onto the creaky bridge, not even knowing what the point of driving slowly was, because if it was to break, it was gonna break. The worn planks made noises beneath the weight of the van as the river flowed gently below. I looked in the rear view mirror to see everyone's scared faces as we crossed, still maintaining my eyes on the road back and forth. I saw Emily's eyes as she gazed out the water below. This is something like an adventure out of a movie, isn't it? I'm expecting to see hidden treasure on the banks, she said. Mike chuckled, his grip steady on one of the handlebars. Yeah, you're right. We're gonna find out what adventure this is if we end up falling, because you all decided to come through this raggedy bridge. Mike was always the more serious one, but courageous in the group. He always took challenges head on, and nothing ever seemed to scare him. Luke was the joker of the group. His sense of humor was always there, even in the most serious moments. Sarah, on the other hand, was our friend who was the most caring of the group. As I said, she always assumed the role of our mom, always making sure everything is planned to the detail. Emily was just silly all around. She was a close friend of all of us that we simply enjoyed her company. She was the most serious female of the group, but didn't have the seriousness of Mike. Well, if that even makes sense. We ended up making it across the bridge, which I do want to point out, it's not even a long bridge. It simply looked like a small construction bridge that someone built to be able to get across. As the sun started going down, we continued driving with the trees closing in around us even more, almost creating what looked like a tunnel, with the headlights of the van being the only source now piercing the darkness. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached our destination, a dirt open field that looked like where vehicles had parked in the past. Tall pine trees stood around the field forming a natural dome that seemed to welcome us from the outside world. All right, everyone, this is it, I said as I parked the van and stepped out, the air carrying a smell that hinted at the adventures that awaited us. There was a small stream nearby, its gentle flowing of water adding to the nature that surrounded us. We unloaded everything and we walked a little bit deeper into the woods until we stumbled upon a clearing not too far from where we had parked. We began the process of setting up camp, pitching tents, arranging firewood, and establishing a central gathering point where the campfire would soon be set ablaze. As the sun finished dipping below the horizon, casting the area in complete darkness, the tent stood up and the campfire pit awaited. We were all fascinated by the beauty of this place, away from the busyness and the stresses of every day in our life. So the first night there started fine. But as the campfire flames flicker in the breeze, we huddle around the fire, sharing stories and laughing with a sense of security over us, just because of the presence of each other. With the trees casting long shadows over our campsite and the branches creaking softly in the night wind, our voices would rise and fall as we took turns recounting past stories and adventures. We talked the normal things when you hang out with friends and family, the same old stories from the past, Hey, remember that time Luke tripped over his own shoelaces and didn't have anything else to wear? Emily giggled, making fun of Luke. He chuckled and rubbed the back of his neck. Yeah, I remember. And I'm still gonna say that the tree root came out of nowhere. Jennifer leaned in. Or what about that haunted house we dared each other to explore? I'm pretty sure we all had nightmares for weeks after that. Sarah with a smirk. Alright, but what about this, y'all? The time we heard those strange noises outside our tents during that camping trip in the mountains. Mike's face turned serious and said, Man, I thought we were being surrounded by wild animals or something. That's right, and then we found out it was just a bunch of raccoons having a party in the woods, I said. Of course, throughout this whole time, Emily couldn't say anything but laugh. The night continued on, and it was always a great time to gather with my friends especially after not seeing them for so long. As we were telling and recounting past adventures, something caught my attention. I was looking over to Mike as he was talking and for a quick glimpse, 
at the edge of the woods where the firelight struggled to penetrate the darkness there was movement a flicker of shadow that seemed to move between the trees i quickly stood up and focused with my head to look over towards the tree line as i exchanged glances with the others did any of you see that i whispered luke turned to look where i was looking and squinted into the darkness what did you see maybe a deer or something it moved kind of strange for a deer i said jennifer leaned closer to the fire i hope you're not trying to pull a prank leo as i looked deeper into the tree line still trying to get my eyes adjusted from staring at the fire for too long i saw that the movement in the trees and branches was getting closer it was something or someone i kept staring out into the tree line this movement was drawing closer slowly becoming visible by the light the fire was giving out and that's when i noticed a silhouette of a hunched figure and i guess that's when luke finally saw it because he said it looks like a person do you think it's someone lost in the woods emily whispered i hope it's not someone who's hurt sarah said with concern in her voice luke chuckled well if this person is hurt they're sure moving better than i would be who even goes wandering around the woods at this hour emily said at this point all of us were standing and that's when i decided to say who's out there i yelled then just as the silhouette became clear in the tree line that's when a voice broke the silence Greetings, young ones, this person said in a voice that held both wisdom and innocence. Emerging from the trees, I saw it was an older man. Forgive my intrusion. I spied the glow of your campfire from afar and was drawn hoping it wasn't a wildfire that I would have to put out. This land, you see, holds a history long forgotten by many. His steps and his form revealing his age not only in his slightly stooped posture but also in the deep lines engraved on his face it was as though he was an extension of the trees surrounding us as he drew closer the crackling of the fire and the distant sounds of the forest underscored the quiet intensity of the moment finally he approached the campfire revealing his full features as he introduced himself pardon me my name is Tog. His voice, very old and raspy, with one of his eyes semi-shut, scars and years of life showing on his face. I offer a friendly smile. Hey, I'm Leo, and this is Luke, Sarah, Emily, Jennifer, and Mike. We, um, didn't expect to have company out here. What brings you to these woods at this hour? He stared at us with his one eye. The woods have always been my refuge, my sanctuary, my safe place. I come here to remember the old ways, to honor the native land that sustained my ancestors. Native land? Jennifer questioned, her voice in a serious manner. The old man nodded, his gaze fixed on the flickering flames. Staring at them, he said, Yes, this land was once home to my ancestors and I have wandered these woods to honor their memory. But in all my years, it's very rare when I encounter fellow souls under these stars. Mike leaned in with curiosity but in a serious tone. So what brought you here tonight? With a faint smile, Tog said, Your fire, as I said before. But then I heard the laughing that echoed through the trees. It reminded me of times in the past where I shared and bonds were forged around similar fires. Are you telling us that you're camping out here too? Emily asked. Tog's chuckle was like the rustling leaves themselves. Well, not quite. My old bones prefer the comforts of a proper bed, but I do find peace in these woods, even under the cover of night. As the conversation flowed, Tog's words painted a picture of his relationship with the woods. The way he spoke, the stuff he was saying, seemed like he was one with the forest. There is nothing like finding peace and comfort within your own self, in the beauty of nature. 
There are hidden trails that go through the forest, roads known only to those who have taken the time to listen to the whispers of the woods. Every rustle of leaves, every flowing stream, and every whisper of the wind carries echoes of the past. His voice for the reverence of the woods. Listen, the ancient wisdom of this land has much to teach if one is willing to listen. I'm not sure what it was, but the way he spoke and the way he looked seemed like he was just a hippie who loved the outdoors. Pretty harmless in my opinion. I took a step towards him and put my hand on his shoulder. Uh, Toad? Well, how do you spell your name? I asked. My name? Well, that's the first time that somebody has ever asked me how to spell it. As I mentioned, I have a native background. So it's spelled T-A-O-G. I figured that's how you spell it. Just wanted to make sure. Well, Tog, we're sharing stories ourselves. And it seems you have quite a few to tell. Would you care to join our campfire? His eye glinted with appreciation. I would be honored to, young man. As he settled into a log near the fire, and we all sat down, his presence seemed to infuse the night with a deeper sense of connection. He started telling stories of the hidden trails, the forgotten stories, and the ancient wisdom that whispered through the leaves, blending with the crackling of the fire and the rustling of the trees. He spoke not just of the past, but of the living spirit of the woods, a spirit that resonated with each of us as we gathered around the fire. As he delved into his stories and what seemed to be a TED talk on how we need to respect the woods and nature, he told us how he comes into the forest to spend seasons to honor his spiritual ancestors, how he owns a few remote cabins and has learned to be self-sufficient just like his ancestors. However, one specific story caught the attention of all of us. He told the story of a supposed creature that haunted these very woods for generations. Then, his voice took on a somber tone, and even the crackling fire seemed to be quiet, as if the forest itself was holding its breath to listen. The whispering goat, he began, his words dripping with a mixture of reverence and dread, is a creature of darkness, a shapeshifter, that walks a fine line between man and beast, it has a twisted power, the ability to mimic the voices of those it encounters, drawing them into its trap. As he detailed this supposed creature, our circle grew tense. I could see the eyes of everyone else that they were paying attention to this specific story. He then lowered his gaze, and his voice, almost a whisper, he said, A few decades ago, my brother ventured into these woods, drawn by the whispers of familiar voices. As I was searching for him, I heard my own voice calling out to him, but it wasn't me. It was someone else calling out to him. That's when I think my brother believed he was responding to my call, but it was the whispering goat's deceit, and so he never returned, and I never found him, his fate shrouded in mystery. I have carried the weight of that loss ever since, haunted by the knowledge that he may have fallen prey to the whispering goat. A shiver crept down my spine as we all listened. When he concluded his tale, there was silence. Even the fire seemed to have absorbed the weight of his story as it started to go down. With a slow and crippled movement struggling to get up, he rose from his seat his eye meeting each of ours in turn. I thank you all for allowing an old man to share his stories with you. But the night grows old, and it's time for me to return to the embrace of these ancient trees, he said in a voice that contained gratitude and sorrow. As he stepped away from the fire, he turned around and said, I almost forgot. Stay close, he said in a warning voice and do not be swayed by the voices that you think you know.
The darkness seemed to cover him as he walked away, making him one with the shadows of the woods. It's almost like he was part of this landscape. We watched in silence as he receded into the darkness, each of us lost in our own thoughts. Even the noises of the forest seemed to hold its breath. A quiet reverence for the figure that had imparted both wisdom and a warning. And as the echoes of his footsteps crunching the leaves faded, the woods returned to their symphony of rustling leaves and distant whispers. A heavy silence fell within our group. Well, what the fuck was all that about? This hippie love-making tree hugger most likely has his tent somewhere out there and lives out here in the woods, Luke said. We tried shaking off the feeling, but I could tell that anxiety had filled everyone, thanks to the power of a supposed well-told ghost story. But as the night deepened, the campfire had dwindled to embers, and a thick blanket of darkness fell over the campsite. I do want to point out that whenever we went camping, we always either slept inside a tent or outside altogether by the campfire. I guess nothing like actually experiencing the beauty of nature. Tonight, we decided to all sleep in our sleeping bags around the dying campfire, as the events of the evening and the stories still linger in our heads. We all decided to go to sleep, and as I was falling asleep, in the dead of the night, that's when I heard it, a whisper that seemed to move through the air. It was a voice, soft and insistent, calling my name, Leo. I fully woke up. I sat up in my sleeping bag, with my senses on high alert. My eyes widened, scanning the darkness and everyone else laying down, the faint glimmer of dying embers offering little comfort. Did anybody hear that? I whispered hoping to see if anyone around me was awake and heard. Mike, who was sleeping next to me, sat up and said in a groggy voice, Uh, hear what? Someone whispered my name. It sounded like, like you, Mike. Mike's expression shifted from grogginess to a growing sense of unease. That's not possible, Mike said his eyes flickering to the dark woods that surrounded them. I... was... asleep? Jennifer then arose with a voice of mixture. Are you sure you didn't dream it, Leo? I know that we're all on edge after the story told by Tog. I haven't even gone to sleep. Every noise out here is making me stay awake. I know what I heard. It was right here in the camp, I said. Man, go to sleep, bro. You're hearing things now. Stop being such a wuss. There's nothing out here, Mike said. But then, just on the edge after Mike's last word, the faintest whisper, Leo. Everyone fell silent. The voice was real, undeniable, and it sounded like it was next to our campfire. We all looked to Mike. What? I didn't say anything, Mike said. Of course, it was complete darkness, so we couldn't even really see each other out there. So we all just huddle even closer with everyone else waking up groggy as well and getting closer together too, seeking refuge in our shared presence. Okay, um, what's going on y'all? I said. It's most likely that old Papa trying to prank us. He's most likely out there with more people scaring campers, Mike said. Well, one of us should stand watch and just be on the lookout. It's already 4 a.m. and the sun will begin to rise in a few hours, I said. Of course, none of us ended up going back to sleep. And we all just stood awake with eyes wide open. The morning couldn't come soon enough. Seeing the daylight brought relief. But as we remember the night, others, including Luke, Sarah, and Emily, admit it hearing whispers as well, each in the voice of a different member of our group. We try brushing it off as imagination, simply fueled by the stories that Tog was telling us last night. We got ready for the day, and the sun climbed higher in the sky, casting shadows on the forest floor. Emily suggested that we take a hike along one of the nearby trails that's on the map, 
Maybe some fresh air and a change of scenery will help us relax, she said, her voice trying to sound hopeful. Mike and Luke exchanged glances, their expressions a mix of curiosity. I guess it wouldn't hurt to explore a bit. I'm sure it was that old man whispering our names out from the trees last night. If I find him, once we go out there, he's really going to be looking like an old dead beat up tree. Thanks to stupid Leo for telling him our names, Mike said. Sorry guys, I seriously thought he was just an old hermit walking through. I chuckled. There have been times in the past when we became friends with other campers in our annual trips and we all share names, even phone numbers, to communicate in the future. So I actually didn't think too much of it. We set off on the trail, our footsteps breaking the silence of the woods, the sunlight filtering through the leaves and patches of gold. As we walked, our conversation gradually shifted from the events of the previous night to lighter topics, remembering old camping trips, sharing funny stories, and debating the best way to make s'mores. It was almost like the woods were allowing us a moment of peace, a chance to reconnect and find comfort in each other's company. Hours passed and we eventually found ourselves in a small clearing by a small stream. The sun was beginning its descent. We took a break, sitting by the water's edge, dipping our fingers in the cool stream. Check this out y'all, Luke said. His voice with a mixture of excitement. He pointed to the tree where patterns had been carved into the bark. Sarah stepped closer, her fingers tracing the carvings with a sense of wonder. It's like a message left behind, she said as her eyes traced the lines. As we looked around more, we discover other things. Small artifacts hanging from branches, crafted from natural materials by sticks and stones, and even with symbols painted onto the stones. Hey, it's like the woods are trying to tell us something similar to what Togue said, Emily slightly giggled. Mike raised an eyebrow. Or maybe it's just people messing around in the woods, you know, leaving their mark. Luke nodded in agreement, and branches crafted into what looks like symbols. They could be signs that they communicated like this back in the day. I guess the stories that Tog was sharing with us last night really did prove that we were in the midst of Native American land and all these symbols and sticks and stones we found only reinforced that belief. Who knows, we might be standing on ground that's witnessed generations. Maybe these woods have secrets that date back centuries, Jennifer said. Look guys, I get that this all seems interesting and everything. But let's not forget that we've been on these trips every year, and every time, there's some sort of spooky tale or mysterious superstition that pops up. Remember the haunted lake we stumbled upon two years ago? Mike said. Emily chuckled, her eyes with amusement. The one with the vengeful water spirit that would drag people under if they swam too far out? Mike with a grin. Exactly. And what did we find? A perfectly serene lake where we spent a whole day swimming and goofing off. Luke chimed in. And don't forget the enchanted forest last year, where we were told that we would get lost if we ventured too far into the deep woods. Jennifer, with a laughing tone, said, Right, we found a trail with signs pointing us to various landmarks. Sarah joined in. And let's not even talk about the cursed campground, where they said that we would have to ward off evil spirits to make it through the night. As everybody was laughing, Mike nodded, his point emphasized. See y'all, it's always been a bit of fun and games, fueled by local legends. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the spooky environments, especially by the campfire, but come on y'all, this is just the same old stuff we have encountered before. Emily grinned in a sarcastic and playful tone. So you're telling us you don't believe in any of this? Not even a tiny bit? Mike shrugged. I'm not saying I'm a complete non-believer, but I do think a lot of people exaggerate. Like, what are the odds that we stumble upon some mystical artifacts on this trip, right? Or a whispering goat? Luke raised his eyebrows and said, Maybe the woods are trying to prove you wrong, 
Mike. The back and forth continued with everybody as Mike reminded us that we were all friends who had been through it all before. As the day transitioned into evening, we made our way back to the campsite. The sinking sun painted the sky orange and pink. We couldn't ignore the fact that another night was approaching. A night that, given recent events, filled us with a mix of anticipation and dread. Back at the campsite, we set up and got dinner ready. The campfire crackled to life, with its flames dancing, and the forest too seemed to come alive with the chorus of all the critters starting to make noises. As darkness settled over the campsite, we gathered around the campfire once again. The events of the previous nights were still fresh in our minds. As the evening went on, a thick fog started to surround the entire campsite, and as our campfire struggled, its light barely puncturing the fog. Mike, always the brave one, volunteered to gather more firewood. He ventured out into the mist, his flashlight beam gradually merging with the surroundings. This is when everything went to hell. As the fog started getting more thick, and it was getting even more darker, we realized that Mike had been gone for a while. The minutes felt like hours. We exchanged glances. He's been gone for quite a while, y'all. Shouldn't he have been back by now? Emily said with a concerned voice. Maybe he got lost in the fog. One of us should have gone with him, Luke said. Jennifer's eyes were wide. What if he's hurt? What if he encounters something out there? After about 30 minutes, the environment grew heavy. The campfire's embers started to sputter. The fog had taken on an almost suffocating presence. Maybe we should go find them. We can't just wait here in the dark, Sarah said. And that's when I decided to get up. And I said, I'll go look for him. I mean, how far can he be, right? I took about two steps the way Mike had left. And that's when I saw a figure emerging through the fog. It was Mike. And he was coming back with firewood. Except the way he was walking was very dull. As he approached the campfire, his movements were mechanical. Almost as if he was in a trance. Sarah always the one to confront difficult situations, broke the silence. Did you get lost or something? He turned to look at her. I'm fine. I found firewood. The unease in the air deepened, each of us sensing that something was wrong. Mike's presence fell off. It was as if a shadow had draped itself over his being, distorting his familiar features. His whole demeanor was replaced by an emotionless state. I couldn't help but notice something strange about Mike. He was sitting slightly apart from the group, staring directly at the flames, not even saying anything. I was thinking he was just tired or scared, so I tried to engage him in conversation. Hey Mike, remember that one time we got lost and had to spend an extra night out, but he didn't respond? Well, he did, but his response was delayed. And when he did answer, his tone was off. It lacked the seriousness I was used to. It was almost like he was hearing us talk, but responding to questions a moment too late. You mean, when we thought the squirrels were plotting against us? Luke chimed in, trying to break the growing tension. Yeah, that's right. And you were convinced that the woods had eyes and ears. Mike's laugh, if you could even call it that sounded forced a hollow echo you can say yeah good times he replied his gaze distant emily leaned ahead with a concerned voice hey mike are you okay you're acting different mike then looked at her i'm not sure something about this place it's like it's under my skin Jennifer's voice held a note of unease. Weird things have been happening tonight. The voices. The fog. I think we should consider leaving. Mike's gaze remained fixed on the flames. His voice almost lowered to a whisper. Maybe that's not a bad idea. The gravity of his words hung heavy in the air. We exchanged uneasy glances. 
the weight of the strange things happening now impossible to ignore i looked around at my friends each face reflecting a mix of fear it was a painful realization that the place that had once been our escape was now a source of unease well we should leave something isn't right here i said nods of agreement follow the decision being unanimous this time the prospect of abandoning our camping trip was sad but the safety of our group came first and so we started packing everything it took about 30 minutes to break everything down and by then it was now completely dark however as we finished packing our gear and glanced around to make sure everything was ready a sinking feeling settled in our stomachs mike who had been acting distant and detached was just standing by the edge of the clearing staring into the depths of the woods unlike the rest of us he hadn't lifted a finger to help with the packing and his usual seriousness energetic self replaced by an almost trance-like state hey mike are you all right man i said with a concerned tone mike's response was slow and distant as though his mind was somewhere far away yeah i'm fine just thinking jennifer exchanging a worried look with all of us it was clear that something had changed in mike as we started getting ready to walk from the campfire back to the van that's when we heard it somewhere in the distance we heard another voice it sounded like mike's voice and it was calling out sounding confused and pleading for help and that's when emily said so if that's mike calling out to us then who is as we turned around mike was still staring into the woods but that's when his body started contorting almost glitching like chaos erupted jennifer always quick thinking threw a log towards this mike that was standing on the edge of the campsite and yelled everyone to run back to the van guided by adrenaline and our flashlights we dashed through the woods as we all ran with our belongings i dared to not look back but still a horrible screech drew my attention back to see what had caused this and that's when i stopped in my tracks to see that whatever this thing was now had its limbs stretched and twisted reshaping into something that defied the laws of nature but it was the face that sent a shockwave of terror through me the human features contorted and elongated the skin stretching and warping as if it was struggling to contain the monstrosity beneath the eyes once familiar and warm became stretched out and unnaturally slanted their color shifting to an abyss-like blackness that seemed to absorb all light the nose receded that resembled the snout of a goat the mouth was a grotesque smile its lips curling back to reveal rows of jagged pointed teeth every detail was a horrifying mixture of human and animal that's when i felt my body come back to life and i yelled to keep running and to not look back not knowing that even if they got to the van how would they even get inside because i had the key i kept running and running thinking what would happen if this thing caught up to us and then there in the distance i saw the clearing of the trees and familiar sight of the van and heard my friends screaming to hurry up as i neared the van i saw that the real mike with his clothes torn was there with the rest of the group with no time to lose we crammed into the van and sped off as i looked in the rear view mirror i saw this creature standing where we had parked at after about five minutes of driving luke finally spoke and said what the fuck was that that's when mike finally spoke and said when i ventured into the woods the fog seemed to grow denser with each step i was taking soon my flashlight was the only thing piercing the gloom i had collected some firewood when i heard whispers i heard y'all's voices calling out to me i tried tracing them but got lost then i saw me 
or a copy of me. It looked like my reflection in a murky pond. Mike then stopped talking, struggling to find the words. This other me was trying to draw me closer with words and voices that belong to you all. That's when I decided to hide behind a tree, using the shadows as cover. And every time I try to make a move towards the camp, it seemed to sense me, always blocking my path. I thought I was done for, but then I remember a stream we crossed earlier. That's when I made a dash for it and jumped in. The flow carried me downstream, away from that thing. I crawled out, exhausted, and walked towards the van. That's when I started yelling for you all. And that's when you all came running from the forest. As we were speeding away, all the trees were whipping past us, their branches scratching the sides of my van, almost like desperate fingers trying to pull us back over the noise of the engine and the pounding of my heart. That's when we heard a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from everywhere all at once. As I kept my eyes on the road, the headlights briefly illuminated, a monstrous form darting between the trees. The creature was a horrible version of a goat, but massive in scale, murky gray, almost appearing slick in the dim light, with rag scars and patches of bare skin. Its eyes, though, were the most terrifying. Deep, soulless pits of black. What the hell is that? screamed Emily, clutching her seat. I pressed the gas pedal to the floor, with the van's engine roaring. The creature, with an incredible speed, moved through the dense forest, its every leap and bound bringing it closer to us. As we went through a sharp bend, this thing launched its massive jaw snapping inches from the rear window. Luke, who was in the back seat, rummaged through our camping supplies and hurled a flare out the window. It lit up the surrounding area in a bright crimson glow, distracting the creature for a few seconds. I continued speeding, tires screeching, and for a moment, it seemed we had lost it. But then, a screeching noise that echoed through the woods. The creature resumed its relentless pursuit, its form now even more twisted and grotesque under the flickering light of the flare. The road ahead clear, revealing the bridge we had crossed earlier. Realizing this might be our only chance, Sarah shouted, Get across the bridge, now! We barrel into the bridge, the van shaking under the strained boards. As we reached the halfway point, a deafening roar filled the air. Looking back, we saw the creature stop at the bridge's edge, with what looked to be an evil smirk, an image that still haunts me to this day. I'll even provide a drawing at the end if anybody wants to see it. After a few hours of driving, we finally left the woods and found the safety of the dim lit streets of a nearby town. We pulled into a waffle house and we sat in a corner booth as we recounted the evening's events, trying to make sense of it all. Jennifer, her hands wrapped around her mug, that old man, Tog, she began. He knew too much about the whispering goat, don't you think? There was agreement between us. I started rubbing my head and responded. It's not just that he knew about it. Remember how he just appeared out of nowhere? And how, after he left, things immediately took a turn for the worse. The eyes of Sarah widened, and the way he emphasized not to trust familiar voices. Almost like he was setting us up, giving us a clue about the thing we were about to face. Mike, looking more pale than usual, added, when I was in the woods, trying to escape that thing, I heard more than our voices. I swear, I heard the voice of that old man calling me, trying to draw me in. I think he might have been the whispering goat himself. We all exchanged glances. The thought was too horrific to fully grasp, had this creature taken on the look of an old man to toy with us, to get close, to study us. But why would he warn us about himself? It doesn't make sense, I said, unless he enjoys the chase, the fear, 
Maybe for an old creature, the hunting is more thrilling, Luke said. We all sat in heavy silence, pondering the possibility as we pieced it all together. The sudden appearance of Tog, his detailed stories, and the hunting events. The conclusion became clear. The old man, with deep-set wrinkles and tales of old, had likely been the whispering goat himself. That happened a few months ago, and the trauma still lingers. First up was when we lost touch with Mike, who moved to another state, I guess to escape the memories. From that moment on, everything else changed. The once tight bonds between us frayed. Our group chats grew quiet, and any future gathering ceased. And the annual camping trip became nothing more than a distant memory. The haunting echoes of that night lingered, and every rustling of leaves, every faint whisper, served as a chilling reminder of the presence that lurked in the woods. The memory of the whispering goat and twisted grin haunted my dreams. A constant replay of the terror that unfolded before us, the mere thought of venturing into the wilderness, sent shivers down my spine, a sensation of impending doom that I couldn't shake. As time passed, the memory of that horrifying encounter began to fade. We did all end up going separate ways and I found methods to cope with the nightmares I experienced afterwards. I even went and talked with a counselor, because every corner that I looked, every voice I heard, at night when I was falling asleep, I swear I would sometimes hear those faint whispers. Last night, I was walking alone in a park near my apartment. The sun had set, and the moon was shining bright. I quickened my pace as the nighttime brought back episodes and bad memories of the night in the forest. With my heart racing as the memories of that night flooded back, that's when I heard it. A faint distant sound that sent shivers down my spine. Whispers, soft, as if carried by the wind itself. I stopped in my tracks, straining to make out the words, feeling a cold sweat forming on my forehead. I heard my name Leo my heart raced and my instinct screamed at me to run but my feet felt rooted to the ground and the whispering seemed to grow near and then I heard something else a low guttural growl much like the one we had heard that night in the woods fear flooded my veins and I finally tore my gaze away from the darkness fleeing from the park as if my life depended on it, which at this point it most likely did. The whispers and the noises seemed to chase me, echoing in my ears, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being pursued. When I finally reached the safety of my home, I locked every door and window, heart pounding like a drum. I tried to rationalize what happened, telling myself it was all in my head. Anxiety and a product of what happened in the past in the woods. But deep down, I knew it was the whispering goat. As the night continued, I couldn't escape the feeling that I was being watched, as something evil lurked just beyond my vision. And just as I was about to close my eyes that night to try to sleep, I heard it again, the whispers, closer now, almost like a soft breath against my ear. Leo. Leo. My blood turned to ice and I clutched my cover and then from the corner of my eye I saw movement, a shadowy figure, its eyes reflecting the dim light like deep, soulless pits. The figure's mouth opened and it spoke, its voice using all of my friend's voices, distorted and nightmarish. We missed you, Leo. With my eyes never leaving the figure, with trembling hands, I rushed to the front door, my heart pounding so loud that I couldn't even hear anything else. And then, just as I reached past the door, I heard one last whisper, faint but unmistakable, run. I bursted out the house, leaving everything behind. 
I got inside my old trusted van and sped away to my parents house who lived about two hours away and I never went back again it's almost midnight I'm at my parents house and here I am sharing and writing this to you all in the hopes to warn you everything is real it's not in my head and it's still out there waiting in the shadows whispering a taunting lullaby those moments when you second guess a distant call your name when you are alone at home tonight in bed falling asleep do not be swayed by the voices that you think you know I never told this story to anyone and I don't really intend to tell it again I have a pounding migraine today and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light and since our actual trailer didn't I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way Sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced in area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I already get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in, to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but you know, angry dog, and I was a kid, it happens. Now, I do get scared pretty fast, I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing, just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over, his name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down 
And by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in. Like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway. Right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room. But I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear. But he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out. But it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. And that's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. 
So after a while, I calmed back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts, I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said, the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly, the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's gonna wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm gonna go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly. Her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall. In my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by... Go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away but that one night still haunts me i still refuse to go out at night unless i'm with a bunch of people and i will never ever live in the woods again anyways i hope you all enjoyed hearing about this 
as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that, or they picked up a 1,600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked them to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night, but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished, it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields, and one at a time, I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange, though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss 
They had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last, as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it. But still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me, not so shy now. I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself, wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight-foot-tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupil seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. 
Oh. 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 The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. It was late June of 1968. My dad was 12. My grandparents had moved a few months earlier from Tucson, Arizona to Concho, Arizona. Concho was very different, both in landscape and temperature. Sitting at 5,000 feet above sea level, the summer temperatures were around 70 degrees versus the hundreds in summertime Tucson. Resting at the edge of the White Mountains, the land is red, yellow, and brown sandstone cliffs and buttes against a larger ancient basalt flow ridge that lines the north from the Springville Volcanic Range. Well, Old Concho, as it's referred to now, sits among the high desert with large basalt ridge bordering the east and north. In the valley, a dry riverbed was dotted by large cottonwood trees. The buttes and ridges boasted large twisted cedar trees. Only about 200 people lived in Concho at the time. It's in pretty close proximity to the petrified forest. Therefore, petrified wood was found on the valley floor. There were also numerous ancient Anasasi ruins scattered along the valley. My great uncle had moved his family to Concho as well. My grandpa had recently finished his engineering degree and he and my great uncle were doing highway construction all around the White Mountains. They had both purchased land in the Concho area for pretty cheap. My great uncle had two sons who were a year older and a year younger than my dad, Tony and Sack. Tony was 13 and Sack was 11. They would spend their days exploring the surrounding landscapes, joined by my dad's American bulldog, Sarge. They had found quite a few ruins, numerous pictographs, and some old abandoned homesteads, most likely from the 19th century. Every morning, they would load up their bags with canteens, bologna sandwiches, and head out into the wilderness to play and explore. My grandparents and great aunt and uncles had only one rule that was for the children, and that was to return by sunset. As my dad recalls on one summer morning, they ended up hiking towards the edge of the giant basalt ridge to explore. After going for about a mile or so, they came upon an arroyo 
running adjacent to the ridge. Large black boulders and giant slabs of sandstone peppered the wash. The banks were pretty steep, but they would have to cross it if they want to explore the ridge on the other side. They made their way down slowly. Once in the arroyo, they realized that the opposite bank was too steep to climb. So they started following it west to find a better place to climb up. My dad said as soon as they got into the riverbed, he started getting an unnerving feeling, like they were being watched. He said it was extremely quiet, no birds or cicadas chirping. It was hot as well, no breeze stirred the air. The further they walked down the wash, the more a sense of urgency began to build in his gut. He didn't say anything though, for fear that his cousins would laugh at him. About a half mile or so down the wash, it made a bend around a large volcanic boulder. Suddenly, Sarge began a low growl, hair standing up on his back. This actually startled all three of the kids. Looking around, they didn't see anything, so encouraging the dog, they moved closer to the bend. Sarge stayed rooted to the spot, growling and barking. All three of the boys began to get scared. They agreed that maybe they should just turn around. They noticed that there was a spot where they could climb out of the wash. They hadn't noticed it at first, but it looked almost like a game trail. With adrenaline fueling them, they hauled ass up the side of the embankment towards the ridge, the dog darting after them. The whole time the bad feeling was growing stronger with my dad. They stopped at the top to catch their breath. Sitting against a large boulder, they took some drinks from the canteen and assured each other that Sarge probably smelled a coyote or spotted a rabbit. Here, the game trail was more apparent. It had even worn into some of the volcanic and sandstone that protruded from the ground. They noticed that there were a lot of petroglyphs dotting the black rocks, geometric shapes, animal, human figures. There were so many. Finally, they found a large juniper with a trunk and ate their lunch in shade. Bellies full and excitement replacing fear. They hurry along the trail as it slowly sigged and sagged the side of the basalt ridge, avoiding large areas of rock falls. The pictographs began to change as well along the trails. Lots of spirals and horn-looking men. My dad even said there was one that looked like a UFO. Turning around a bend, the trail disappeared. Only open space of the edge of a cliff. There was nowhere else to go. The cliff dropped off to one side, and a sheer cliff going up about 50 feet on the other side. My dad, he was disappointed, but also a little relieved, as the sun was getting further west, and they were pretty far from Concho now. They could see the town in the distance, as well as the holy mountain and mesas that dotted the distant Navajo Res. Even though they were disappointed, they decided that it was worth looking at the view. They started making their way down the trail when they spotted an opening in the cliffside, a side canyon. They hadn't noticed it on the way up. It was behind a large twisted cedar. The tree's shadow had hidden it. It looked almost like there was another trail going into the divide. The opening was about four feet wide. Looking at it, that unnerving feeling returned to my dad. His stomach dropped and he felt like it was twisting in knots. The hair on the back neck stood up. Tony suggested that they should detour and check it out. My dad protested saying that they needed to get back. Zack stayed silent. He looked as scared as my dad felt. Tony laughed when looking at them and called them both sissies. He said if they didn't want to go, it was fine, that they could wait there for him and be babies if they wanted. That's when Sarge ran down the trail and was out of sight. My dad whistled for him, but he didn't return. Zack decided he would follow Tony, so my dad stayed behind while they entered the narrow black walled canyon. When they moved out of my dad's field of vision, the wind picked up. 
blowing through the canyon and trees, making a creepy sound. It was quiet except the wind, and my dad thought he heard faint voices on the air. He shivered, the ominous feeling growing stronger. Ten minutes passed, then twenty, and still, Tony and Zack had not returned. A large cloud had covered the sun, and drops of rain began to fall. My dad moved under the cedar to get out of the light rain that began to fall. He sat on a rock and began to shiver. Suddenly, something grabbed his shoulder. He jumped about three feet and screamed. Then he heard laughing. It was Tony and Zack. They looked extremely excited. Luke, you'll never believe what we found. They said, we found some Indian steps and they lead to a cave. They begged my dad to come see. It wasn't far, only about 10 minutes into the canyon. My dad ended up following them, knowing they weren't going to agree to go home until they showed them. Plus, he felt a little braver and more intrigued now. Sure enough, around a bend and about 20 yards into the canyon, the canyon was more wide, about 20 to 30 feet across, and there were indeed foot and handholds carved into the rock wall. My dad had seen steps like them before, when his parents had taken him to Chaco Canyon National Park. They were smaller than the ones in Chaco and only went up about 20 feet to the darkened mouth of a small cave. He shivered from excitement or fear, he wasn't sure. From the bottom of the canyon, there was no way of telling how large the cave was. They dropped their packs and decided to use the foot and hand holds to climb up to the cave against my dad's better judgment. The rain had stopped, but they slowly and carefully made their way because the rock had become slick. It took about 10 minutes to ascend. My dad called for Sarge from the top again, and the dog still hadn't returned. The cave was much larger and deeper than they expected, and the entrance was decorated with hundreds of petroglyphs. The light didn't penetrate very far in, but they could see light in the distance from an opening in the roof. So they entered. Light adjusting to the dark, they started to notice that the ground was covered with objects. What looked like rocks and debris now revealed itself to be pots, beautiful painted pots of all shapes and sizes, black on white, painted with geometric patterns and animals, red pots and even some yellow ones, large pots holding dry corn and crusty squash and beans. There were also pots filled with arrowheads and beads. They even found some instruments like drums and flutes. They didn't touch anything and kept walking deeper into the cave. They looked around in shock and in awe. They had just discovered something big, something very big. They moved now towards the second bit of light streaming in from a crack in the roof. The cave was littered with all sorts of artifacts, stone axes, pots of all shapes, colors, and sizes. As they passed under the crack, they noticed now that there were objects and alcoves in the wall. My dad moved closer to one, and his blood froze. He was looking at a human body. It was decayed skin and hair clinging to patches and its mouth open in what looked like a silent scream. He took a leap back. Tony and Zack also froze. The walls were lined with alcoves filled with dressed bodies, lining the walls as far as they could see into the darkness. Suddenly, an ominous and horrendous Screech broke the silence of the cave. All three boys jumped, and my dad looking in the direction from where the sound came saw two red and glowing eyes. He froze, locked in place by those glowing red eyes. Suddenly, the cave was washed over with the stench of decay and death. The eyes began to move towards the boys, slowly 
another hideous growl, screech, jolted them from being petrified in place. The eyes were moving fast now, right towards them, and they heard what sounded like running footsteps. They turned and tore out of the cave as fast as they could. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them in a blind panic. The entrance to the cave was maybe 30 yards away. My dad looked back against his better judgment and saw a man on all fours or a giant coyote. He can't be sure. He pushed himself faster, screaming for the others to also run faster. They reached the edge of the cave, having to turn around to scrabble back down the foot and handholds. Zack got there first and began descending as fast as he could. Tony was next. His face turned into a wash of horror as he went down. My dad's heart was hammering into his brain by now. He turned and saw the eyes only about 20 feet from him. The stench of decay was overpowering. It made his stomach turn. As fast as he could, he placed his feet in the first set of footholds and started clamoring down the rock face. He could hear the creature's breath now, and even feel it. He refused to look up as he was going down, trying to concentrate on the hand and foot holds. He heard Tony scream from below him, and looked to see Tony lose his hold and slip about five feet from the bottom. He landed on his side and began to scream with pain. My dad slowed himself a bit, still not daring to look back up. After what seemed like an eternity, he leaped from the cliffside down the last two feet. Zack was helping Tony to his feet, and Tony was frozen looking at the cave and ancient staircase. All the color gone from his face. My dad was in full panic, and not looking, grabbed Tony and helped Zack drag him away. They flew down the little canyon. Finally, before they passed the turn, my dad looked back to see the red eyes watching them from the darkness. Another screech rang from the cave and at that moment Sarge in a full run came from around the bend growling and barking. He ran to the foot and handhold staircase and bellow up that cave the hair on his back standing straight up snarling and growling. The sounds of the dog filled the canyon. As my dad turned the corner he saw those red eyes retreat back into the cave. They emerged from the small canyon and stopped briefly to catch their breath. The sounds of Sarge barking and growling echoing down the canyon. Tony at this point was now crying, his face washed with pain. His arm, he said. He thinks he broke it. Zack was silent. My dad was then asking Tony if he could make it home. Tony responded. He sure the hell wasn't staying anywhere near whatever that was. Suddenly. A shrill cry came from the canyon. It was a dog in pain. Sarge, my dad cried. But Tony and Zack had started running down the trail. My dad screamed again, tears coming from his eyes. There was no response. It was quiet. My dad thinks he hears something. He looks up to the canyon entrance. It sounds like drums. My dad sits there confused. Drums? What the hell? Is he losing his mind? The drums are getting loud. Is this in his mind? Where is Sarge? He can't leave him. My dad sees Sag tearing back up the trail. Luke, we have to go. The drums are louder now, and he can hear faint chanting. Zack grabs my dad and jerks him to his feet. Don't you hear that? He screams and shakes my dad. We have to run, now! My dad is woken from his grief as fear washes over him again. He runs down the trail with Sack. Tony is waiting at the edge of the arroyo, waiting for them. The wash is now running, about six inches deep. They notice for the first time that a large thunderhead has developed to the south. A huge large black storm dominating the southern horizon, lightning flashing in the distance. A new source of danger crosses my dad's mind. He tells Tony and Zack they need to cross the arroyo as fast as possible. If it floods, they will be stuck on the side with the basalt ridge, with whatever that thing was. 
They make their way down carefully and slowly. Tony is having a hard time because of his injured arm. They now start hearing thunder rolling across the air and the wind has increased. My dad is keeping a close eye on the creek which has only risen a couple of more inches. They make all the way down and across the creek. The place where they crossed is only 30 yards or so ahead so they scrabble their way towards it. The water starts rising now at an alarming rate. They start going as fast as their legs will carry them. They're exhausted but keep pushing on. Suddenly, my dad who is in the rear starts to hear loud splashing coming from behind him. His heart drops. It followed them. It's getting closer. He closes his eyes bracing for impact. That's when he feels something lick the back of his swinging hand. He turns bracing for impact and sees Sarge. Joy fills my dad. He bends down and gives Sarge a quick hug as the dog runs past and the dog bounds after Tony and Zack as they climb out of the arroyo. My dad runs and begins to climb. When he's almost to the top, he hears crashing and loud snapping coming from the arroyo. Making it to the top, he sees a wave of brown debris filled water crash through the wash. He falls to his butt and watches as the flash flood fills the little canyon. Tony and Zack are lying on the ground, gasping for air. My dad tries to catch his breath. He feels dizzy. He feels tears welling up and Sarge comes and licks his face. My dad sees that Sarge is covered with blood. He looks over the dog and finds several slash wounds on his back. His ear is also torn. They don't look too deep but he can't be sure. Zack is the first to speak. He is asking what it was, but no one responds. Tony's arm is beginning to swell pretty badly, and it's only a few hours till dusk. They're all thirsty, and realize in their panic, they left their packs in the small canyon, along with their canteens. They are no longer in a hurry. They are exhausted. They drink some rainwater that has pulled in one of the large sandstone boulders. They figure whatever that thing was, it's not going to be getting across the arroyo for a few hours. So they slowly make their way back to Concho as the thunderhead to the south continues to fill the landscape. The three boys and Sarge make it home around 8. The sun has set and my grandparents and great uncle and aunt are worry sick. They are relieved and angry until they see the condition of the trio and the dog. The boys tell them about their horrendous tale and Tony's parents rush Tony to the nearest doctor. That night, my dad sleeps with Sarge at the end of his bed. Despite him being extremely exhausted, he is plagued with nightmares. One that he speaks about all the time is especially terrifying where he sees the red eyes looking in through his window. When he wakes up though, in the morning, his curtains are closed. The rain continued for two or three days. The boys don't leave their homes, still terrified of what happened. My grandpa and great uncle are convinced what the boys encounter was a mountain lion, but they are intrigued by the story of the cave they found. A few days later, when the weather is clear, they tell the boys they want to see the cave. They make the journey faster this time using my great uncle's jeep. My grandpa and great uncle also bring along a couple of shotguns and rifles in case this lion is still in the cave. The boys show them the arroyo which has been filled with new boulders and broken trees from the flooding. They find the trail and start making their way up. My grandpa on the front and great uncle taking the rear. They find the boys packs caught in a cedar bush. They have been shredded. My grandpa figures they must have been caught by another flood and they ended up in the trees. They finally make it to the little hidden canyon which has been blocked by a juniper that washed down during the rain. My grandpa and great uncle get the log out of the way and they go to the canyon to the Indian staircase. 
When they look up though, they can make out the darkness of the cave. The water washed away all signs of the boy's previous passage. My grandpa figures maybe at this time of day, the cave is more illuminated. So he and my great uncle climb up the foot and handholds to the top. The boys wait at the bottom, having no desire to go back up there again. It's only my dad and Zack. Tony with his broken arm stayed home. My grandpa calls down for them to climb up. They do as they are told and climb up. When my dad reaches the top, he is stunned. The cave is gone. It's only a 20 foot rock alcove next to a black basalt cliff covered with petroglyphs. He's confused, looks around. He goes over to the wall looking for cracks and sees nothing. My grandpa and great uncle end up questioning the boys. Were they making up stories? No, they weren't. Something attacked Sarge and the boys hadn't made up being that scared. The dads aren't mad. It's a neat area. Maybe some other weekend they will look for the cave again. My dad and Zach know that this is where the cave was. There is no doubt in their minds. They found their packs and even passed by the UFO petroglyph. But they can't convince the adults. So they make their way to the jeep that is parked on the far bank of the Arroyo. As they load up, sun sinking low in the western sky. My dad looks back at the black basalt ridge, wondering if maybe it was all just a dream, but something in the shadow of a cliff catches his eye. He squints against the sun and sees two red shining eyes looking back at him. His blood goes cold. He turns around as the jeep pulls away. My grandparents only stayed in Concho for another few months. As soon as my grandpa finished the highway project, he got a job offer in the US Virgin Islands. My dad said after that encounter, he had nightmares every night and would swear that at night, he would see the red eyes outside of the house until they finally moved from Concho. After he moved, he never had a nightmare about the eyes again. But it wasn't his last encounter with the red-eyed creature. He would see it again when he became an adult. But that is a story for another time. There are things out there in the woods at night that we, as humans, should not disturb. This is my first time publicly telling this story. It almost sounds like the generic monster in the woods story, but I've been holding on to it for a few years now, and I'm finally ready to tell it. I live in the hill country of Texas, and this event happened back in August of 2018. I promise you, it's true. As anyone in Texas can tell you, August is very hot. The summer is what I like to call Diet August. And for good reason. I worked as a maintenance tech for a school district, so the heat and manual labor were my best friends. One of my buddies called me one day around lunchtime, and he told me there was a problem at his family's ranch. Apparently, one of the horses had gotten loose and ran off the evening before and hadn't returned. So he asked me if I could help look for it. It was Friday and I didn't have any plans. So a trip to the ranch sounded like a great way to spend the weekend. A few hours later, I got another call. This time, I was told they found a horse, but it was dead and that now we would go hunting for whatever killed this horse. For those that don't know, there aren't that many apex around here. Plenty of coyotes and wild pigs, and very rare, a mountain lion. But that's about it, unless someone has some exotic stuff on their land. One time, I saw a zebra chilling under a tree while driving down some back road. 
when I got off work, I went home and got changed into some hunting clothes and prepped my gear. At the time, I had an SKS, which actually worked fine. Ammo was very cheap. I assumed that we would need some quick follow-up shots, so I know it would do the job. With a big sharp knife to hang on my belt, I felt ready for whatever would happen. My friend picked me up, and we drove for about two hours before we finally arrived at his family's ranch. The ranch was beautiful, thick forest, rolling hills, and a lot of wildlife. The basic layout was the main house situated down a dirt road that took several minutes to navigate, so it was set pretty far from any roads. About a hundred yards from the house was the barn where most of the equipment was kept. A couple of ATVs and a cool little side-by-side -side that was always a blast to drive. There was a field where the horses were kept, but aside from that, the area was just wild land. Trails had been cut so many times that they formed very reliable means of exploring. When we got out of the car and got my stuff unloaded, I was told we were waiting on a couple more people to show up. Fine by me, the more the merrier. In the meantime, I was told to go to the barn and see what was left of the horse that had been retrieved from the forest. The scene that I saw was not something I expected, even though I really didn't know what I was expecting to see. It was torn to ribbons. Deep slash marks covered the body. The stomach was torn open and I could see tooth marks where something had taken bites, but it didn't seem like it had been fed on, more like demolished than a fit of rage. That ruled out coyotes instantly. If a pack was strong enough to take this horse down, they would have done their best to pick it clean. It also couldn't have been pigs. There were no signs of injury on the lower legs. That left us with some maniac roaming the woods, or a mountain lion. The lion, rare as they might be, looked like the culprit. It actually broke my heart, thinking that we would have to kill it. To be honest, I would rather find a way to remove it and take it somewhere safe. But if it's taking down horses, it would have no problem taking down a human. The sun was slowly getting lower in the sky when the other guy showed up. I won't use their names of course, but there were four of us. We discussed options for something and decided that a grid search using maps of the ranch would be our best bet. However, with so much land to cover, we would each take an area to sweep. Every 10 minutes, we would have a radio check to make sure we were safe. One of my favorite things about coming here was that there was some pretty awesome stuff we could use for our shenanigans. Tonight, we would have sets of night vision goggles. I chose the one with the head mount, so I could have one eye available to see normal. One thing about using night vision is the lack of depth perception, and I'm not keen on tripping over every bump on the ground. We chose our grid to search, checked our gear, tested the radios, and off we went. By our third radio check, I was finally in place to start looking. I took out the map, used my compass to situate myself and picked the direction to walk. The sun was real low by now and was already near pitch black under the canopy of oak and cedar trees. With the night vision over my eye, I was creeping through the brush, trying my best to make as little noise as possible. From the sound of it, I was the only creature being quiet. The forest was teeming with all the critters beginning their nightly activities. Raccoons, possums, cottontails, and jackrabbits. Of course, you can't forget about the bugs. The constant chattering of cicadas mixed with crickets and whatever else is out there made noise that gave the area an almost deafening feeling. Slowly I scanned the area with the night vision, rifle in the low ready position. Two radio checks went by when I suddenly realized that the woods had gone quiet. Standing alone at night in a forest that no longer has any noise is a scary thing. Generally, animals will go quiet when danger is nearby. The problem was 
Nothing seemed to care about my presence. And now there was dead silence. I made my way to the clearing and found a tall hill. It looked like a good point to get my bearings. So I climbed a fairly steep slope. At the top, I had as close to a commanding view as one could hope when surrounded by tall trees. In any way, I was about maybe 20 to 25 yards from the tree line. The sun was down, with the last glimmer of purple and red sinking below the horizon. Navigating was about to get a bit more difficult. Using the night vision, I tried to pick out any landmark I could see to figure out where I was on the map. Swinging my head around, I caught a reflection of eyes in the trees. They were big and bright and unblinking. I stared for a moment, deciding what I should do. I could see pretty well in the clearing thanks to the moonlight, but in the tree line was pitch blackness. I called out to the eyes, trying to get whatever it was to move so I could see it better. I could tell it was taller than a deer, or basically anything else that lived there. So I thought it was a person. Suddenly, I was really wishing it was a mountain lion. A horse mutilating cycle was not what I wanted on my hunting bingo card. I called out and said, Hey, this is private land. You need to leave right now. Nothing happened for maybe 30 seconds. When I heard the eye speak, it said, leave right, right now. now in a perfect impression of my voice as though it was recording safe to say that was extremely unsettling i raised my rifle and said if you don't leave right now you're gonna die as soon as i said that the eyes lifted as though they had stood up the height from my best guess was maybe seven to eight feet depending on how tall the tree next to it was then, it moved, stepping out of the darkness and into view of my night vision. It repeated my words again, saying, If you don't leave right now, you're gonna die. For a moment, I was in shock. This thing looked sickly white, maybe gray. It had a long and slender frame. Without a second thought, I pulled the trigger and fired. How I ended up missing at this distance was a mystery to me. But I fired again, and this time the bullet struck home. The creature let out this monstrous, unnatural well like a mountain lion scream, mixed with what sounded like an air horn. I was stunned, nearly paralyzed with the most primal sense of fear I have ever experienced. Then it took a step towards me. I fired again, and again, and again empty in my entire magazine of 20 rounds but it still kept walking if i hit it i didn't know because it hadn't screamed again without taking my eye off of it with the night vision i fumbled to eject the magazine and was reaching for another when it stopped walking maybe a yard from me the creature stood there staring at me it didn't have any hair and its skin looked as though it was merely wrapped tightly around bone with no muscle or definition. The eyes were small. Despite having a massive reflection in the IR, there was a line that I guess was most likely the mouth. I stood there, not knowing what to do. It raised its hand towards me. And then, I saw the fingers. There were four fingers, long and black, tapering down to something like an ice pick. That's when the smell hit me. It was like hot vomit, with the odor of decay and feces. In my brain, I knew I had to get away from it, but I physically couldn't move. Just before the fingers made contact with my shoulder, there was this moment of clarity and I was able to move. With a fluid motion, I dropped my rifle from my hands, falling across my chest and being caught by the sling. And with my right hand, I drew out the knife. I slashed upward. I ended up slashing up from the creature's right hip towards the left shoulder. It screamed and took a step back. This was my moment to run. 
I stepped backwards and fell down the side of the hill, rolling as I tried to not drop the knife and keep my rifle from being too damaged. At the bottom, I rolled to my feet and took off in a flat sprint, crashing through the brush like a train. I could hear heavy steps behind me. I knew if I looked back, I would most likely die. So I just kept running and trying to avoid hitting a random branch as they briefly came into view in the night vision, which had somehow stayed on my head. I'm not the strongest runner, but fear and adrenaline are excellent motivators. I came out of the forest and directly into the other three guys as they were on their way to me. They started yelling and asking what happened as I screamed, just fire away, as I tried to recover. They took my word for it and began shooting into the trees, emptying their mags on their two AR-15s and one AR-10. As their rifles became empty, they helped pick me up from the ground and we started running down the trail and back towards the house. After what felt like forever running, we flew into the house and locked the door. We kept shifting our eyes to each other and out the nearest window. Once we felt like we had the air to talk, I explained what happened. They told me they heard the shots and started heading towards my direction, thinking I had found a mountain lion or somehow got injured trying to signal for help. It was then that I realized I had likely dropped the radio when I fell down the hill because they said they tried getting me on their radios, but I hadn't answered. It was only after I finished talking that my friend, whose family owns the ranch, said that they had heard strange things before, but never tried to investigate. None of us got any sleep that night, keeping watch out the four sides of the house with rifles loaded and ready. Lucky for us, nothing happened and we got ready to leave once the sun crested the horizon. The drive home was uneventful and without much conversation. When I got home, I immediately undressed and just took a moment to stare in the bathroom mirror. I had a handful of scrapes and scratches that I hadn't even noticed. My back was sore and my right ankle felt a little sharp. That shower was one of the greatest feelings I had ever had. And when I was done, I collapsed on my bed and was instantly asleep for the next 15 hours. Coming face to face with that monstrosity was definitely the scariest moment of my life. And I haven't returned since then. It took over a year to finally get comfortable with being in the woods again. Even though I still get a sinking feeling whenever I see the sun setting. What was it? I don't know. And quite frankly, I'm not interested in finding out. But if we meet again, I'll be sure to have plenty of bullets and a sharp knife with me. We had a tradition of going to see my grandfather every summer and spend some time at his cabin. The cabin by a lake and older than he is. The cabin is a load of fun for a child spending their carefree summer. The one thing I disliked about the cabin was there was no indoor washroom. A shower was set up outside. An outhouse a few steps off into the woods was the worst thing about the cabin. I hated using that thing. Bugs always took over the inside and I had a fear of something reaching up to grab me if I sat down. We begged my grandfather to get indoor plumbing. He only got a tub hooked up, but his water heater can only handle so much. So we were banned from using it in the summer. The place was just barely held together. It would be cheaper to buy a new cabin than to renovate it. But we still went every year, always forgetting the negatives until we finally arrived. Even my father complained about the outhouse and he never really complained about anything. My grandfather also had a rack of hunting rifles and one shotgun. He told all of us to never touch them and to respect the weapons. He left the cabinet they were inside locked, his guns unloaded, and the ammo hidden somewhere in the cabin. He took no chances with the guns around a bunch of kids. He always said he would whoop some ass if he ever saw us touching them. 
and told us it was because he loved us and didn't want an accident to happen. I asked why he kept the guns. I didn't see him using them very often aside from shooting a deer or two. I would see him go off into the woods while we swam with a rifle on his shoulder, but he normally never came back with some animal he shot. I don't think he would kill something to waste, leaving it behind. Or did I think he was a bad shot? He may walk slowly, but his eyesight was better than ours. He always knew what might be going on. One time, my cousin found a cigarette someone dropped near the corner store, where we sometimes got ice cream snacks. He kept it hidden for a day. When he thought that the coast was clear, he used one of the lighters for the fire pit. He didn't even take a drag before our grandfather came out yelling at him, scaring us all to death. With three kids crying, begging him not to tell our parents, he gave us mercy. As long as we cleaned the boat we'd been putting off all weekend. Overall, my grandfather was a scary man. One night, after telling each other ghost stories to freak each other out, the worst thing happened when everyone else was dead asleep. I needed to use the restroom. I hated going out at night. It might be only a few steps and yet it felt like a mile walk. Things croaked off in the woods, which were perfectly normal noises for a forest. When you're a kid, full of ghost stories and listening to these things, those noises turned into killers and ghosts waiting to scoop you up. I went through the cabin to the back door, knowing that I couldn't hold it until morning. There was a flashlight by the door. I turned it on only to have it flicker off. It was the kid's job to make sure the flashlight had new batteries. Sometimes we switched them to out the good ones in the shared Game Boy for a few more hours of playtime. It finally came back to bite us. However, since the full moon was out, I had taken the path a hundred times before, so I went on without the flashlight. I feared what my grandfather would do if I woke him up trying to find new batteries. Slipping on my shoes, I went off in the backyard and down the short path to use the washroom. I heard a noise and I looked over my shoulder and walked faster fearing what might be looking at me in the dark. That was a mistake. Going without a flashlight and not paying attention to where I was going could have killed me that night. The longer I walked, the more afraid I was. It should not take this long to get to the outhouse. Another crack of a twig made me jump. I could no longer hold it and needed to step off the path to do my business and carry on. I hated going to the washroom out in the woods. At least it was quick and I was back on the path towards the cabin. But was I? Nothing looked right. The trail appeared too overgrown. I didn't understand how I had gone so far off the path. In my mind, I went the right way the entire time and I only got lost when I stepped aside. Fear nearly froze me to the spot, forcing my body to move. I started going down where I thought I had came from, praying to find the path again. At this point, I called out for someone to come and get me. A sound came and I shut my mouth. Heart beating so fast that it hurt. I looked around trying to see what was stalking a poor scared kid in the dark. Something flew at me. Wings flapping and a screeching cry made me snap. That's when I ran, screaming, trying to get away from whatever this thing was. Only when I stopped running and was very lost, I realized I just got scared by a bat. Just a normal, harmless bat. I wanted to cry, unless someone noticed I wasn't in my sleeping bag when they woke up to go to the bathroom as well. No one would know I was missing until morning. How long would it take until someone did notice? I skipped breakfast pretty often. They might even assume I was just sleeping in. I didn't want to stay out in the woods overnight. Having no other options or ideas of what to do while lost, I kept walking while trying to force back my tears. I had forgot it was best to stay in one spot while being lost in the woods. Just going deeper in them wasn't the best idea. 
I felt cold, scared, and was getting bit by bugs. My heart almost broke over the idea of being out there forever, starving to death, and no one ever knowing what happened. Thinking back to the books I needed to read in school, I wonder if I could live out in the woods until they found me. If I find clean water and could figure out how to make a fire, I might be able to. The issue being, I never actually started a fire without a lighter. I tried with sticks, but it always took too long, and we always gave up. Me and my cousins loved burning things and were impatient. There was always a lighter to use. I wanted to try and find the cabin until the sun rose. If I still was in the woods by tomorrow night, I would buckle down to figure out how to make fire. Wait, wouldn't someone smell the smoke and find me sooner? Or would I burn the entire forest down? Getting motivated, I started to look for a clearing that I could use for a fire pit. It took a while, but I found a spot where the ground looked to be mostly dirt. It took longer to find a stone I could use to start digging out a hole in the dirt for my fire pit. My hands cold and the rock cut into my fingers a few times. Then, I needed to find the right sticks to get the fire started. And then finally, get enough wood to keep it going if I did get one started. I didn't go out of sight of the clearing as I collected what I needed. Exhausted by the time I thought I was ready, my pit was filled with dry leaves and small sticks. I sat down ready to try to get a fire started. I used two sticks I peeled the bark off at first. My hands became raw from rubbing them together. Frustrated, I didn't think I could get them warm enough from the friction to get anything started. I then tried the rock method. I didn't know if any rocks would do, or if my grandfather had a special type in his fire starting kit. A miracle of the night happened when I found the right rocks to smash together. One spark caught and I nearly fainted when the leaves burned and yet didn't catch fire. I kept trying until I had a very small flame that I actually fed with my breath. I never been so proud of myself in my entire life. The smoke blew into my face causing me to cough and eyes water. Still very happy for my very small fire though. There wasn't a way to tell how long I was out there for. The sun hadn't even risen yet, so at least a few hours. As I warmed myself by the flames, I heard something, off in the distance of the woods. I heard it, again. My chest got tight with hope when I recognized that the noises I was hearing were human voices. No one I knew, but still someone out here in the woods with me. With my fire still going, I would be able to see my way back to the clearing if needed. I hurried off towards the voices so happy I couldn't speak. Mine. Mine. The voices were a warning for the person they were speaking with. It sounded strange, as if English wasn't their first language. Still, it was someone who could help. At least, that's what I thought. Rushing into another clearing, all my excitement faded when I saw what belonged to those voices. A dead torn to pieces deer sat in the middle of the small clearing blood soaking the grass and leaves in the clear moonlight i saw three pale things figures all hunched over in the deer tearing in with their hands and teeth all their limbs were skinny and far too long for their bodies each of them were pushing aside each other trying to eat as much of the deer as they could skin pale and drawn tight against their bones, faces covered with blood, each of them bald, with a mouth far too large for their face, and their eyes, oh god, their eyes were missing, each of them had black empty sockets, none of them noticed me, that is, until I let out a scream, all three heads darted up, now knowing there was some fresh prey, I turned to run. Sounds from behind me said they were all starting to chase me. Tears came to my eyes making it nearly impossible to see where I was going. I slammed into a tree hard enough to hit my arm to the point I thought it was broken. I tumbled to the ground 
crying and pain. My moment of weakness enough for one creature to get on top. Limbs on either side. The head looking around trying to hear where I was. The large mouth opening. Dripping blood on my tear stained face. The moment before the mouth filled with teeth tore my face off. A loud cracking sound echoed through the forest. The creature blown off. I screamed even more when a powerful hand grabbed my shoulder to drag me to my feet. Grandpa. I choked up when I saw him clearly through my wet eyes. He was holding a shotgun, ready to fire again. His face stern, not afraid or surprised of the creatures. I expected them to attack us. They somehow knew what the gun could do. Grabbing their dead, they dragged it deeper into the darkness. The moment they were out of sight, I heard the worst noise. Awful sounds of bones cracking and breaking. They were eating the one my grandfather had shot. It was all too much for me. I broke down crying, my grandfather silently bending over to pick me up in one arm. As he carried me through the woods, he stomped out my small fire on the way out. He didn't scold me for crying or getting lost. Him actually comforting me that night was the kindest moment we ever shared together. We arrived back by the time the sun was rising. My mother and father awake and worried out of their mind. They scooped me up when we arrived and I cried all over again. Before we left, I was able to get my grandfather alone to ask him what happened. Those things wouldn't bother us at the cabin. I only saw them because I went too far in the woods. Apparently he had a deal with them, that they were not to touch any humans as long as he fed them, and he also wasn't sure how many of them lived in the woods, or even what they were. He also said that he fully understood if I didn't want to come back to the cabin next year. I almost didn't, until he passed away of natural causes. I spent parts of my summer at the cabin. He wasn't able to get an indoor toilet, but he did mark the path to the outhouse with those solar charged lamps that people use in their garden to make sure that no one ever goes off the path again. The one and only time I went hunting was with my father when I was 11. My mom didn't work so it was up to him to provide for us. My entire life he worked more than he was at home. When he did come home, he would drink in front of the TV, too exhausted to do anything. The years crept up on him and he finally noticed how old I had gotten and how I was already shaping up to be a disappointment in his eyes. I was small for my age. I stayed inside a read instead of playing sports. My body was so frail I got sick often. When he finally truly looked at me for the first time, he didn't recognize the son that lived in his house. Therefore, he thought that hunting would be the answer. If I would man up and shoot something, maybe I might grow into the person he wanted. We never really spent any time together. Hunting with my father felt like being stuck inside a forest with a stranger. What kind of person even enjoys camping? Was I even missing something? My father kept sipping away at a steel water bottle that I knew didn't have water inside. Without it, he never would have lasted the day. We caught no fish at the lake for lunch the first day. Trying out luck, we went into the forest trying to shoot something for dinner. We packed something to eat, but not much. My father worked hard. However, he was supporting all three of us on his own. I knew it would be four of us soon. My mom hadn't told him yet, and I wasn't sure how he would take it. I really prayed she would leave him. As heartless as that was to hope for, we could go to my uncle's house so my father could be alone. Maybe retire in a few years without having to worry about supporting a family. Even as a child, 
I could see how much his jaw broke his body a little more every day. In my mind, my mother didn't have any kind of feelings for this stranger. Instead of going outside playing with neighborhood friends, I worried about my family's future. In the woods, hunkered down, my father waited for something to come into his sight. For the first time, he made the attempt to talk with me and teach me things. After a while, when he thought I could be trusted, he placed the rifle into my hands and let me get into position. It was far too big for my short arms and little hands. I was scared that if I shot it, the recoil would break my shoulder. I didn't know the first thing about guns. In the movies I had seen, they always had a powerful recoil. Line it up, our dinner is over there. My father whispered in my ear. A rabbit came into a clearing. He spotted it first, looking through the sight. I went through everything I had just learned. I only needed to pull the trigger. Such a simple little thing. My father would teach me more things patiently and be proud of me. The first hunting trip with his son would become a cherished memory, but it didn't go like that. I froze up. I just couldn't shoot the rabbit. Aside from not wanting to kill another living creature, I felt like if I shot it, I would be living a lie. My father would try his best to act like the person he should be, teaching me how to skin the rabbit and how to cook it. But he would not actually care about me. He never did. This trip would never turn into a family relationship he wanted. The small rabbit jumped off and out of sight to become a meal for something else. I eased up the grip on the rifle the moment before it was snatched from my hands. My father shot at the rabbit now hidden in the bush. Why didn't you shoot it? He hissed at me. When he got angry, his voice got low. He was never the type to yell and scream. I wonder if he did shout at me. I might be less scared of him. Whenever I had a nightmare, it was always the same. My father sitting in the living room in the dark, staring at the TV. I stood in the doorway looking at him, just waiting. The waiting crept dread into my bones. I hated the wait. I wish he would just finally scream at me. I couldn't stand his silent rage any longer. Go, Go back, back to camp. You're useless. Those words should have done nothing to me. After all, this man wasn't my father. Not really. He was a stranger. And yet, I felt my face full of shame. But I still didn't regret not shooting the rabbit. I went back to the camp trying to make myself useful. I collected firewood. I cleaned up and did anything else that I thought would make my father happy. I heard the sound of a truck. We parked pretty close by and my stomach sank at the thought of him just leaving me here. But our gear cost a lot of money. He would leave his son in the woods but not things he worked hard for. For hours I was alone in the tent. I brought a book along. I nearly finished it by the time my father returned. He smelled drunk and liked fast food. I knew he had gone into town for supper and a few drinks alone. I only ate a hot dog and a handful of marshmallows. The arrangement was fine by me. The rest of the night he spent by the fire, just drinking. The scene identical to how he spent time at home, just looking forward yet not taking anything in. He stayed outside even after night fell. I went back into our tent trying to sleep, finding it impossible. I thought about how things would change when my new sibling came if they ever made it to that point. I fear that my father would try to make sure that he didn't have another mouth to feed. I wanted nothing more to get away from that man, even though in a way, he had never done anything to me. The nothing made me feel as if something was coming. At some point I fell asleep, but some rustling outside woke me up. In my drowsy state I sat up hearing my father's voice outside. Take him please not me he was crying the man that i didn't know a thing about was crying his voice was very faint as if far away 
more begging and pleading until I heard something that made me scramble into the corner of the tent. He finally broke the silence, and the noise I always dreaded came. He screamed, and just kept screaming as if his life depended on it. Clutching my knees to my chest, tears came to my eyes as I could do nothing but listen. Cracks from the rifle came. Whatever he was firing at, he missed, or it didn't care. The entire exchange only took a few minutes that felt like years. Finally, his voice drifted away, as if he was being dragged at a fast pace. At first, I wanted to stay inside the tent until morning. I cried hard until my throat felt raw and my eyes hurt. When my crying spell stopped, I decided to see if he dropped the rifle. I would need a weapon until I could leave when dawn came. I unzipped the tent only enough to peek outside. The dying fire did not give enough light to see by. I needed to go outside. Finding a flashlight, I carefully got out, hyper aware of every sound around me. Scanning the ground, I saw the hot dogs were still where I left them. If my father was attacked by a wild animal, why didn't they take these as well? Did the smell attract something and decided a full grown man would be a better meal? I saw no sign of the rifle, only tracks in the dirt where my father made his last stand. I felt sick because I realized he was coming towards the camp instead of the truck when he got snatched away. He was either trying to save me or wanted to use me as bait. Thinking the truck would be a better place to wait until the morning, I started to look around trying to find a trail towards it. I stopped when I heard a voice. Please, not me. Help. It sounded so hurt and awful, but I knew that was my father calling out. For the first time in my life, he was trying to reach me. I abandoned the idea of the truck. I foolishly turned away and went towards the voice. For hours I walked in those woods getting hopelessly lost. I felt sick with fear. Anything could be in the dark and I only had a small flashlight to protect myself. Whatever took my father easily overpowered a full grown man. I didn't have a choice if it came across me. I would let my emotions take over and it might get me killed. Then again, I was only a child back then, so I shouldn't be too hard on myself. Please. Please. The voice came from close by, very low and raspy, but still my father's voice. I had been walking for hours at that point. My small body wasn't meant to move this much in the cold wet darkness. I knew a fever already coming and wasn't thinking clearly as I walked towards the voice. I didn't even consider it it may be someone else aside from who I wanted to find. Coming into a clearing, I started to look around with my flashlight. The small beam of light landed on something that made me choke on air. Someone killed a deer, skinned it, and hung it from a tree. In the darkness, that's what it looked like. I knew what a skin deer looked like. It's what my mind wanted to see. The kill was so fresh, blood still dripped down onto the grass. I couldn't stop myself from starting to take a shorter and shorter breath when a whisper of a thought came to my mind that the body wasn't a deer. That's not him, I said out loud only to myself. That's not him. It's a deer. It's a small deformed deer with small legs. Unable to stop myself, I suddenly hunched over and threw up my meal from hours before, mostly bile that stung my throat. Seeing such a sight in the dark made me completely snap. Instead of screaming, I started to laugh. On my knees alone, lost and scared beyond words. Weak chuckles at first, that turned into a cackling, that soon turned into heavy sobs that locked up my chest. It's not him. I was sobbing, holding myself, not being able to look at the body in front of me. 
After getting another few glances between tears, I saw how different the legs were compared to what deer legs should look like. I only held on to some hope it wasn't my father skinned and hanging from a tree because I had just heard him a few minutes before entering the clearing. The kill was new, but skinning took a while, even if you knew what you were doing. In the next few moments, I saw why my hope was unfounded. I forced myself to stop crying when I saw a pale face in the dark on the other end of the clearing. The face looked at me through the trees, just beyond the skinned body. I opened my mouth to ask for help, but nothing came out aside from a croak. To my horror, the face came out of the trees with the rest of its terrible body. I didn't understand what I was seeing, even though the pale creature stood out in the darkness. I wanted to believe I was still in my tent dreaming this entire thing. The monster was a thing of nightmares. It was skinny, so much so I could see every bone in its body. It had arms so long they walked on its elbows. The rest of its arms folding backwards, sticking up above its head. The same was for its legs. It crawled on its knees. Legs pointed up towards the sky. The pale thing saw me. Inhuman sunken eyes on a flat human shaped face. Standing up I thought I could run. It was still a few feet away and judging from how deformed its body was. I doubt it could move very fast. I only got to take a single step back when it raised an arm. The rest of its arm snapped the head, easily covering the distance of the clearing. I assumed it couldn't reach more with its entire arm because it was bent back, but I was mistaken. Twisted fingers grabbed the front of my shirt. I was dragged, too in shock to do anything, raising me up. I met those horrible black eyes. The smell of rotting breath nearly made me pass out. I was so small and frail I could do nothing to fight against this monster. Most likely my father was dead. It would skin me and eat me and I couldn't do a damn thing about it. The whole situation was so bleak I surprised myself over what I did next. I started to laugh again. The monster's features twisted in confusion. I still laughed until tears came back to my eyes. And that thing, whatever it was, copied me. It laughed my own voice back towards me. And we both ended up laughing until I physically couldn't any longer. I wish I had an explanation of how I escaped from that creature. I was told later that I had been found on a hiking trail. A week later nearly starved to death. Even after my body recovered, my mind didn't. Everyone assumed I had killed my father in those woods and the event just broke me. I wish I could believe that and that the creature I had seen wasn't real. I don't remember the two years after I had been found. I ate and slept not doing much else. One day, I weakly laughed at a joke I overheard. When the doctors found out I would react to any kind of comedy, they were able to get me to laugh myself back to a new normal. I remember seeing that monster in the woods. Then, I was with my mother and a new little sister. No memories in between. I haven't yet told her about that creature. They found some rope with my father's blood on it. However, they didn't know where his body was or even how I got up into the tree to tie up that rope to start with. The case was still open and would be for the rest of my life. I do still want to give a warning to everybody about that thing in the woods. I'm sure it's still out there waiting. I don't know why it let me go. Maybe it was thankful I had given it the perfect voice to draw in others towards it. So if you ever go into the woods and you hear a child laughing, don't go towards it. That's actually the time to leave before it's too late. If you have read or listened to Anansi's Goatman story, 
you'll find that it's pretty similar to mine. I couldn't believe some stuff when I read it and how it compares to my experience that I'm about to tell you about. It was 2007. I was with a couple of my friends camping. I was 16 and was just with some 16 to 18 year olds on this fun camping trip out in the woods behind some of these guys houses. We picked a spot in the clearing where it would be like a little party kind of site even though I'm not into drugs or even smoke weed or any of that. I grew up with that going all around me so I tried my best to avoid it. But nobody brought weed or anything along. I don't think so at least. So we all hung out in this clearing with three different tents set up and with a fire pit in the middle. We had planned to spend four to five days. It was summer vacation so we didn't have school. I think this was early August, but anyways. So we all decide to hang out in the clearing, roasting marshmallows and everyone but me having beers. I sat around making s'mores and the sun was just beginning to set and we were all having a good time. At around 7 p.m. or so, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby and someone threw an empty beer bottle at the bushes. We heard the bottle break and we saw something climb out of the bushes and lumber back into the trees. We thought it was just some psycho person, but everyone got a little bit nervous. Later that night, I was asleep in the tent with three other people. The only person I knew was my friend Paul, who is actually the one that invited me along. I remember everything being quiet. And then I heard a sort of popping sound by the fire, and we all sat up, crawling out. We could hear people in the other tent's voices saying, the fuck was that? That's when Paul unzipped the tent, and we crawled out. The fire, which we had actually put out about an hour or two ago, was now extremely high with flames. We put it out and thought maybe someone poured gas all over the fire, and possibly lit a match or lighter and lit the fire but we never heard the gas pouring or a match being struck or a lighter being flicked. We also didn't hear anybody running away because obviously we would have heard them. It was at this point that there was an awful smell except that I had a stuffy nose and couldn't make it out really. It may have been a skunk but Paul said one of the other guys said it smelled like rotten meat but we had not smelled it earlier or since then. Some other people began holding their shirts up to their noses as if a smell had just appeared. We were all on edge, but I guess most of the people agreed and said, fuck it, let's just stay here. Nobody brought any guns to fend ourselves off, but one guy who was about 18 said that he actually brought a pocket knife. On our second day there, Nothing happened until it became night again. At around 4 a.m., we were all fast asleep and were awoken by noises behind our tent. We started to get out when Paul said, Shut the fuck up for a minute. We sat in silence listening to the noises which sounded like voices I couldn't make out. The voices seemed to be coming closer to us and we quietly climbed out of the tent. The voices still approaching our camp the two other guys in our tent actually crept to the other tents and woke the other people up, telling them to get out of here at once. All 13 of us stood quiet, listening to the voices get closer. This was to the point where they were behind our tent. We heard the voices stop, but then an eerie, humming noise was coming from the trees all around us. One of the guys, I think his name was Ben, who was 17 or 18, walked about 10 feet from the tree line where the voices had been coming from and he said, hey, who's there? And we quietly waited for a response. We heard nothing except distant crickets. He then walked back to us and right then we heard the voices moving away, which to me sounded like what Ben had asked. Hey, who's there? But it didn't sound like Ben moving away almost like something was trying to mimic what he sounded like. 
I could hear the voice sort of crackly and jumpy, repeating those words as it moved off into the distance. Hey, who's there? Hey, who's there? We all got back to our tents but didn't sleep. The next day, someone had left to their house to grab something. They came back a little later with a potato gun saying he'll shoot the fuck out of the thing bothering our campsite. Around 7 p.m., we were just huddled around the fire, and a girl, just one of the two, stands up, practically pissing herself and we find out what's wrong. Before I continue, here's one of the similar things I found with the well-known Goatman story. She said that last night, when we were listening to the voices, there was another person with us. There was 13 of us now, but she insisted that there had been a 14. Reading the Goatman story and connecting that experience later made me scare. We all started to get nervous again, and Ben told us he was going to run back to the house. He and Potato Gun Guy were neighbors, and he said he was going to get his father to come out here with a gun and wait. Someone actually went with him, and Paul and I were just talking to each other about how we could leave early if shit got too chaotic, which actually felt like it was starting to. We were in the middle of talking about how we should pack up when we saw Ben standing in the woods. It was him with his blue sweater and jeans and he was looking directly at us from about 40 feet away. But we didn't know what the fuck he was doing. The person who went with him wasn't standing next to him. It was just him standing alone watching us. It was a 25 minute walk back to his house. But he couldn't have been back in five minutes. That's when everyone got really uncomfortable and people started yelling. Hey Ben, what are you doing? But he just kept watching us. We kept watching him as he seemed to slink back into the trees. By now, people were scared out of their minds and I was too. Why was Ben being a prick and just staring at us and not doing anything? That's when we decided to pile into one tent and just wait. Some short time later, the other Ben turned up with his dad, and the other person that went with him and his dad was holding a hunting rifle. Ben told him what happened with the voices, and the father walked that way into the trees and took a look around. He said it felt like eyes were watching him from every direction. Paul then told Ben's dad that we just saw another Ben standing in the woods staring at us. Ben's dad walked over there and looked around too. He came back and said that he could stay with us and the gun, but said he would control it because if we got drunk and started shooting a gun around, we would all end up killing ourselves. He ended up sleeping in Ben's tent. It was our third night here, and it was really fucking creepy. We quietly listened for it, being anywhere nearby. I then looked at Paul, and he had a funny look in his eyes and started sweating. He later told me that while we were all sitting around, he saw a strange figure moving through the forest, moving its arms around in a strange jumpy motion. Around 2 a.m., we were all getting ready for bed, and then we heard it. It was saying something but in a high voice. It sounded like it was saying, hey, who's there? Completely mimicking what Ben had said the night before. Ben's dad tried to pinpoint where the voice was coming from and fired a shot into the trees. The gunshot was loud as fuck. Right after, we could hear a creepy, chanting-like male voice. I was scared. Paul was scared. Shit, everyone was. The chanting sounded like a deep voice. Underneath the voice, we could hear something mumbling noises. Again, Another shot was fire, but I saw what Ben's dad was shooting at. It was a figure, crouched low by some bushes. It looked like a straight hit, but the figure did not move. Instead, it stood up, sort of hunched over and moved back into the forest. That's when we raced back into our tents, and I could hear crying and screaming coming from right behind us. All four of us in the tent were getting scared and then I could kind of smell a strong vinegar smell that was very strong. Then, 
I noticed what looked like fingertips moving along the tent wall and to the door and moved down the zipper to grab the part you used to open. Paul went over to the zipper and held it down as whoever or whatever tried to pull it open. Paul and one other guy in the tent started yelling, who's out, out there? there? Who, Who the, the fuck, fuck is, is out there? there? And after a minute, we could hear a screeching noise as this thing took off into the darkness. That's when we finally said, fuck the fourth and fifth day, let's get the fuck out of here in the morning. But yet, here's the scariest experience of that night. At 3.45 a.m., I was checking my watch and I had to go pee. Since what happened was just not too long ago, I decided I wasn't getting out of the tent and maybe I could stick my bird out of a small zipper opening. But then I pictured that whatever was out there would end up biting or ripping my thing off. So I decided to open up the tent. I slid it outside just slightly and peed to the side of the door. As soon as I was done, I noticed someone standing at the furthest tent away. I grabbed my flashlight beside my pillow and turned it on and shined it towards the person. It looked like Paul with his back facing me, hunched over by the tent. But Paul was right behind me sleeping in the tent. I crawled back inside but kept my light shined on the other Paul. I whispered, Paul, wake, wake up. up. And the moment he did, I looked outside to see the other Paul stand up and turn facing towards me and stare at me. I dove back in and leaped under my sleeping bag and huddled there awake as I explained to Paul what I had just seen. I guess at one point in the night, I ended up falling asleep and facing the opposite way because one of the guys in the same tent said that he woke up with his eyes still half closed as he rode over and that he could see the other Paul looking through the tent flap that I didn't close. He thought it was just Paul coming to wake them up, but then he realized that the real Paul was asleep right beside him. That's when we packed up and left. So I guess that's the creepiest thing that happened to me. I don't know exactly where this forest was. It was on a private land. It's not like I'm going back, but damn, was that fucking scary. I have a couple different stories I can share. However, they're not that scary as this. I'm not scared of anything. That's what I yelled to my brother as I slammed the door to my car shut. But things have changed. I have changed. I remember his smirk. How he was holding out my jacket. The way he spouted off an endless list of things I should be scared of. Skinwalkers, wendigos, witches, and even other humans. He presented each one as reason after reason of why this idea was stupid, saying that I still had time to flake out and save face. I remember rolling my eyes, snatching my jacket from him, sliding into my car, and yelling that I'm not scared before speeding away into the dark outline of the mountains. They stood out stark against the setting sun, and boy, how I wish I would've listened. I was wrong. And he was right. Now, I'm scared. But let me back up a bit. It all started about two days ago. I was out of my mind depressed. I could barely get out of bed. I thought about throwing myself in front of cars, over bridges, off buildings, just dying. I thought about dying all the time. And enough was enough. One of the few friends I had brought up the idea that I should try solo camping and it might clear my mind that the wilderness, the silence, the solitude would do me good. He gave me a list of spots, some were more isolated than the others. And of course, being in the situation that I was, I decided on the most isolated one. This one was about a three hour hike from the last campsite far out in the Rocky Mountain National Forest. I remember his face, the surprise, the acceptance. 
Are you sure about this? His voice cracked. I nodded, saying nothing. It's a pretty secluded place, especially for a first-time camper. He shrugged. But then again, it's a beautiful spot. It'll definitely give you some perspective. And the night sky out there is insane. I said thanks and turned to leave, but he spoke up again. A word of advice from a veteran. Don't go out at night, no matter what you hear. You might end up getting fucked up by a bear or lion. The drive up the mountains was soothing. The gently curving roads that wove their way through the trees and up the rocks were exciting to navigate. And soon, my mind was now in a peaceful state. I decided to leave electronics this trip, even going as far as securing my phone in my glove box. I wanted to be completely free of all that shit, able to focus on the moment, then to let my mind wander into the past or fear the future. I would be gone for five days and four nights. Enough time for me to hopefully recover and reassess my life and what I was doing with it. I found the entrance to the park with ease and continued to the closest lot to my campsite. Nighttime was arriving and I silently cursed myself for leaving so late. I sat in my vehicle for a good 30 minutes before deciding that it would be too risky hiking three hours in near pitch black. There were four other tents set up in the lot. I found some room for one more, and soon, I had my own tent set up. The night was very comfortable. I was surrounded by people talking, laughing people and happy children who ran around and round screaming. A few of them offered me roasted hot dogs and s'mores, and even beers and I filled my belly. I was rolled up in my sleeping bag before the last dying embers faded away. The second night didn't go as smooth. I woke up late, well rested, but still groggy and took my time repacking my tent. I hesitated at first, wondering if I should just stay there. But at 3 p.m. another family showed up with proof they had reserved the site. So I gathered my things and set off, and I quickly got lost. Navigating by map and compass for the first time and alone is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And the trees, the trees can be misleading. They can turn you around, make you think you're on the right path. When really, you're miles from where you're supposed to be. Instead of taking me three hours to get to the site, it took me almost twice that time and I was quickly losing what little light was left in the day. Finally, I found the site. I quickly set up my tent, building a small fire in front. It was dark now, and I was jumpy. Every sound I heard was magnified. Every shadow cast by the dim light of the fire, a menace. With fear, I crawled into the tent and crawled up in my bag, trying to will myself into sleep. After a while, I was snoozing, about to drift off, when I heard it. The sound of a foot crunching outside. My eyes shot open and I reached for my flashlight, but didn't turn it on. I waited. I heard the sound again. Someone or something was definitely walking around my tent. It sounded like whoever this was was trying to be quiet. It went on for hours in inconsistent bursts until I finally decided it was an animal, scavenging for the scraps or inspecting my tent. By dawn, I was snoozing again and the noise had finally stopped. I told myself I would sleep for an hour or two, giving myself time to rest up. I woke up confused, exhausted, and groggy, and started to panic before remembering I was out camping, and that I needed to start hiking back now. But when I came out the tent, I saw that the sun was already setting. To say I was upset would be an understatement. I hesitated for a moment, trying to decide what to do. I wanted to go home, I wanted to leave, see how far I could get out there. But deep down I knew I would get lost and most likely end up in a worse situation. So I began collecting as much wood as I could to build a big ass fire and get ready to hunker down for the night. The light from the sun seemed to disappear fast.
the third night was pretty problematic. I sat awake in my tent for hours after the sun went down, waiting. The darkness around me seemed to crush the light from the fire, making it seem like a small tiny candle in a sea of shadows. For hours I sat there, listening, afraid. Finally, I realized I was just being ridiculous, that what I heard the night before was actually nothing to fear, that my monkey mind was just playing tricks on me, keeping me alert for no reason. So I bundled myself up and lay down, and that's when I heard it, softly at first, a footstep, then two, three, growing louder. I sat up and felt my eyes increase to the size of saucers and my breath quickened. What was that? I had to know. I was operating purely off of fear. I heard the noise. It sounded like something running and running around and around my tent. Suddenly, the side of my tent pushed in as if someone was slapping it from the outside. Hey, I'm awake. I'm in here. I tried to stand, tripping myself up in my sleeping bag in the process and slammed into the front of my tent. Scrambling up, I quickly unzipped the flap and ran outside with a red tinted flashlight. That's when I saw a shape scurry away, and I quickly followed. And there, standing at the edge of the firelight, barely visible, was the silhouette of a person. They were standing with their back towards me. Their arms were hanging in strange positions by their sides. Their head pointed straight away from me. I took a step towards them, and a branch cracked underneath me. The sound seemed to startle the person, and they turned their head so slightly. Hey, I said again, what, what the, the fuck, fuck, man? A sound that crescended into a scream. It was a laughing sound, and it echoed around me, rattling around in my head. I ran, leaping into my tent. Sipping it up behind me, crawling into my sleeping bag, crying. And that's when the world around me exploded. Or, rather, imploded. The walls of the tent shook, like hundreds of hands were slapping it, poking it, punching it. Outside, what sounded like dozens of people running around shattered the silence. I don't know how or when I fell asleep. I actually think I fainted. Either way, I woke up the next day to a reddish glow surrounding me. I sat up and ran outside, looking around for proof of what I heard, but there was nothing. No footprints, handprints, or any disturbance at all. Man, fuck all this, I said to myself, throwing my things chaotically into my bag. I'm gonna leave today, in the dark. I couldn't stay another night here. I was just starting to unpull the tent when I heard it, a sound in the distance perhaps carried to me by the wind, which was picking up around me. Help me. Help me. Please. Oh God. Oh God. Help me. I reacted more out of instinct than logic and began running towards the sound before realizing that I, in no way, was in a place to help whoever was screaming. Still, I tried to locate the source of the sound, following the voice for about 30 minutes. Where are you? I yelled looking around me through the maze of trees. I'm here. I'm over here. Where are you? I'm over here. Where are you? Where are you? Glee the screams descended into a deep unsettling laughter. Scared out of my mind, I turned and ran back the way I came. By some miracle, I made it back to my site, grabbed my pack, and uprooted the post of the tent thinking that I would just roll it up and carry it back instead of taking the time to fold it neatly and shove it into its bag. As I pulled each pole, the tent was falling a little bit, but it was only on the third pole out of six that I realized it wasn't falling fully flat. Confused, I peered into the tent and reeled in horror, too afraid to even scream. There was someone sitting inside, but not just anyone. It was me, sitting there, pale and bone thin, a too wide grin plastered on my face. 
a single droplet of blood rolled down from each eye, which instead of having green eyes were totally black. I jumped back, tripping over my own feet. Laughing rose up around me again as I scrambled up to my feet, and I saw my hand that was in my hand reach out from the tent, followed by the other, then the head, this face, looked up at me, still smiling, then laughed again. I screamed and I ran, and I kept running. I don't even know if I was running the right way, but I couldn't even use the sun anymore for guidance since it had almost fully set. I ran without looking where I was going. I kept looking behind me to see if that thing was following me. I could feel the trees scratching me up, pushing against me, like they were trying to hold me back, almost holding me still until that thing came for me. Suddenly, a light flashed in my face, and I ran into something solid, something black, something that wrapped around me. I instantly cowered, hiding my face in my hands. Fuck. Oh, please, God, no. I heard my own voice, terrified, shaking. Hey, calm down. It's all right. You just scared me. What's wrong? I looked up into the gray eyes of a human face. The face of a middle-aged man, to be exact. He was holding me up. The flashlight he was using lay falling at our feet. I looked back, fearful of what I might see. But there was nothing. Only trees swinging slowly in the slight breeze. Hey, um, was that you? Screaming? I came out here to check. I couldn't speak. I was too terrified. I shook my head. Were you camping out there alone? He asked, letting me go and bending down to retrieve the flashlight. I nodded, then began crying. Hey, it's alright. It can be spooky out here. My car is right over there. He gestured with his head back behind him. I wiped my nose and blinked, finally finding my voice. Who are you? He glanced at me then away. Um, a park ranger. But he didn't look like one. He was wearing a smooth black suit, black tie, and white shirt. And his shoes were polished leather, not even hiking boots. Come on now, he said again taking my pack and swinging it into his back. As he did so, his jacket flapped slightly and I saw what looked like a handgun strapped to his belt. How did you find me? He shrugged. Good hearing, I guess. We entered a small clearing and I saw a black SUV with tinted windows, headlights flaring, with the engine still running. He popped the trunk and threw my bag in as I climbed into the passenger's side seat. He climbed into the driver's seat and asked me where he should take me. I told him the lot number and we were on our way. He flipped the cubby between us open and pulled out a bag. Do you want cornuts? He asked holding out the bag to me. I took it gratefully and began chomping away. I licked my fingers then looked back at him. So are you really a park ranger? He looked at me, then back to the road, but still, I stared at him, transfixed. He looked exhausted, his wood-colored hair, dirty from the forest. I, um, the SUV jerked to a sudden stop and the man let out a slow, low breath. His eyes narrowed and he looked over at me, then back to the dirt trail in front of us. I followed his gaze, feeling the fear churning up inside me. And there, in the middle of the road, was me. The other me. Its limbs were hanging limply, as if they were broken. And that sickly smile was still plastered across its face. Then, it waved. The man looked back at me. Then back at this thing that wasn't me. Then back at me. And then again, I met his gaze. Alright, fuck that. I don't get paid enough for this shit. The man said before slamming his foot on the accelerator straight towards the thing. We both felt the impact. The car bounced over the body and the man kept driving. But around us, in between the trees, stirred into the darkness, the laughing sound boiled up again. We finally reached the lot, bathed in the first light of the rising sun. The man behind me seemed to be deep in thought, distracted. I was still scared, 
but hopeful that whatever that thing was, it was now dead, crushed by the car, or at least so badly wounded that it would soon die. The SUV slowed to a stop, and the man popped the trunk and hopped out. He walked to the back and grabbed my pack as I jumped out. He handed it to me and I took it, then thanked him for everything. Not a problem, he said. All in the days or nights, work. His lips quiver as if he was about to smile. I turned to leave, but he spoke up again. Hey, I turned to face him again. If you ever want to talk about what you um saw, or, you know, just talk, call me. He held out a card. I took it and looked down at it. It was a black card, and only had a single number on it. There was no area code. So, um, I began, but I heard the door slam and looked up. The man was already back in his car. He waved at me, then sped off back the way we had come, back towards that thing. I shoved the card in my pocket, climbed into my car, and left. I still haven't told anyone about what happened, even when they ask why I refuse to go camping ever again. I just shrug and tell them that it wasn't my thing, that I prefer a warm bed and the sounds of a busy city. Ever so often though, I'll sometimes pull out this card, my fingers lingering over the phone, wondering who the man really was, and if he would really be able to explain what happened to me. I'm gonna start off this story by explaining that it's not mine. I'm just the one who wrote it all down. I'm not Denye, the actual name of the Navajo. And this is how I'm gonna refer to them from here on out. I have never lived on a reservation and I know very little about their folklore. I was actually in between of believing all these paranormal things for a really long time until something happened to me a few years ago that made me into a believer. Nothing to do with skinwalkers or things of that nature, but it definitely made me believe in ghosts. This story was told by my Denia friend Sam and comes from his own experience. I met Sam on a photo gig a few years after graduating art school and we connected through our shared interest in the paranormal. We would tell stories about our personal paranormal experiences. All names have been changed at Sam's request for privacy and I'm using a different account. Sam also gave me permission to write this and fully cooperated with me as I put this together. According to him, he's too lazy and I have too much time on my hands so he was fine with me putting this together for him. Sam is a full-blooded Denye his mother and father grew up in the nation near New Mexico. They had Sam at a very young age and broke up a few years after he was born. His mother moved back to Illinois with his now stepfather, who is white and Catholic. Sam grew up in Chicago suburb and lived the most of his childhood and teenage years there. He would visit his dad for a couple weeks a few times a year, but never really spent a huge amount of time out on the res. It was at 20 that Sam moved in with his dad on the reservation. He said to get a better understanding of his heritage, as he said it, and stay there till he was about 24. He was very interested in his Denia heritage, especially when he started developing his art practice as a painter and photographer. As he spent more and more time on the res, he grew a deep interest in Denia superstition. I guess as a way to connect to his culture that he felt he didn't do enough to be a part of during his childhood and teenage years. Since he was raised in Midwestern suburban white culture because of his mother and stepdad. While on the res, he made friends with and eventually dated a girl that we're gonna call Jess, who had fully grown up on the res. She was a little older than Sam and got her teaching degree in another state before coming back to the rest to teach high school. She was basically agnostic, but had a very superstitious family. In fact, her great uncle, who we're gonna call John, was a medicine man. I'm not really familiar with the details surrounding this practice, and Sam also didn't talk too much about this, 
but basically he was a very respected elder and was extremely superstitious. He often spoke of Dania folklore, creatures, magic, etc., and took it all very serious. John was pretty old and often needed help around his property, so Sam was quite often over there helping him out with odd jobs. Sam felt weird taking money from the old man, especially since Sam already had a part-time job as an art teacher and sold his paintings and photos in Santa Fe art markets. So as payment, Sam would ask John to share some of his knowledge with him. It was Sam's way of connecting to his heritage. He told me that they would talk for an hour or two every night that Sam came over to help. Sam would basically grill him on every random, denier related thing under the sun and would generally get an earful about it, except when it came to one specific topic, Yinadroshi. Sam, having spent most of his childhood with his mom and stepdad off the res, didn't have the same outlook on skinwalkers that other Denia did. The whole thing about not speaking about them wasn't something he subscribed to, mainly because A, Sam grew up in the Chicago area where no skinwalkers would be around anyways, and B, he was raised Catholic and didn't believe in Denia superstitions. He was pretty interested in this part of Denia culture because of how common skinwalkers were on the internet. So naturally, his interest in them disturbed John, and he generally shut down any discussion of them. She got visibly upset and told him to never speak of them to her or her great uncle ever again. This was really weird to Sam, since Jess wasn't superstitious or even religious for that matter. He thought that his agnostic girlfriend wouldn't be so weird about these things. She explained to Sam that, despite her being agnostic, that was one thing she knew was real because she and other members of her family had experiences. She told him a very similar story to the types you'll see posted online. Late at night on the res, driving home, and seeing what you think is a coyote or a sheep following you at a great speed only upon closer inspection, see what appears to be human underneath animal skin, or a half man, half coyote kind of creature. This happened to Jess when she was a little girl, while being driven home by her father. Great Uncle John came and performed some sort of protection cleansing ritual that they thought would cover them at least for a few years. It wasn't until Jess moved back after getting her degree did she encounter one again, this time running along the rooftops of some homes and buildings in town. She thought somehow someone's dog got up on their roof, but it would then get on two legs and jump to the next building. After landing, it would stay up there, sitting cross-legged, staring at her with yellow eyes. She ended up speeding home so fast that she got pulled over by the tribal police. When she explained what she saw and why she was speeding, the officer told her to be quiet, tore up the ticket he was writing, and told her to get her ass home. Uncle John came by again and performed the ritual. Jess said that according to John, the creature wasn't after her and was caught in the act of stalking someone else. That made it set its eyes upon her, so she was to be extra cautious. And this is why she stands firm by the words of, shut the fuck up about them forever. She only told Sam all of this to keep the things off her and her family. But wouldn't you know it, that just made him more interested. And who could blame him? It seems as though Sam kind of whittled down John's resolve on the issue. Because eventually, the old man budged a little bit. He revealed to Sam a few bits and pieces of information over the years. I'm just going to copy and paste from some Instagram messages he sent me. Please note that the only changes I made to his messages were the names of those involved. Also, in case it isn't obvious, Sam likes to abbreviate Skinwalker to SW. The first thing John told me about Skinwalkers was that they can't actually read minds like they say in the stories and stuff. It was basically what you'll call an old wife's tale because they didn't want their kids talking about that shit and spreading the idea that this was something people could do. 
I actually think they wanted the practice of being skinwalkers to die out completely. So they thought by forbidding people from talking about it, nobody would be curious enough to try out black magic and shit. I think because Dania are so steeped in oral traditions that they basically believe that if enough people stop talking about a thing, it dies forever. But you know real well that you can't tell people not to talk about something. So they said that if you talk about skinwalkers, it will make them interested in you and seek you out. It was just them trying to scare kids. The other thing is that they are just regular people, not monsters. They don't have any special powers. They just know a lot about certain things that a lot of us don't. Like how there are things you know how to do as a video guy, for example, that regular people who never done it don't. Like when you show them a really cool edit you did or shots you pulled off, and they're like, how did you do that? It's the same kind of stuff. They just spend a lot of time learning about stuff that makes them able to do what they do. They studied animals and how they move, making suits, studied poisons, shit like that. They're actually medicine men just like John. In fact, a lot of them are openly good medicine men in the community and nobody knows they practice this stuff. It's just another form of their medicine men stuff, but they use it for people who want to harm or scare others. Like they get hired to fuck with people. John told me this one story about a close friend who was also a medicine man in the city area that had an asshole in the neighborhood who kept bitching about his property lines or something like that. He was building a fence and there was a big fuss about it. The guy was harassing the shit out of his next door neighbor because of it. But the neighbor knew where his land started and ended so he didn't budge. Eventually, some weird shit started to go down. The asshole's neighbor was talking about how there was a giant coyote in his backyard that would look in the windows at night and scare the fuck out of him and his girlfriend. He would hang in his backyard with a shotgun around sundown, which of course would weird out everyone in the neighborhood and a lot of folks were saying that he was mentally unstable. But then people in the neighborhood started hearing fucked up noises and someone saw a coyote stand on its hind legs and look in the windows. Then one day, the guy's girlfriend drove him back to the emergency room because he was having a really bad trip apparently, hallucinating and talking about this coyote man who was saying that he was going to kill him. John doesn't know what he was on, if it was some kind of drug or something. He came down a few hours later and a lot of people in town laughed it off. But John's friend and a few other people in the neighborhood, like I assume the ones who actually saw the coyote man, knew that it was most likely a skinwalker fucking with him. John said that skinwalkers know a lot about medicine, how to get the results they want from them, and how to administer them to victims without them knowing. Like they know so much about the compounds and shit, that they know exactly how it will affect you and how to fuck with you when you're on them. So John's friend came by to bless the place and perform a ritual and the weird shit stopped. Because skinwalkers are medicine men themselves, they also believe in the power of the rituals that are used against them. That's how I would say these things work. Nothing super magical or paranormal about it. They just have strong beliefs and know what to fuck with and what not to. Anywho, so he thinks that this asshole neighbor got a skinwalker on him to get him to move out of town or something like that. The last thing John told me for a really long time was about how skinwalkers were actually good guys at one time. They created that whole practice to fuck with the colonizers. They protected other people and scared away anybody trying to take the land. But some started using the practice for their own gain. And once the treaties were signed and we got land back and all that, they just started using it to do bad stuff to other Denye. After this, John basically closed the door on the skinwalker talk. Sam told me he thought it was weird that John didn't want to talk about them. After all, John said it himself that skinwalkers can't read minds and talking about them didn't draw their attention to you. As Sam said, it's an old wife's tale. He even told this to Jess but she shot him down. She actually kind of insulted him apparently, telling Sam that he's not a real Denye, 
so he doesn't understand and him trying to get into this deep skinwalker stuff was actually offensive to their heritage and that's part one i will be posting the second part soon which will begin to cover some more elements of skinwalker lore that i thought was a lot more interesting than what john initially led on I realized that the last post presented a grounded realistic idea of the skinwalker. But this is where we start getting into some real supernatural shit. And because of that, I do want to say everything with a disclaimer. That what I'm about to tell you, I cannot verify. I am not Denya, and I know very few folks who are native, much less culturally native. I don't live anywhere near the four corners either. This is all from the recollection of one Dania friend of mine who is retelling stories and information given to him by a much older man. Believe what you can or take everything with a grain of salt. I hope it's a fun read. I'm warning you, it's much longer this time around. After learning the truth about skinwalkers and being scolded by his girlfriend, Sam took the clue and for a while focused his time spent with John on things the old man actually wanted to talk about. Sam learned a lot about his culture and the practice of medicine man and worked on this gorgeous 4x5 portrait series of elderly folks on the res. Sam told me that it was around this time that he realized he was pretty cautious in the way he approached the skinwalker subject. He was just a dumb kid raised in white America who thought he was being curious about his native culture, when actually he was spending more time chasing scary stories than actually learning about his people. By the time Sam had been living on the rest for about four or so years, he even got a full time teaching job at one of the reservation schools. He moved out of his dad's place and got his own. Sam always had planned to move back to Illinois or to some bigger city with more of an art scene, but wanted to spend much more time on the res, at least another five years or so. Despite that desire to stay and his new job, he and Jess ended up moving to my city only a few months into his full-time position, and that's around the time that I actually met him. His usual response to why they both left was that he needed to be somewhere with a bigger art scene and community and Jess wanted to go back to school to get an MSW. But it wasn't until I got to know him well and we started bonding over our shared interest in the paranormal that he actually tell me why they left. Here are the DMs that he sent me. John was getting up there in age, late 80s. The guy lived a long life, had some cancer in his 60s and beat it but he would tell me that he always wondered when it would come back to take him. I think it was like in 2014 or something. As a side note, Sam moved to the res in 2010 and met John a few months after that. So he was diagnosed with lung cancer that spread to his liver, colon, and he was only given a few months to a year to live. Fucking sucked to hear because we were basically brothers by this point. For being as old as he was, he was really sharp after being diagnosed with cancer. Jess, her father, and Sam spent a lot more time with the old man helping him around the house. At this point in his life he was only in bed and had refused to be put in hospice care as he thought it was a waste of the family's money, for as Sam put it, a more comfortable way of dying. A few months in, Sam received a call from John asking him to come over that evening. And here's the message from Sam. He told me that he had some stuff he wanted to tell me that he didn't want to die with him. I assume he felt like he was on his way out based on that. I packed my recorder in case he was okay with me recording him. When Sam arrived, John was just sitting in his porch watching the sunset. He beckoned Sam to sit next to him and told him that he had some last bits of knowledge to share with him. When Sam mentioned that he brought his camera with him, John allowed him to film, with his only request being that he wouldn't show it to anyone and that he would stop recording when he told him to. This is what Sam sent me. We spent like an hour or so just talking about whatever came to his mind 
It was a lot of stuff like I told you before. Stuff like parts of the reservation that are cursed. Pathways or portals to other dimensions. And then stuff like how to bless your home. What plants do what. How to find your way home if you're lost in the desert. Also some songs and prayers that I had to have on tape because it was in the language. And I'm actually trash at it. It was like he was trying to cover everything he felt like he hadn't told me before. As he never actually passed on his knowledge to one before. He said he was keeping some knowledge for himself. But he still wanted to share what he felt comfortable with. It was here that I asked Sam why John would tell his great niece's boyfriend from Chicago all of this. If it's supposed to be secrets and stuff that stay within the Dania people. It's a little bit different than that. Like I did a lot for him. Renovated his home. Built him a patio. Even helped him get internet. And gave him my old MacBook and showed him how to use it. I gave him my old Wii. And he became fucking obsessed with Wii Sports. Pretty sure he felt like he owed me because of everything I helped him with. And I always refused to take a single penny. I get why it seems weird. But... Also, I feel like he didn't have anyone interested enough to just sit down and hear him talk for hours on end. So I guess he appreciated me for that or something. Or maybe he was actually just fucking with me, but I doubt it. He was pretty sharp in his old age and also was a genuine guy. After the sun went down, John requested that they turn off the camera and go inside. Once inside, he told Sam to turn on the TV and raise the volume. He explained that it was important that no one hear their conversation. According to Sam, the old man didn't have any neighbors for miles, so he actually found that strange, at least until he learned what their conversation was about. I haven't been honest with you about Yina Droshi, he said. He then requested that Sam burn some plants, herbs, mixtures of some sort that he had to put on top of the logs in his fireplace. This was so that, according to John, no one in this world, or the other, could hear them. It seems, and this is just Sam's reading of the situation, that John thought by writing skinwalkers off as just assholes who dress in animal skins and drug people with shrooms to fuck with them, he would discourage the young man from ever looking any further into the legends. And while that was definitely true, there were skinwalkers who had no powers, no connection with the supernatural, and were just Dania fanatics who played dress-up. That was only part of the story. Yinadroshis exist in two different natures. The first kind, John had already explained to Sam. Medicine man with no actual supernatural powers, just a very extensive knowledge of various medicine compounds, able to craft, very convincing outfits of animal pelts and can move and behave very similar to whatever animal they wish to mimic. These folks were accessible to the general population on the res. When I say accessible, of course, I don't mean just anyone can seek them out. It takes someone well connected. These skinwalkers would often receive monetary compensation for their deeds. They based this entire practice on the legends of the shapeshifters and dark witches and Denye folklore. This explains a good portion of skinwalker stories and lore that you see posted online. Large coyotes or sheep behaving strange, only to, upon closer inspection, reveal that they are a person wearing animal skins. But what about the other stories? The stories of these creatures, half man, half beast, pulling off on natural speeds around the res, running alongside cars at top speed, mimicking voices, reading and even controlling minds, immune to firearms, shape-shifting into incredibly convincing, terrifying wolf-like creatures, glowing red or yellow eyes and faces that are not human or animal. Well, you guessed it. Those are the real Yinadroshis, powerful, dark witches who have scared the Denye and sometimes others for centuries.
John said that skinwalkers developed around the time when the first colonizers arrived. Madison men and the tribes were incredibly cautious of these visitors, and as time went on, they revealed themselves to be conquerors. The medicine man, as Sam put it, turned to the dark side. In order to scare them off, medicine men back then knew that by turning to the practice of black magic, there wasn't really any turning back. Black magic robs them of humanity and corrupts their souls. But they believed that they could do this for the good of their people. And then, once the colonizers were driven out, be dealt with by their own people. In fact, some medicine men revealed their plans for this to other members of their practice who opted not to participate in the rituals. They gave them detailed instructions on how to protect themselves and even kill them when necessary. Unfortunately, we know how this turned out. And now, we have the unique Denia problem of the skinwalkers. And unlike the other skinwalkers, the pretenders in animal fur, these Yinadroshis are not human, or at least not in the sense that is recognized by the Denia. In order to become one of these things, they must participate in a ceremony that essentially robs them of their humanity and after a long enough time living as one of them, they barely even resemble a human in appearance. Think of the Wendigo, a creature that was once human, but through some horrific, twisted process or ritual, became something else. The practice of being a skinwalker is guarded, even more so than that of the pretenders. It requires committing horrible acts, murder, or torture of a family member or friend, ingesting poisons and human flesh, and communicating with entities from other dimensions. Skinwalkers are also a people unto themselves, an isolated subculture of the Dinye that branched off a long time ago. Even though they make their home in the same region as the Dinye, they generally do not live among them. They are a completely separate community John did not go into great detail on the process of becoming a skinwalker. He said no man who calls himself Denier would ever know such things. That might have been true a century ago when skinwalkers still lived among the people, but in this day and age, the skinwalker is much too concerned with being found out, and so they isolate themselves and brought all knowledge with them. Think of those tribes that are still being discovered in the jungles of Africa and South America. Completely cut off from the rest of the world, only this tribe is aware of the rest of the people and actually chooses to isolate. That all being said, of course, they still do go out among the people. It's just always at night, among only a small group of folks and only for their own dark purposes. Exactly what skinwalkers gain from their behavior towards the Denye is disrupted among medicine men. John's understanding was that, aside from stealing livestock, their abilities feed off the fear that they instill in others and to their connection to whatever dark entities. But somebody dying directly at the hands of a skinwalker is extremely rare. John then went on to say how a lot of things that are sometimes attributed to deaths of despair, such as suicide, overdose, alcohol poisoning, etc., could be traced to very powerful skinwalkers. It's said that a basic trait of the skinwalker is being able to instill fear in their victims, like a weak form of mind control. More powerful skinwalkers can actually cause folks to harm themselves. However, John wasn't sure if the mind control rumors were true. The powder of a corpse, the fable favorite weapon of the skinwalker, blown on their victims' faces, could actually be how they make these things happen. While some say that the powder of a corpse is a powerful poison that slowly kills over the course of a few days, leaving no trace of itself in one system. I heard of things like this before criminals in some parts of South America 
use something similar to make their marks essentially empty their bank accounts for them. John believes in both of these explanations. It is sometimes a cocktail of poison and human bone, and sometimes it's a drug, and the skinwalker uses this to instruct the victim to harm or kill themselves somehow. Having contact directly with their victims is too risky, both for the individual skinwalker as well as their clan, and is likely frowned upon. When a skinwalker does physically kill someone, the person either disappears or has their body found much later with their death ruled as an animal attack. John says that this is more common among weaker skinwalkers. One detail that stood out to Sam was the idea that skinwalkers communicate with other entities from other dimensions. And he pressed John on this a bit more. In Sam's words, he knew I was raised Catholic, so he explained them to me as basically being demons. I don't remember what it was, but even if I did, I most likely couldn't spell it. They are evil, inhuman spirits that try and come into our realm, or dimension, or plane, or whatever, but don't exactly have a physical presence, so they possess people, or in the case of skinwalkers, they use them as their connection to this world, so some skinwalkers do the bidding of demons, and in return, the demons give them powers. But John also said that some really old skinwalkers aren't even people anymore. They're only living as empty vessels, but demons live inside them. I guess the idea is that demons give them powers in exchange for letting the demon possess their body by using it as their flesh puppet after they die. According to John, they communicate with these beings through their knowledge of the portal system in the America Southwest. This included places that are off the reservation. Even though skinwalkers are careful about going off the res, as it can be more densely populated and carries with it a risk of being discovered, the few times they do, they are good at keeping a low profile being actual shapeshifters and all, but because of their nature they can't resist feeding off the fear of others. So small groups of campers and people driving alone at night off the res have stories as well. Sometimes lone visitors outside the reservation, but that are close to a portal, who are off camping hiking, will straight up disappear under weird circumstances. This may be a stretch but this reminded me of David's missing 411 research. I highly doubt skinwalkers are to blame for the majority of these mysterious disappearances, but what if John is saying is true, a few of them could have possibly fallen prey to one. These portals often exist in caves and small canyons, and require a full ritual, offerings, dances, and a sacrifice to open. What the sacrifice is, John isn't sure, but he guesses that disappearing hikers may have something to do with it. When the portals open, they are used for different things, communicating with spirits and demons, gaining more power, summoning other entities into our world, or even throwing themselves or others into the portals and leaving this world. Sam asked why they would go into the portals and what existed beyond them. It was another dimension that allowed them to observe our world but not interact with it, as well as see things and beings that we cannot see or interact with in our own plane. He said that they would interact in that dimension with these things called Chendis, which are the evil spirits of those deceased said to be a manifestation of everything that was bad about a person. They would send Chendis out to not only harm others and spread illness, but also report on which people were growing wise to the skinwalkers. This was where the belief that skinwalkers are not to be discussed come from. Chendis can listen to your conversations and report back to the skinwalkers who commune with them, and then using portals, show them where the offending individual lived 
it was very important to the skinwalkers that much of the general population know nothing about them, their culture, their practices, and most importantly, who they are. Nowadays, of course, because skinwalkers isolate, protecting their identities was not as crucial, as anyone who saw their original forms would never be able to recognize them as they were not members of the community. But John noted that there were select skinwalkers who would live alongside the communities, and sometimes in them, as a way of feeding off others' energy without directly stalking or scaring them. He told me a little story about this group of folks who lived near a weird old witch. This was back in the 1980s, I think. She would come into town but never buy anything from the stores or the markets or anything like that. Just walk around, stare at people. One day, a guy and his wife went into one of the cities off the rest for the weekend. And while they were at a restaurant, they saw her looking through the window at them. I actually painted this scene a while back. So they were wondering how the fuck she got out there and it scared the shit out of them. Like she just lived in a Hogan and she didn't even have a car. She ended up disappearing and that night the wife had a dream that the old lady had gone down on all fours and turned into a fucked up looking coyote. On their way back to the res the next evening they saw what they thought was an injured coyote on the side of the road. The husband was going to get out to see what was up but the wife made him stop. The coyote was looking straight at her with the same stare that she saw in the old woman's eyes. It leapt up on its hind legs and ran off. The next day, the wife told everyone she could that the old lady was a skinwalker. Rumor has it that the old witch got sick and died the next day. Do take notice of the words, rumor has it. Many people believe that if you learn and tell others of a skinwalker's identity, it can spell disaster for them and is one of the few ways an average person can kill them. However, this is only partially true. It weakens the skinwalker by not only robbing them of their prey, but it doesn't kill them. But what does actually kill them? Other skinwalkers. According to John, the woman did not die of a random sudden illness. She simply left town. He believes to go back to her local skinwalker community. However, the next day she was found, not far from her own Hogan, dead and mauled by a pack of animals, wolf bites, bear claw marks, and even evidence of being trampled by a horse were found on her body. When the authorities found the body, a local medicine man, whom John actually knew, instructed the police to say that she died of an illness. He wanted people to remain unaware that a community of skinwalkers was in their midst, so no curious, stupid folks would go looking for them. And that's part two. I'll post part three tomorrow. Third part will go into detail on why Sam left the reservation. So again, full disclaimer, I cannot verify any of these stories. Believe what you can, or take it all with a grain of salt. So if skinwalkers are, say for a select few, an isolated group, how do they add more to their ranks? They used to be easier to join, like if you were a medicine man and knew how to find them, and had completed the first ritual on your own. They will let you go through the rituals and train you. You have to complete the first ritual before even looking for the skinwalkers. That way they know that you reached the point of no return. John said that he didn't know the actual rituals, but he assumed it was the part where you kill a close friend or family member. So you couldn't really go back to your regular way of living. And so you robbed yourself of your humanity too. It's how they know that you're real. Otherwise, they just kill you on the spot. John told Sam he had no idea how skinwalkers were recruited. 
the most likely scenario would most likely be kidnapping someone very young and grooming them to murder the family they were taken from or choosing to share their knowledge with people that the demons have scouted out as a spirit and potential addition to their ranks. It should be noted that according to John, pretenders almost never became real skinwalkers. No info on why. Sam and I guess that they most likely want the pretenders to do their thing and continue to exist to throw folks off their trail. Finally, John had one last piece of information to share. Yes, these skinwalkers actually did transform into animals and it was often to varying degrees of success. The more skilled skinwalkers could mimic an animal perfectly to the point where you wouldn't be able to pick them out among a pack. But the issue is, a normal old coyote or sheep isn't scary if it looks and behaves exactly as it should. So skinwalkers on purpose transform into imperfect or unnatural creatures. Things such as larger size, weird proportions, even human features mixed in. One story that stood out to me in regards to the way skinwalkers present, mainly because it had to do with the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. My personal least favorite skinwalker story because it sounds so ridiculous and is barely even about actual skinwalkers. Okay, so first of all, let me say I think Skinwalker Ranch is mostly bullshit. John's heard the stories and says it's white people crap. People say it's land is cursed by Denye because it was stolen from us and they think we got a skinwalker on it. But we know that's not possible because they exist separate to the Denye and we can't summon them. But there was a skinwalker on the land. Several, most likely. A tribe of skinwalkers that just refused to leave. So people said it was a Denye curse. But most of the crazy UFO shit just doesn't track with me or John. Maybe some of it because Denya have seen shit, but I don't know, a lot of it sounds bunk. But anyways, the reason I bring up Skinwalker Ranch is because one of the stories from the white people who live there was that they saw this big ass wolf, like bigger than any wolf in existence, the size of a horse maybe. This was actually true. I'm sure of it at least. They most likely added the UFO stuff for fun because just saying you saw a big wolf isn't a crazy enough story. But this wolf is an example of how they'll become a real animal. But they'll add some detail that doesn't add up or doesn't look right and actually makes it 10 times scarier. And sometimes the transformations aren't perfect anyways and they keep it that way instead of trying to perfect it. There was this other story I heard online, most likely about a guy who saw a giant Doberman looking thing with yellow eyes, but looked like it had bits of flesh hanging off, almost like a zombie dog. I don't know how true the story is, but it does point out this characteristic. What happens when a skinwalker absorbs the skin of the animal they kill, but it's not a perfect animal, or the skin has started to decompose before they absorb it? But it looks scary as fuck so they don't mind. I bet some of them even wait for the flesh to rot before it's absorbed. What Sam is talking about here is how they transform. Basically, they can only transform into animals they kill themselves. They must skin the animal and cover themselves in the pelt, often while it is still warm and bloody. After a certain period of time, the animal skin will be absorbed by the skinwalker. And not only will they gain the ability to transform into the animal at will, but some of the features of the beast will begin to show in the skinwalker's human form. This is how many older skinwalkers, as they age, begin to gradually lose human features, only to be replaced with more animal ones. Their human skin ages, even decays, while their animal skin does not remaining in the same state it was when they absorbed it. This is where the stench of decay that many associate with skinwalkers comes from. It's the human being, rotting. John began noticing that the fire was dying down, 
and it was getting late. He told Sam that he is not to speak a word of what he was told while on the reservation. The only way in which their speech was protected from the prying demons was the mixture in the fireplace and the blessings that John had performed earlier in the day. The loud TV was there just in case anyone, human or skinwalker, was in the area and walked by to listen. He gave Sam a small wooden box filled with the same mixture he threw on the fire, as well as a few other various things that John said would protect him. He told Sam not to take his possessions of these things as some sort of free ticket to talk freely about skinwalkers. However, he said something about how he had many decades of experience in these matters and felt safe. Plus, he was going to die soon, so if a skinwalker took him out of his misery, so be it. Sam didn't have that luck, so he needed to walk on the side of caution. Off the res, he was free to blab all he wanted about the shapeshifters, because as Sam said, who the fuck would believe me anyways? The next day, as Sam was getting ready to pack up and leave school, he received a call from John. Shouldn't have told you that stuff, he said, and then told him not to come by the property for a few days. He assured Sam that he had everything taken care of and was safe, but wanted to be sure. He hung up before Sam could even get a word in. He let Jess know what her great uncle had said over the phone, and naturally, Jess had to know what it was John told him about. Sam, hesitating, told her point blank that John had given him more info on the skinwalkers. He did not go into any level of detail on what it was John said, out of respect for the old man's wishes. Jess, according to Sam, went pale. It's so weird seeing your partner who you know is a big skeptic get scared by something like this. But I guess it just goes back to being raised Denya, hearing these stories and stuff. Also, just because you're agnostic doesn't mean you just don't have some belief in the paranormal. She told me that John most likely attracted someone's attention by talking about that shit. But that we have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And then she told me I can't speak a single word of what I heard. And I am never to ask or even allow John to tell me anything anymore. She said something like words have power. You're not culturally then yet, so you wouldn't get it. She laid into me a bit after that. I was kind of insulted, but in retrospect, she was right. It hurts to hear, but I think we all gotta take a step back. But Jess, alarmed as she was, put her trust in John and told Sam that they weren't to contact or visit his property until he said everything was okay. But that day never came. Two nights later, Sam and Jess were awoken by a phone call from Jess's father. John was in the hospital. His body was taking a turn for the worse. The two rushed to the hospital, but John had passed away of a heart attack before they got there. For a while after John's passing, Sam, Jess, and their families lived in a pretty uneventful life. Sam thinks it was a period of about three or four months of relative calm. Jess had started looking into getting an MSW out of state, and Sam was grappling with a decision of whether or not he wanted to stay on the res or follow Jess wherever she would go. I asked Sam if there was any tension between him and Jess because of everything that happened, but he said they both sort of dropped the entire argument about Sam messing with Skinwalker knowledge. He does not think that Jess attributes what happened to John as a result of bringing Skinwalker attention onto him. After these three to four months of calm were up, strange things began happening to Jess's family members. Her father mother and younger brother all complained of a group of coyotes that ran around their property keeping them up several nights a week with their noises and scratching on the side of the house her father had taken to standing on the porch with a shotgun some nights but he never saw anything her cousin complained about missing livestock they would completely disappear 
but every once in a while, the corpse of a cow would be found a few yards from the property. Sometimes it was a cow that was missing days earlier and looked only freshly slaughtered. Then one night, Sam was staying over at Jess's house. While they were having dinner, Sam noticed it had gotten quiet outside. He told me it was windy outside. When all of a sudden, the wind could not be heard. And that's when he actually heard something tapping on the window. Jess pointed at the window behind Sam. When he turned around to look, he caught a glimpse of a figure for only a split second before it vanished. But he could hear it walking away from the window as the thing was very close to the house. The two were frozen in fear for a few seconds before the sound of the wind returned. They drew the blinds. Sam said they barely slept that night. Jess told him that she saw a large wolf with glowing yellow eyes looking into their window. She said it was a weird looking wolf and that it was smiling, almost like how a man smiles. There was a row of yellow teeth that looked strange like human teeth. Jess found herself in the coming days bothered by this. She told Sam it reminded her all too well of the two beings she saw all those years ago. They had someone come by the property to bless it, and that was that for everything that transpired at Jess's home. A few weeks after the incident, Sam was awoken by a series of noises. The noises, he said, started far away, but were loud enough to wake him up. He said they grew in volume as they grew closer. He estimated that there were about a minute or so in between. Each noise was getting closer. From far away, they sounded like your typical wolf or dog, but as they got closer, they sounded more bizarre. As he said it, it's really hard to say exactly why these noises were so scary. Like, I was shivering in fear. Wave after wave and after wave of chills, dude. My eyes were watering. I felt like I was having a panic episode. They didn't sound like any animals I knew. It started like a wolf howl, but then made weird gurgly noises that went on for a few more seconds after. The noises were really loud at the front end, violent, like they were a warning. Suddenly, Sam heard a noise from inside his own home. He tells me he grabbed his pistol from his closet and burst through his bedroom door only to see an empty house with the front and back doors wide open, swaying in the wind. Looking out the back door, he said he saw two wolves running away in the moonlight, but their gait was off, as though they had the wrong set of hind legs. The next day, Sam dialed the medicine man who blessed Jess's place. He was an old friend of John's. When he came by, he first listened to Sam's story and then inspected the home. The medicine man, in a sort of roundabout way, told him it was indeed a Yinadroshi and that he had caught the attention of something very old, very powerful, and very evil. In fact, the medicine man had never heard of any being of the sort to actually enter another person's dwelling place. That fact alone terrified the man, enough to where he said, I don't know what my blessing will do. Best case scenario, it'll keep it off your property. It won't keep it off you. Worst case scenario, it'll make it mad. I thought, shit, well, it was worth it just to try for the possibility of it working, I guess. How fucked up is all this? Sam also showed the man the box of items that John had given him to see if they held any significance. The man frowned, saying he didn't wish to speak ill of the dead, but John had made a small error in giving Sam what he thought were things that would protect him. The man went to his truck and came back with another item. Sam won't tell me what the items were. This is out of respect for the Dinya traditions. He also says that he didn't even know what half of the stuff was. 
So the medicine man told Sam to put that with the other things, but that it was no guarantee. He said there was no one-size-fits-all solution to warding off dark witches. Witches, which by the way, is how he refers to skinwalkers. So witches are superstitious, but some more than others. Some of them have learned that certain practices don't do anything, so they just laugh those off while some others find it actually disrespectful. Finally, he performed a blessing. He told Sam that if things don't improve, he may need to get help from someone else or multiple others. And then he gave him the info of some other medicine man whom he trusted. He closed out by saying that John was most likely the best person. He knew how to deal with these things in spite of the slip up with the items he gave Sam. That night, Sam said he was sleeping peacefully, which continued for about a week. Then one night, Sam woke up to use the bathroom. He didn't switch on any lights, but noticed two very strange things. For one, it was freezing. We live in the desert, but it's never been that cold at night, that time of year. And I didn't have the AC on because I'm not a diva like you. And also, it fucking reeked. His house smelled of rotting flesh. After using the bathroom, he went back to bed. And then had an incredibly vivid dream. Six tall, lanky, skinned men in animal pelts. Wearing skulls with bits of flesh. Still clinging to them. He remembers them clear as day. Two appear to be dressed as wolves, one as a sheep, one as a coyote, and another as a deer with broken antlers. They were standing around all glaring at him with striking yellow eyes. They barely moved. In the words of Sam, they looked like people who hadn't eaten in weeks, almost zero body fat or muscle, and one of them did not look well, the deer man. I'm talking about gray skin, infections, almost like a zombie. It was disgusting. Sam woke up in a cold sweat. He told me that in the dream, he was just standing there as their eyes bore into him. He actually knew he was dreaming while it was happening. His first and so far only instance of lucid dreaming. He told me of how desperate he wanted to wake up, but he couldn't. When he left his room, He saw five sets of footprints in dirt. There were no footprints leading to where they actually were. Just five sets of footprints. As though something had just appeared and disappeared in one spot out of thin air. There were also six men in his dream. But he never found the other set of footprints. Assuming that these prints belonged to the man in his dream. When he told the medicine man about this. He was rightfully baffled and terrified. He told Sam to call the others, but that he doubted the effectiveness of their practices in light of the information that he shared. He still offered a blessing, which Sam accepted. Sam did indeed make a few calls and told several other medicine men about what happened. They told him that something very dark had set its eyes on him and that he was to be very cautious. He basically lived with Jess until the semester ended, only going home to grab something every once in a while. Sam moved back to the Chicago area for a brief period before Jess started her first semester for her masters in another city where he joined her. That's around the time we met on a gig while he was working as a freelance photographer Whether he left or not because of the encounters and the dream, he's never really actually said. I know he was looking to live in a city with an arts community, but I do think the encounters were the straw that broke the camel's back. Sam says that he doesn't know if he wants to return to the res, but he still goes every now and then to see his dad. I'm sure the skinwalkers miss him. Greatly. I try to live my life without too many regrets. 
I had highs and lows like everyone else in life, sure. But I do what I can to not worry too much about what could have happened if I made a different choice. If I maybe hadn't taken the road less traveled. Everyone makes the best decisions they can with the information they have available to them at the time. Going through all the what ifs is crazy because the only way you would have made a different choice is if you had some other detail, which of course you didn't. You can never be exactly sure what the sequence of events might have looked like if you gone right instead of left. And yet, there is one choice I made, one road that I took, that I just can't help but wonder how things might have turned out if I had only done something different. My job has me move around pretty often. I'm not going to get into what I do. That has no bearing on the story. But a couple of years ago, I was working in Philadelphia and living on the other side of the Delaware River in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm originally from northwestern Pennsylvania, and this was the closest I had been to home since I moved out of college. So I took the chance to go see my parents whenever I could. I knew I would be moving again before long, and my folks aren't getting any younger. So I try to find a weekend every month or so to make the seven hour trip to visit them. If I had been thinking about it when I was looking for places to rent, Maybe I would have tried to live on the west side of Philadelphia instead of this side in Jersey to avoid the rush hour. But by the time I realized, the lease was signed and there wasn't much I could do. The drive to my hometown was pretty boring. I would take the Ben Franklin Bridge across the river, head up I-476 for an hour or so, then a long slog across basically the entire expanse of Pennsylvania on I-80 before another hour north of I-79. The only thing about the drive was how long it would take me to get through Philly. Because once I got on the 476 extension, I could predict my ETA within five or 10 minutes. My second summer in Jersey, I had taken two weeks off and planned on spending the second week back home. Things changed that first Wednesday though, because a big storm came by and knocked out power in a good part of the area where I was living. Dealing with 90 degree heat with no AC wasn't something I felt like spending the first half of my vacay doing. So after one uncomfortable sweaty night, I let my parents know that I was heading over a few days earlier. I should have left first thing in the morning, but because I had a couple of things to take care of before heading out, by the time I finally got on the road that Thursday, it was past lunchtime and getting on mid-afternoon. For whatever reason, the traffic in Philly was heavy, and by the time I finally got through town, I was a good hour behind schedule. Still, based on my timeline, I figure I'd still be able to make it early enough to grab a dinner and beer with my dad and brother before cashing in for the night. There were two things I hadn't taken into consideration. One was the number of other folks that, apparently, had the same idea to get out of town that I did and that the road construction must have sprung up in the time since my last trip home. The interstate highway system is a heck of a thing. Being able to zip along at 6570 or in some remote places like West Texas even faster than that makes cross country travel take a fraction of the hours it would otherwise. I can tell you the number of times my folks always talk about the days before the interstate when going to see friends outside of DC would take almost twice as long as it does now. What's truly remarkable to me though is that even though the entire system of highways was built start to finish in a mere 35 years, it sure seems like when parts of it go under construction, they stay that way forever. Traffic was heavy, but moving, and I was making decent time until I saw the first orange warning signs letting me know that four lanes were reducing to three and then two and then one there were hundreds of cones stretched down the road as far as the eye could see and see i could as the cars in front of me reached a complete and total standstill it was one of the worst deadlocks i had ever been in seriously 
I think I moved about a mile in about an hour. After about three hours, my stomach started grumbling. With an exit just ahead and no end to the traffic jam in sight, I got off and found a diner to grab some dinner. Even if traffic picked up, I still had a solid five hours of driving ahead of me. So at that point, I knew for sure it was going to be pretty late that I was getting in. After finishing eating, I got back on the road. Things looked like they were picking up for a couple of miles. But then, I came up to the back end of a jam and was right back to waiting. We were moving a little bit better. I think averaging about 5 miles an hour at this point. But as the sun started edging towards the horizon, I pulled out my phone and started to see if Google could point me in any kind of workaround. It's a funny thing about human nature. Most of us don't like to sit still. Studies at airports show that people would rather walk further to baggage claim to get their luggage, even if the total time would have been less if they had a slightly longer wait at plane side. Well, the power of the internet appeared to be in my favor. Even though I-80 still showed the dark red band for another 50 miles or so, there was a southbound country road coming up a few miles and a northbound a couple after that. Both of these roads looked like they let me bypass the worst of the traffic. Since I spent the better part of the day sitting on the road, my patience was about worn out, and I opted to take the southbound road. Even though the app told me it would take about 30 minutes longer to get to my parents' house, I just wanted to get moving again, and reasoned that at this rate, it might take me more than a 35 minute difference to get to the northbound, and that is a choice that I will remember until the day I die. I made the turn off and felt my mood improve. The signs changed limiting my speed between 35 and 40 miles an hour. But even that seemed like flying compared to the log jam I spent the last several hours in. The drive was interesting. The road was starting to get a little twisty with plenty of changes as it curved up and around the hills of central Pennsylvania. It took me on a general southwest road, but turned and doubled back on itself enough that for the first 30 minutes or so, I had views of the stalled traffic on I-80. Pretty soon after that though, just about the time that the sun was just dipping down beneath a couple of hills in my rear view mirror, the road took a long curve and carried me down and away out of sight of the interstate. Now, something that a lot of people don't know is how big of a state Pennsylvania is. There are plenty of bigger ones, but Pennsylvania is really big and it's also remote, isolated. The translation of the name means Penn's Woods. After all, the Blair Witch Project didn't have to embellish that aspect of the state. The fact that you could head into the woods and walk for dozens of miles in any way without seeing anything like another human being it was pretty creepy. It's got a decent number of big cities, Pittsburgh and Philly, both have enough of a population to support major sports teams, but away from those centers of development, there's a whole lot of nothing and trees and dark and lonely roads. Such was the road I was traveling that night Winding through the twists and turns of the Appalachian foothills, I moved around a lot. I mentioned I traveled through most of the states anyways. I sometimes used to wonder when I would be driving along a patch of asphalt surrounded by only untamed wilderness, what it must have been like to build such a road. What was it like before man had intruded with our civilization and our machines? What used to live there? But... I don't wonder anymore, not ever since that night when I made a left instead of right. The road continued to twist back and forth, up and down. As I went deeper into the foothills, the trees grew thicker, branches from either side of the road reaching over and almost touching, forming a natural canopy 20 feet up that blocked out much of my view of the sky and the stars above. I drove with my high beams on because the idea of streetlights had never entered the minds of whoever built this road. 
The painted lines were old and not well cared for. I never been a good navigator. My parents used to say it was because when I was a kid, my nose was always pushed into a book during car rides. But I think it's because I'm just bad at it. So it was that. There was no way possible I could be lost as there were no other roads that I could have possibly turned onto and gotten off track. I also found myself more frequently checking my phone to ensure I was still on the right path, which is how I almost ran into the other car. My mind was wondering, thinking about the fact that my signal bars had dropped and remained at zero for the last 20 minutes and what possible implications that would mean if I came across some kind of emergency. I raced my eyes back to the road after Google Maps confirmed for the 20th time that I was still on the right path. That's when my brain took a beat to process that I was approaching a vehicle stopped in the middle of the lane. I slammed my foot on the brake. I stopped in time, but not by much. With maybe five feet separating my hood from the other car's rear bumper, my heart was pounding in my chest as adrenaline coursed through my body, but my fear quickly gave way to anger. Seriously, what the hell was this guy doing? Not only was he stopped in the middle of the road, but all his lights were off. If I didn't have my high beams on, there was a good chance I wouldn't have seen him, even if I wasn't checking my phone. I could feel my heart beating in the vein on the side of my neck. I'm not somebody who struggles with road rage, and after a couple of quick seconds, I managed to get a hold of myself, not wanting to outright alarm anyone that might still be in the vehicle. I shifted into reverse and backed up about 20 feet, popping my emergency lights on. That's when I started noticing a few strange things about the stopped vehicle, more than just the fact that the lights were out. Of course. It was stopped in the middle of the road, but that wasn't unreasonable since there wasn't any shoulder that the driver could have moved on to. The strange thing though, was that the doors were open, those on the driver's side crossing over slightly onto the other lane. And even more was that I saw that an item was dropped out onto the road by the rear driver's side door, something that appeared to be a child stuffed animal. I considered my options and after a few seconds decided that I would have to go against my better judgment to just keep on my merry way and head outside to get a better idea of what was going on. I said earlier my job doesn't have anything to do with the story which is mostly true but before you judge my choices it bears mentioning that I spent some time in the military an obligation to help people has been drilled into me over the years and I've seen enough things while deployed to feel I could handle myself. And so I got out of my car but kept it running. I popped the trunk to grab the flashlight I keep there and left my headlights on so I could see what I was doing. I looked up and down the road hoping to see signs of other cars approaching but no luck. I called up to the other car as I cautiously started my approach, circling around to the left, to the middle of the road so I'll be able to get a look inside before I got too close. Anyone, Anyone there? there? No answer. My headlights were helping, but there were enough shadows to still hide the car's interior. Shining my flashlight though, easily determined that no one was inside. I moved closer stopping down by the rear door to pick up the falling object off the ground. It was a child's toy, just like I thought. A stuffed rabbit, with patches showing signs of frequent love. I frowned, if the folks traveling in the car had hitched the ride with somebody passing by, they would have taken the rabbit, or the kid would have been throwing a fit. I shut the rear door and moved up to the front. I put my hand on the hood and found it was still warm to the touch. That means it couldn't have been here too long. I slid into the driver's seat to try and figure out if there was some kind of mechanical issue that would have forced the car to stop and was startled 
to find a set of keys still dangling from the ignition. Pressing the brake, I turned the key and the engine started right up. Headlights and the interior light in the roof spring into life. Fuel, oil, temperature, battery, all the gauges look good. Not even a check engine light. Strange. Very strange. Then I saw the purse in the passenger seat. I picked it up. A normal brown shoulder bag. And briefly rummaged around before finding a wallet inside. Everything appeared to be intact. About $40 in cash. A couple credit cards. Gym membership. Sam's club card. The driver's license named the owner as Mary Walker. A pretty blonde that had just turned 30 the month before. There were a few pictures showing Mary in stage poses, sitting on a blanket under a tree. A huge, bearded lumberjack of a man hugged her from behind. A small ponytail girl with a goofy over-exaggerated smile on her lap. That's when I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. A shiver running down to the base of my spine. Something was very wrong with this situation. I put everything back in the purse and returned it to the seat. I turned off the car and got out, shutting the driver's door behind me. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and dialed 911, holding it over my head to try to get a connection with no luck. Cursing softly, I jammed the red end call button and moved around to the passenger side of the car. I played my flashlight around and noticed that some of the foliage at the edge of the road was bent and trampled like someone had walked through it. I didn't have enough woodcraft to be able to judge how long ago they might have passed. But even then, I couldn't imagine any scenario for why they would have gone wandering away. Shining my light into the woods, the beam only extended maybe 30 feet through the trees before being effectively swallowed by the greedy blackness. Looking at all the flat grass, at the stuffed rabbit in my hand, then at the dark trees crowding maliciously, my thoughts came back and forth between what I should do. I made up my mind. I had been trained to help people. It was hardwired into my system. There was a child somewhere in the woods. I raised my foot to take a step onto the path, and that's when a white flicker of movement entered the very edge of my flashlight beam. It was Mary Walker. She was naked and walking stiffly, unnaturally, her arms swaying out of sync with the rest of her body, like a puppet being manipulated by somebody who's not an experienced puppeteer. Hello? Her voice called out. Anyone there? That's when more shapes came into view behind her, shambling along. Here, the bearded man who must have been Mary's husband. Then, their little girl, owner of the well-loved rabbit, both moving as strange as their wife and mother. And now, I could tell there were more, many more. Their forms, out of the direct light. But so many they caused the darkness to pitch and swell with their strange, staggering passage. Their voices a chorus. Hello? Hello? They called. Anyone there? Echoing back the questions I was asking only a few short minutes ago when I approached the abandoned car. I took a stumbling step back, away from the woods and the approaching figures. I ended up tripping onto the walker's car, but at that moment, I shone my light up into the pitch recess of the branches, and in doing so, I could just make out, barely, a sort of darkness figure that was crouched, hidden in the upper limits, a void even darker than the trees. Was it my imagination? Those lines of pure blackness that extended from that concealed mass that seemed to pierce the flesh of Mary Walker and her kin and the countless other shapes moving in sync with them. That's when I sprinted 
Back to my vehicle. Engine still running. Hello? I shifted to reverse, keeping enough of my head to avoid running off the road as I completed a three-point turn. Anyone there? I took a glance in my rearview mirror. The pale form of Mary Walker stood still just at the edge of the forest where the trees met the road. One hand was raised, signaling me to return, or perhaps waving goodbye. Her face was a mask of confused sadness. I pressed the gas and drove back the way I came. I didn't look back again. The rest of the trip was a fog. At some point after I made it back to the interstate, I called my parents. I let them know that I wouldn't be getting in until late. I drove on autopilot, the traffic jam having cleared while I was off. I thought about calling 911, but I didn't. What would I tell them, and to what end? There was no one left to be helped. I try not to go through life with too many regrets, wondering about what if, but this one, this choice. What if I had left earlier in the day? What if I hadn't stopped for dinner? Maybe I would have still gone left. Maybe I would have been there in time to help the walkers. Maybe I would have been taken by that black thing that was fishing in the darkness. What if I had gone right? Would I still be ignorant going through life, unknowing that there are these things out there? I try not to think of it too often, but every now and then, all these thoughts turn to the stuffed rabbit. It wasn't until I reached my parents' house that night that I realized I still had that rabbit clutched in my hand. I used to wonder before men brought our roads and civilization. What was the wilderness like? What lived there? But I don't think about these things no more. I can't afford to. At least, if I don't want to wake up screaming. There are things out there in the woods, in the darkness, in places that humans still have not ventured out to. So be careful when you're out traveling, going into these country roads, and that no matter how bad the traffic is, always stick to the interstate. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington. Not like an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night, I wake up and hear something. I open my tent, and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been right outside my tent. Nothing strange about the guy, just a normal looking dude sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No backpack or anything with him. Just a guy. He saw me open the tent. And his eyes got big. Like he had just seen a ghost. And he took off. It shook me up pretty badly. But over the next day. I was able to put it out of my mind. After writing it off as just some strange occurrence. And a guy that was maybe high or something. And had somehow managed. To set up a camp not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away in a totally different direction, that nobody could take the same path as on accident. I was sitting by the fire that night, and I started to hear noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness someone was like, Yo, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no, I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, aimed that, that way, and sounded kind of scared and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person. I pointed the flashlight somewhere else. After like 15 minutes of being freaked out and this person just talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer. So I ended up shining my light that way again. And it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. 
He must have followed me about 15 miles over two days because there is no way he could have ended up in the same spot as me. As big as that wilderness is, no possible way. As soon as I shined my light on him, he took off again. I started to chase him but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark. So I stopped quickly after about 100-200 feet. This one couldn't be ridden off because the only way he could have been in both places is if he was following me. I decided that the trip was over first thing in the morning and ended up hiking back out over three days, always doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail and sometimes hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid ending up being killed. On the first night of hiking out, twice, I heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside my tent. But by the time I got the courage to look out, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but I slowly decided that it sounded more like a human making animal calls. But it also could have been an actual animal. But I didn't actually see the guy again, but it really sounded like a person making noises. I basically cried when I finally got back to my vehicle. The relief was so strong. To this day, this was the most terrifying experience I ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were, but I just can't really articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. The whole situation was pretty intense especially given that it went on for a few days. Like imagine the feeling of noticing that there is someone following you in a dark alley, then stretch this out into three days and make it to where you have to sleep in the alley. And that's exactly what this experience was like. The feeling wasn't of being scared, but it was this constant knot in my stomach that someone out there was hunting me for three days. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage. Joe lived on a farm that was next to a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we would stay in the woods all weekend. We would only come out for school. We would be out there building shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out into the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we would find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we would likely be trespassing. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. At night, we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was the best. In fact, it was so fun we did it a bunch of times and never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own separate ways. We both ended up leaving home, but we always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we would see each other often. Well, one summer, in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day and at night, we would catch drinks at the bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the good old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our Stand By Me trips, remembering these moments and drinking beer are a hell of a mix. Soon, 
we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. When the day finally came, we started early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot, where we used to always start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe said that instead of walking the usual way, we should take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, so I gave a what the hell, and off we went. The day went fine, it was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked the joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and more stuff. Before the night arrived, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forest area, trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We also brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the area. Now, this is also something we used to do in the old days as well. We would walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and we also went up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we would be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom. About a hundred yards into the woods, it was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were standing, everything was quiet. No movement, nothing could be seen, no lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of rot. A cross still stood on top of the place. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors. Just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. And there were rows. And a section up in the front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints. No roads. It was an abandoned church. We quickly left and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods. Besides at this point, it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on early morning. When the night came, we were laying down, and we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What the fuck is that? It sounds like people singing, and it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree. It was near pitch black, and we didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't even speak. When we got to the top, we saw a light in the distance. It was coming from the church and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a conversation that boiled down to this. Can you believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered. And even though we tried, 
we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in a different language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was there, but we only saw shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had a lot of space between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't even understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained crying that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then, it finally stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, Let's, Let's get, get the, the fuck, fuck out of here, man. When Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, They're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well. But what we could see was the line of figures walking out the doorway all holding hands in a single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move towards us and the hill. That's when we booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our shit, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving weird, like whoever was holding them was also shaking them. We continued to run and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down and we walked there, got to a 24 hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and all her other friends just thought it was kids messing around. But I heard those voices, and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that has ever happened out in the woods. This story was told to me by one of my good friends who has Navajo background on her father's side. It happened several years ago when she was spending the last two weeks of summer visiting relatives on a reservation in New Mexico and is by far one of the creepiest things I ever heard. My friend Jessie was 12 at the time and playing outside with her cousins. They were tossing a frisbee around and one of the younger kids threw it too hard. It flew over the fence and was swallowed up by a small grove of oak trees. Jessie, being the eldest, went to retrieve it, leaving her 11-year-old cousin Ellie in charge until she got back. The sun was setting, lighting up the sky in brilliant shades of orange as Jessie made her way over to the grove. After some poking around, she found the frisbee caught in one of the tree's branches. As she climbed, she began to sing an old Navajo song, but stopped singing when her body suddenly went cold. That's exactly how Jessie described it to me. Cold, as if she'd been dunked in ice water. You know that annoying scary story cliche of feeling like you're being watched? Well, it's only cliche because it's true. Jessie could feel a pair of eyes following her, even when she looked around her and saw nothing. Seriously creeped out, she grabbed the frisbee and ran back to her grandmother's house, just in time to see the old woman step into the porch and call for the kids to come inside. However, the true horror didn't start until several hours later. Jessie, her cousin Ellie, and Ellie's little sister Clara 
were asleep in their grandmother's guest room when Jessie woke up to the strangest sound she had ever heard. She described it to me as a cross between radio static and the noise an old movie reel makes. At first, it sounded distant, but after a minute or two, Jessie realized it was getting closer. Beside her, Ellie rode over and said, What is that? I don't know, Jessie whispered. They waited, holding their collective breath. By now, the sound was right outside the window. And that's when Jessie realized it was singing. At this point in her retelling of the story, Jessie went white and began glancing over her shoulder. She told me the song was the exact same one she had been singing in the tree grove earlier. It sounded so wrong, she said, rubbing her arms as if a cold breeze had rushed by her. Remember, when we listened to that clip of the very first recording of a human voice, how weird it sounded? When I nodded, Jessie added, it was like that, but a little clearer. Somehow, that made it even worse. Jessie and Ellie were both terrified, while Clara, unaware, slept on. Through the thin blue curtain over the window, they could see the dark shadow of something peering in at them. To this day, Jessie can't explain what motivated her to get up and see for herself, especially because she was scared shitless. Ignoring Ellie's protest, she slid out of bed and walked across the room on shaky legs. As soon as she drew back the curtain, she regretted her choice. Staring back at her was the most terrifying creature she had ever seen. It had the head of a deer with antlers like dead tree branches and eyes so black they seemed to absorb the faint silver moonlight. It had a scrawny humanoid body with abnormally long arms and legs. And as Jessie stood there, caught in its hideous gaze, it raised a hand and scratched at the window with a horrible screeching sound that made Jessie's skin crawl. It was Ellie's scream that jolted Jessie out of her terrified state. She stumbled back from the window and landed on the carpet floor. Clara woke up and began screaming too. Then their grandmother ran in and turned on the light. The thing at the window had vanished, leaving behind three long scratches in the glass and the whole family terrified. Jessie's grandmother was able to calm down the hysterical children enough so they could tell her what happened. As she listened, her face became pale. She hustled the girls downstairs to the living room and made up a bed for them on the couch. She then sat by them all night and whenever one of them asked her what was going on, the old woman simply shook her head. Needless to say, Jessie and her cousin didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, Jessie's grandmother announced that everyone was to stay inside that day. No arguments. She looked so shaken that nobody dared to protest. Around noon, she called for a medicine woman to come and bless the house. Later, after the woman left, Jessie merged into the kitchen where her grandmother was loading the dishwasher. Tell me what that thing was, she said bluntly. Her grandmother sighed and motioned for Jessie to sit down. You have heard the legend of skinwalkers. Yes. Jessie frowned and nodded, vaguely recalling the story. So that was a skinwalker? Her grandmother nodded. Yes. Grandma, said Jessie at a light dawn. I think it overheard me singing in the tree grove yesterday. Her grandmother's dark eyes narrowed. Why do you say that? Because it was singing that same song, you know. The song that you used to sing to me when I was little. Her grandmother was silent for a long time before whispering. You're a very lucky person. But luck has its limits. From now on, you must be more careful. The look in the old woman's eyes as she spoke those words still haunts Jessie to this day. As I said earlier, that was years ago, seven to be specific. Jessie has returned to the res 
many times, actually, each without incident. But she has never set foot in that tree grove again, and most likely, never will. Jessie's grandmother died this past March, at the age of 87, and Jessie later moved in with her auntie for the summer, so she could help clean up the old house, which the family was going to rent out. She had been there for about a week when I went down there to visit her. On my first night, we sat on the porch and drank some beers, and I found my eyes drifting towards the tree grove. So that's where it all happened? Jesse shuddered and nodded. Yeah, tomorrow, I'm taking you to the medicine woman and have her bless you. Is that actually necessary? The look Jesse gave me nearly turned me to stone. You think nothing will happen to you because you're white. But when you're in Navajo land, you're in Skinwalker land. Take caution. I nodded. That night, I swore I heard radio static outside the house. When I brought it up to Jessie the next morning, she didn't speak, but grabbed my arm and practically dragged me to the medicine woman, where I was blessed. Nothing happened for the rest of the trip and I went back to the city. I didn't post this here with the intention of teaching a moral, but I suppose if there is something to be learned from the story of the singing skinwalker, it's that there are things out there we can't explain. The look in Jessie's eyes when she recounted her experience and told me everything I need to know, what she saw, truly horrified her. And all I can say is, I'm grateful I didn't have to go through it myself. After what happened to me all those years ago, the one place in the whole world that still rattles my body and sends chills up my spine happens to be my grandmother's farm. When my parents and I would go visit my grandma's one-story farm every three years, I was put in the same room. The room and all its velvet blankets and puffy pillows had a cozy vibe to it, along with the rest of the house. But at night time, the large window in front of the bed painted a picture of the unsettling wilderness outside, which wouldn't help with my imagination. And ever since I was six, my brain terrified me with that imagination using vivid nightmares sleep paralysis, and everything else in between. So naturally, my fear of the window was always there. You see, most kids have monsters underneath their beds or in their closets. But at my grandma's house, there was something that lurked outside that window. The first time I ever saw it was at two in the morning. The creature, which I assumed was just in my head and I was imagining, was at the edge of the woods staring at the window. It was a goat standing on two legs. Its body had the shape of a human and its claws dangling around its thighs. I slammed my eyes shut and covered myself with my soft blanket, waiting for the thing to evaporate from my imagination. As you can guess, I was tired by the time I woke up. That morning, when my parents were at the town's Walmart and I was trying to forget last night's experience, I had a pleasant conversation with grandma. We loved to talk and we had a special type of chemistry that transcended our generational differences. Curious about her farm, I wanted to know about all her animals. Well, we have all sorts of animals, she said with a grin. I have chickens, peacocks, sheep, Hogs, ducks, horses, ponies. I have just about any animal on this farm besides any kind of goat. You said any goat? I said, recalling the form outside my window. Why don't you like any goats? Can't you milk them and make cheese? Grandma's face darkened and she stroked her fingers through her gray hair as her eyes stared into space. Well... According to some people, after God created sheep, the devil, in an effort to desecrate God's sheep, 
created different kinds of goats. Angry after the devil disgraced his sheep, created a wolf to eat the goats. In a massive tantrum of rage, the devil bit the tails of the goats, marking them as an unholy animal. Then, with a quizzical and hard to decipher face, she said, I thought you would have seen it by now, haven't you? I knew what she was talking about right away, and it seemed I would burst into a fit of scared shrieking and crying at the thought of my grandmother confirming the thing outside my window was actually real. I tried to rationalize the situation, thinking the goat-like creature was just a dream, and that what my grandma said was unrelated. But at the sight of my distress, my grandmother destroyed that idea with the opening of her mouth. It won't hurt you if you stay inside at night. So there's nothing to worry about. It was supposed to be a comforting statement. But her actually confirming this made it worse. Grandma pretended to forget the conversation, never speaking of it for the rest of the trip. When the night came, I decided to sleep in my parents' bedroom, where the bed faced away from the window, but I swear I heard a glassy tapping from behind me. Lucky for us, my parents and I left the farm the next day, leaving behind the forest and fields of Maryland. But three years after this initial incident, after blocking the creature from my memory, I saw it a second time at 11 o'clock at night. I was half asleep on grandma's couch to the sound of the TV when a reporter shouting, breaking news. My eyes initially darting around the room and my brain adjusting to consciousness. I was in shock as I saw the creature hunched over in front of the living room window. The half goat sprang from the window and ran into the distance on its two legs. I slapped myself. Snap out of it, snap out of it, but nothing could stop the memories of the creature. And what grandma had said about it, I paced around the room with adrenaline flooding my body, wanting to flee, but not knowing where to go. With a few sleeping pills, however, I willed myself to sleep with the living room curtains drawn. The morning after, I found a note on the kitchen table. My parents were shopping and grandma was at a doctor's appointment. I was alone in the house, and me wanting to find out what was going on, I plugged in my grandmother's outdated Macintosh for a bit of research. Half goat, half man, I typed, which brought up a Wikipedia page on different kinds of cryptids. Not exactly what I was looking for. Goat creature in Maryland, I corrected. And as soon as I hit search, Google presented me with another Wikipedia page. This one on a creature known as the Goatman of Maryland. This was exactly what I was looking for. The Goatman of Maryland is a legendary half goat, half human creature that has the head and the hind of a goat and the body of a human. The rest of the page went on to explain how the locals suspect the Goatman is either a failed gene-mixing science experiment or a demonic spawn of the devil, as Grandma had said. For the rest of the week, I saw it every single night. Whenever I was trying to fall asleep in my room, it would be staggering around the clearing outside my window. If I was watching TV late at night, the goat man would be gazing at the screen from the living room window. And on the last day, when I was feeding grandma's peacocks in the evening, she came to bring me inside after she saw it approaching the farm. By the end of the second visit, seeing the goat man was something normal. And with the occasional reminder from grandma, I respected it and its personal space. Three years later, however, my third visit to Grandma's ranch showed me what happened when you didn't honor the Goatman's boundaries. 
on the local news. There was one headline stirring up the rustic community. Ten professional boar hunters killed in animal attack. My parents thought it was horrible, but grandma and I shot each other looks of shared knowledge. The next morning, the paper arrived at the farm where the hunting tragedy made the front page. The night before, police found 10 hunters mutilated to death by a wild animal. The hunters' AR-15 magazines were completely full upon dying and local authorities are stumped as to how none of them could have gotten a single shot off. My parents who had no knowledge of the goat man had no idea what caused the attack and were as ignorant as the rest of the investigators. So I had to ask grandma why my parents hadn't seen it yet. Well, she said, the creature only appears to those he finds interesting. You have to understand it can change its views on people. I have these scars from when I was a little girl, but after it got used to me, it stopped. My parents, who were your great-grandparents, were demoted to the low end of the thing's opinions. Their passing and my survival go-to show how unpredictable it can be. I was shaking, even more freaked out by that. The thing had attacked grandma when she was young, and it seemed like the goat man could change its opinion of me in the blink of an eye. It almost seemed like I had developed something with the creature during my last visit by seeing it all the time and watching TV with it. And not once did I ever go outside at night when it was in charge of the farm. I respected it. Could it really forget all that? Or was I reading into grandma's statements more than I should have? In the visits following that year, I read some news articles about mutilated hikers, missing campers, and farm animals turning up dead. The goat man was getting more aggressive. One time, the creature looked right into my soul with its black empty eyes. And for the first time since my initial viewing of it, my body gave to the most feared dread I had ever felt. The more violent the news stories became, the more I felt that the goat was getting more aggressive. Grandma even ended up buying more curtains for the house, acquired a better lock for the door, and actually went to a shooting range to learn how to use a shotgun. It came to the point where I was trying to make peace with the creature by leaving pig food in the field for it to eat, but instead, it snatched one of the hogs from the pig pen and ran into the woods. On the last day of the visit, I woke up to the sound of ear splitting banging on the front door. Grandma was gripping her new shotgun, and with my dad holding a baseball bat, they waited for the intruder to burst through the door. Yet the banging subsided after a few minutes, the chirping and croaking of insects and frogs replacing it within the hour. After that incident, we didn't visit the ranch for five years and I was nearing the end of my high school by then. My parents actually encouraged grandma to move out of the house in light of people in her town being discovered murder in their own homes. But being the stubborn grandma she was, she decided to go against it. Besides, she thought she knew how fortified her farm was. A few weeks ago, we returned to that awful farm, finding barbed wire on the outskirts of the field. There were fewer animals now, and I swear some of the surviving pigs had faded scars on their bodies from scratches, stabs, and bites not even the most vicious bear could manage. I was more jittery than I ever been in my life, and it was all because I knew that goat man was scheming someone in the deep woods, sensing that I had arrived on its land. I spoke with grandma who showed me a newspaper talking about how the FBI was getting involved in the murder investigations here and that the criminal would be behind bar soon. However, as grandma told me, other farmers around town were speaking about how the FBI's true motive was to cover up the real culprit. When we were having dinner, 
I'll poke them my food, ignoring the discourse my family was having. Afterwards, I went to my room and made sure the door was shut before I hopped into bed and waited. After hours of anticipating, in the field, beyond my window, the monster dragged the bloody body of a peaceful doe into view. The goat man ripped the deer's intestines out and bit into the insides with its evil loving fangs spilling blood onto the moonlit ground. It turned its head to face my direction, hurling a piece of deer at the window. I jerked as blood splattered against the pane like a sheet of rain, startling me to full awareness. Me rushing from my bed to get a closer look at the field, I saw the goat man had left behind the body of a deer. It was mocking me, and I was sure of it. I settled back into bed with the blood sliding down the window, wrapping myself in my blanket as if it was armor, and getting ready for whatever might happen next. I have no idea how, but I drifted asleep with a piece of the creature's latest meal stuck to my window. That was when I had the worst nightmare any human mind could produce. It was a once in a lifetime dream of horror, where the creature had crept into my room and was slicing chunks of muscle from my limbs and carving blocks of flesh out, out of my torso with its claws, choking me with its horns. The pain was real, and I smelled the rotten stench of the creature's dirt matted fur. It was as if my mind was nagging at me and screaming at the top of its lungs for me to wake up. So I did. Soaked in sweat, I sent my eyes flying open, gasping like I was on the edge of dying. As I scrambled to see any sign of the goat man's presence outside, I panicked upon seeing several inconsistencies with how the room was when I went to sleep. Now, the door was wide open and something had smeared deer blood on the inside of the window and that's when the tapping reached my ears not from the window but from my bed frame two furry hands slumped over the frame claws dripping blood onto the sheets I froze the form getting to its feet and tilting its head as it examined me too weak to fight and too shocked to run I waited to die, but to my surprise, instead of slashing my belly, the goat man spoke. You be not ripe, it said before crouching on all fours and scurrying and walking out of the house. When the police arrived, they found the lifeless body of grandma who had died of a heart attack. After that, the FBI showed up, erasing all evidence of forced entry and the strange deer blood being inside the house. With me sobbing and my parents crying, Dad decided to get us a hotel, and I actually rejoiced at the fact that our room was on the third floor. I shed a few tears and had a good rest. The thought of what the creature had said, sipping through my mind, that was two weeks ago, and until now, I believe I would never have to see that farm for the rest of my life. But as it turns out, my grandmother had left the farm to me. Not only that, she clearly stated in her will that I should also inherit her shotgun. I don't want to go back there, but because she died, I feel a weight of guilt dragging me down. My heart desires for me to follow her last wishes. And they involve going back to Maryland with her gun. But first, I'm going to try to get a priest to bless the farm. Or an old American native elder to perform a smudging ritual. Even though I'm skeptical about those ideas working. I don't know when I'll have an update. I just know it has to be soon or else I wanted to share something that I experienced as a child 
I'm somewhat a believer of the paranormal, but the analytical rational side of me always begs to differ slightly. This story is also very true. My grandmother isn't one to play around, especially about something like this. I'm not sure if you all will believe me, but I do want to say that this absolutely scared the crap out of me, and still actually does. So I thought I would share. I apologize in advance if I don't format my story correctly, or isn't as eloquent as other stories. I was about 10 or 11 years old at the time of this story. My mom wasn't home. I can't remember exactly where she was, but it was just me and my grandma on this one night. It was around this age that I had discovered whistling, how to do it well, and I found myself doing it quite often. At nighttime though, my grandma didn't like me doing it and kept telling me not to whistle at night and how it wasn't good. Despite her countless warnings, I just couldn't stop. It was a bad habit that I found myself doing without even thinking. So I'm not sure if you guys know already, but apparently whistling at night is really bad. My grandmother said that when you whistle at night, it's basically an invitation for the spirits to come to your house or something like that around that definition. Now, my grandmother is a firm believer of the paranormal. She has experienced a lot of stuff, but being young, I obviously didn't know that. Just as a side note, she has this thing with mirrors at night and avoids them. It's really bad apparently. I'm pretty sure it stems from a deep cultural belief one of which I have almost no knowledge of as I was born in a different country and so I'm not subjected to her cultural beliefs. After the whistling incident and realizing my grandmother doesn't do certain things for no reason, I developed a fear of mirrors even though I didn't really know why. I know it's kind of stupid. I might ask her one day. Moving on, being the dickhead that I was at the time, I didn't listen most likely due to the fact that I didn't really believe that such a thing was possible. This night was no different. I was whistling to my heart's desires. Everything was going as normal that night, and I slept in the room at the very back of our house. My grandmother was in the room just outside of mine. It was kind of like a sitting room. I'm not sure what Americans call it. The lounge, I guess? I was sleeping away until my grandmother shook me to wake up. I'm a very heavy sleeper, but when she began to wake me up, I got up right away, and that never happens. As soon as I woke up, I could see the fear and shock in her eyes. I will never forget the way she looked at me. She told me I couldn't sleep in that room, and instead made me sleep with her in one of the rooms at the front of the house. So the rooms from the front to the back were pretty far away. Initially, I was confused like... Why can't I sleep in that room? And why does she look so scared? She didn't tell me that night, but the next day, she asked me if I heard anything that night, and I said no. She then told me that while she was in the other room, she heard someone standing right outside of my window, whistling. I always wondered what would have happened if my grandmother wasn't there, or if she didn't hear it. Even though I wasn't a witness to this, I truly do believe her, and ever since that day, I don't ever whistle at night again. By the way, I did some research on the mirrors. I found out that if you sleep in a room that has a mirror in it, and that you can see it from where you sleep, and an open window, you're basically calling your dead ancestors to come knocking. So let this be a warning. If you're in bed tonight, in your own room, and you can see a mirror from where you're at, I would recommend you get rid of it. That is, if it's not too late. Hi everyone. This story comes from one of my friends who used to be a ranger at the national park I work at, and not from my personal experience. I asked him to tell me his scariest experience at the job, and it just so happened to be his last. 
I'll tell it from the first person view. My normal shifts were during the day, 9 to 5 like most people. But on that day, we were shorthanded on the night shift because the last person who worked during those hours had just quit. Lately, we had a whole lot of people quitting the night shift, so that meant that I had to cover. Strange enough, I never had to work the graveyard shift before then, and I was actually excited for it. I had brought some coffee and 5 hour energy shots with me because the hours ran, 10 to 5, and there was no way I would make it that far naturally. I got to my tower right before 10 o'clock, when it was already pitch black, and the cold July night had fully set in. The tower was very tall, with several flights of stairs leading up to the top. The whole thing was mostly surrounded by thick forest, except for the trail I came in from, and a murky pond that was just to the right of one of the tower legs. I climbed up, and all I could hear was the non-stop sounds of crickets, frogs, and the occasional owl. When I hit the top, I fumbled with my keys until I finally found the right one and walked right on in. The one room was small and square shaped. Three of the walls were mostly glass, and the other one wasn't and had the door I just came in. The roof went up like a pyramid for some short feet until it peaked and it was all made of wood. To my left was a nicely made bed and a nightstand with a lamp and a flashlight on top. It's not like I'm gonna be using the bed though. On the wall next to that was my CB radio and communication stand, which every one of these towers had. Next to that sat my fridge and microwave, which was part of a small kitchen that extended to the other wall as well. Inside the kitchen on the right wall were several cabinets, some small ones that held snacks and some canned foods, and another set of giant cabinets that I couldn't open which most likely had vacuums and other cleaning supplies that weren't above my pay grade. I went over to the communication stand and did my standard check to make sure everything was working. I called into the ranger station's channel and said, Hey Donnie, it looks like it's just you and me tonight. Donnie didn't say anything back, so I figured he was just taking a shit. I went and grabbed the flashlight on the stand and reached into one of its drawers, pulling out a set of binoculars from it. I went back out to the balcony and checked to make sure no fire hazards or any other kind of dangerous things were over there. Once I checked that box off my to-do list, I headed back inside and pulled out the chair from the communication stand and put it by one of the glass walls and grabbed a granola bar from one of the kitchen cabinets to munch on. I raised the binoculars up to my eyes and looked over to the surrounding forest. It didn't seem like any animals were up and about and no birds were in the sky. I skimmed over a couple of clearings to make sure that no teenagers were off camping illegally. Then I went and peeked over at a far ridge where I saw a snowman standing alone in the gap of the trees. Hold the fuck up. It was July. I looked again to see it wasn't a snowman, but some kid in a shitty ghost costume. It looked like the ones from Charlie Brown, with the big black holes for eyes that looked more like they were colored black than actual holes. The kid was still and staring right into where I was at, unmoving. I couldn't see the kid's parents anywhere, and by now it was rolling up to be 11 o'clock, so that meant something was up. I broke contact on the kid and walked to the radio, calling into the station. Hey Donnie, are you done taking a shit yet? I barely made it out, but I'm here now. I chuckle. Donnie was always good for a laugh. There's some kid with a blanket walking around the southeast sector. And they look alone. A blanket? What the hell are you even talking about? It's a ghost costume. It's got the black holes for eyes and stuff. You mean like the Charlie Brown costume? Can you check it out? Yeah, I'll go and see what's up. I'll call in on the walkie-talkie to tell you what I see. Roger that. I turned off the radio and crossed over to the nightstand drawer to grab the walkie-talkie. 
Once I had it, I sat back down in the chair and put the binoculars up to my eyes, zooming in to where the kid was. The ridge was empty, with no kid in sight, which I knew would make this a thousand times harder. I pulled up the antenna on the walkie-talkie and dialed to the right channel. Donnie, Donnie, you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. I'm getting close to the sector. I'm heading up to a ridge for a better view. Perfect. That's where I saw the kid, but they moved on since then. Well, I'm just going to check around to see if I can find anything. I watched as Donnie came over to the ridge, waving his flashlight around the dark, until he looked towards the tower and shrugged. Nothing over here. Damn. Hopefully he turns up again. Until then, I'll just notify the police and check with any missing reports. Alright, I'm going to go back to where Donnie's voice cut out and I saw his flashlight turn off in the distance. The spot where he was at was swallowed in by darkness. Donnie, are you there? I heard no response and I quickly rushed outside the door and around the corner to where I saw him, yelling his name, only to hear my voice echo in the woods. And that's when it hit me. There wasn't a single other sound in the whole forest. The crickets and frogs had stopped chirping. The wind didn't rustle through the leaves. Everything was completely standstill. I could hear my heart beating in my ears. And nothing else. I moved my flashlight around the woods attempting to find them. I got into that state of mind where I got so scared my throat closed up. And if I moved... I felt like something very bad was going to happen. I had to do something. I turned around. And as I did, I glanced at the stairs below me. At the bottom of the stairs stood a skinny, horrible, angled woman. She was tall, dripping with water, with black hair and dark murky blue skin that was stretching across her bent and broken bones. Her gray dress was shredded, and her black shoes were muddy and wet. And her face, her eyes were milky white, and her mouth hung wide open like a snake, like her jaw had been broken. She let out a blood-curling and ear-piercing scream of agony, and began to shuffle up the stairs so fucking fast that I snapped out of my fear lock and I ran the fuck back inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. There was no way she could run that fast, even if all of her bones weren't broken in wrong directions. I ran back to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife I could find, and then I pulled out the walkie-talkie, screaming into it. Is anyone there? Donnie, where the fuck are you, man? Someone, answer me. Then I heard the cracking of a door. I slowly turned, and I froze when I saw what was there. The door was still there locked and shut, and had been completely undisturbed. What scared me was the giant cabinet that was supposed to be locked, now stood open, with a kid dressed like a Charlie Brown ghost, standing just in front of it. I stood there, not moving until I heard the little shit giggle. I recognized that giggle. No fucking way. I pulled off the sheet to see one of Donnie's kids, Marvin, sporting a smirk and a walkie-talkie. Dad, Dad, I got him. I bet he pissed his pants just like I said he would, right? He and his other son laughed from the other end of the walkie. I was mad, but also glad that I wasn't about to get murdered in a wooden tower. I grabbed his walkie and shot back. Piss me off is what you did, you fucking asshole. I hope you're happy. Hearing you scream like a little girl. Sure did make me happy, alright. Yeah, screw you too. That wasn't even me. That was your stupid zombie chick. Who even was that? Your wife? My what? Does the ghost look like a zombie from that far away? You say yourself it looked like Charlie. Not the ghost, dumbass. The woman on the stairs. She screamed and ran up them so that she could scare me into the tower. Hell, she must be like an Olympic runner. Who was that? Dean. I'm not exactly sure who you're talking about. I didn't put no woman on the stairs. After hearing that he would have the night shift for the next couple of weeks until they found a replacement, 
my friend quit and vowed to never go back to the park. To this day, he swears that either Donnie never told him about that part being a prank or that he saw something unrelated. I began to question my own participation in the night shifts and consider myself lucky that the few times I've been on it, I had been stationed at the north and east sectors. I have talked about my road trip on here before. I took the first vacation of my life last year. A rebuilt Yamaha and a foolish sense of optimism carried me across the western United States. Being adventurous seriously made me rethink everything I thought I knew about the world. I love Seattle with the hip original hippie neighborhoods and the carnival atmosphere of Pike Place Market. Getting out of Seattle was a total nightmare. Restricted to back roads by a motor that capped at 40 miles an hour, I must have gotten lost a dozen times, despite all the help I received from Baffle gas station attendants. So I was behind schedule when it came to finding my campsite. So miles south and a little east of the city, there's a free campground. It's most often used by horse riders. And boy, can you smell it. That's actually what guided me in the last few miles. There's a gravel road off the service road, and then a few crooked unpaved roads off of that. The trail markers were all bent, broken, or faded. In the end, I had to follow my nose. I set up my junior scout tent in the fading twilight. Mine was the only one there. I had the place all to myself. After a quick meal of apples from a previous campground, I did my travel log on my video camera before turning in for the night. I'm not sure how long I slept. I know I checked the time, but I can't recall what it was. Something had disturbed my well-earned beauty rest, but I was too groggy to remember what it was. That's when I sat up, too alert to fall back asleep, but too sleepy to be totally awake. That's when something brushed the side of my tent, and suddenly, I was more awake now than I had ever been. I had done plenty of camping by that point, I was familiar with the sounds of the nighttime critters, from raccoons to coyotes. Nothing had ever bothered me in my tent before, just snuffle around camp before wandering off and leaving me be. From the sound of the footsteps, it was walking on two legs. My mind immediately jumped to the worst possible conclusion, a bear. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about how to deal with bears and a lot of it depends on the type of bear. Sitting there in the dark with my heart beating in my throat, I had no way of telling what kind I was dealing with. Should I shout out or play dead? I was about 30 yards from a sturdy cement block outhouse that might be better shelter. As quietly as I dared, I slipped my boots on and got ready to dash. The zipper of the tent seemed impossibly loud in the night as I worked it slowly and slowly. After getting it to be fully open, I slowly went outside. Once outside, I craned my neck around to see if the bear, if that's what it was, was between me and the outhouse. With the incredible illumination of the Milky Way, I could see the campground clearly all the way to the tree line. There was nothing out there. However, I had this feeling that something was watching me. It was like feeling an insect crawl along the back of my neck. There was no logical way for me to know that something had its eyes on me out there in the dark, in the middle of nowhere, all alone. I couldn't dismiss it. Still on high alert, I crept along and tried not to crunch the gravel under my feet too loud. The outhouse was still my best bet. The door was propped open by a stone, but inside there was a heavy duty boat lock. I would have to spend the night surrounded by the smell of not only horse, but also human poop. But I figured that was a fair trade for not getting killed or eaten. My hand was on the latch. When I heard the awful crunch of footsteps and gravel behind me, I kicked the stone propping the door open out of the way and slammed the heavy metal door shut, no longer caring how much noise I made. Whatever was on the other side had fingers. Something tugged on the door as I struggled to bolt it shut. I won 
but it was close. There was a metal mesh along the top of the outhouse for ventilation. Through the top, I could hear the heavy breathing that matched my own. My phone was back in my tent because I'm an idiot. There was no way to tell time. That's when the same stupid impulse that brought me out there in the first place kicked in. I had to. No. Hello? Silence. Maybe this person didn't hear me. But then. Hello? Hello? I could have shit myself. I was in the right place for it. The voice sounded like my own. And the sound of it was a kick to the gut. I couldn't even tell you why it made me so uneasy. The sensation was like when you're walking upstairs and you're expecting another step, but your foot comes down on an empty space. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought I was alone. I said, I am alone. Every syllable was off. Hey, I'm sorry. I freaked out. I didn't think there was anyone else out here. Sorry, I'm here. You would think that if I knew it was another camper, I would have opened the door, but I never did. Some deeply buried instinct kept me from taking my hand off the boat. Hey, you scared the crap out of me. Are there more tent sites out in the trees or something? I am something. There are more. The words made me sick to my stomach. Again. I couldn't have even told you why, only that they did. And from its odd speech, I guess English wasn't his first language. Uh, do you need to go? Use the bathroom, I mean, because I'm going to be in here for a while. That wasn't a lie. I wouldn't even open the door if it was my own mother on the other side. You need to go. Its English was improving with every sentence. There was something weird about that. Hey, look, I'm sorry if I scared you, but you started it by creeping around in the dark. I'm not going to come out. Can you go somewhere else? I'll be gone in the morning, I promise. I just wanted to sleep in peace. You need to be gone. I promise you, I creep in the dark. You won't be here in the morning. Fear closed my mouth shut. The more I spoke, the more he did, and I didn't want to hear his voice anymore. I'm sure that made me sound like a bigot or something, but I had the feeling I was feeding words to him, and the feeling was not pleasant. It felt like he was hungry for them. The same instinct that told me to keep quiet the first time kept me from running my dumb mouth off again. I was dealing with someone who was not mentally well, or was something else. The way he was speaking, and the way his words were coming out, and the tone and voice, there was no doubt that he was going to carry out what he was saying. I kept my hands on the boat while they cramped on the first rays of sun crept through the mesh at the top of the walls of my shelter. It wasn't until the sun was strong enough to make me sweat in my self-imposed prison that I felt brave, stupid, enough to speak again. Hey, are you still out there? Hello? Anyone? There was no answer, which was the best outcome I could hope for. I opened the door. My tent was untouched, at least from a distance. The oppressive feeling of being watched had dissipated. I dressed and broke down camp in record time. My moped cranked to life, but it wasn't until I went to put my helmet on that I saw the footprint. I had kicked that rock pretty far. It was close to my bike. Naturally, I went over to it. I had a no, and a clear outline of fresh mud. There was a single print on the smooth gray of the stone, not human, but a hoof like that of a horse or goat. It was so fresh, so vivid. It hadn't been there last night when I used the bathroom before I'd gone to bed and the soft mud in front of the outhouse door were more of the same, some of them on top of my own boot prints. If you want to go looking for whatever the hell it was, be my guest. Just be careful with your words out there, because I figured out what was wrong with that voice when I watched the playback of my travel log video. It was my own.
I was at home with my friend Samantha a few hours after school ended. When my dad called me to let me know that he wasn't going to be able to be home that night. There was going to be a really bad storm and he said he was going to stay at a friend's house with a few co-workers and then drive two hours. My dad works in construction. He works at different locations for every new project and this one happened to be far. My mom came home not too long after, completely soaked in rain. She talked to Sam for a bit before telling us that she was going to be upstairs taking a shower and filling out some paperwork from the office. Shit was thrown into the air at around 8 p.m. when Sam and I heard knocking on the door. It was already weird because who the fuck is even out there in this weather? It was pouring rain and the streets looked like an actual stream of piss. I went down to the door, dragging Sam with me, only to be greeted by nothing. We were looking out the door for a little under 5 seconds when we heard knocking again. Now this is when the shit that was thrown into the air hit the fan. Sam and I instantly pissed ourselves when we realized that someone was knocking on my back door. My back door being the door leading to the backyard. We quietly went up the stairs to my mom's room, finding her asleep, not even changed out of her work clothes. I woke her up immediately and told her someone was in our backyard. This obviously caused a little bit of panic, and seeing her so freaked out, freaked out Sam and I even more. This might not sound as scary to you, but being home without my dad in the house was scary enough on its own. Mom went down into the kitchen with us trailing not even two feet behind her and she pulled out her rolling pin. Before we could reach the door, the knocking stopped. My mom reached over and pulled the curtain back. All Sammy and mom saw was pitch black. But at a quick glance, I swear, I saw someone standing a few feet away from the door. Maybe it was because I was the only one of us facing its direction. But it was tall as fuck, like seven feet and maybe over that. That's all I could tell you because that's all I saw of it. It was most likely just one of those tree branches. It's really windy out there, mom said. I could tell Sammy wasn't too sure and I knew damn well it wasn't a tree branch, but why freak the rest of them out? Now I know I should have told them that we could have left, but I kept quiet for their sake. About an hour after that, Mom decided to go to the department store down the street to pick up some dinner and left both of us at home. It was only five minutes later when we heard knocking again. I quickly felt uneasy. I went down to the door and asked who it was. The following five seconds of silence were the longest five seconds of my life. It's me. It was mom. But at the same time, I felt like it wasn't. Looking back now, I realized her voice sounded like it was lacking all human characteristics. It wasn't playful, nor was it frustrated at how long we were keeping her out in the rain. It sounded like she didn't even know what emotions were. I opened the door without unlocking the chain and was greeted by my mom. Sam and I let her in and she came without any bags. She sat down on the couch for a few minutes, looking around. She was so fucked up. She seemed glitchy, like her actions weren't flowing smooth. Uh, mom, are you okay? You don't seem right. Her eyes looked at me before the rest of her face turned. It was just a long walk, cold, outside, raining. She kept listing words and phrases that made little sense. I was getting more uneasy by the second but I think Sam was just glad we weren't home alone anymore. The scariest thing that happened that night happened during one of my mom's rambling. Sammy had asked her what we were having for dinner, and she started listing more foods that we didn't even have. Halfway through what she was saying, I received a text from mom. Ask Sammy what she wants. Take your time deciding. It's so warm in here. My heart instantly dropped. Mom was right in front of me, Sam, and whatever was pretending to be mom directed their attention to me. Looking back at this moment, Sam said that all color had drained from my face. Who is it? My mom asked me. Uh, wrong number. 
I quickly flashed a smile. You look tired, Mom. Do you want to go to bed? Sam and I will make dinner. I think I just need, need a bath. We nodded and she stood up and made her way to the stairs. She was at the bottom of the stairs when I pulled out my phone to take a photo. I looked down at it for one second to cancel the 20% remaining notification. But when I looked back up, Mom was already at the top step. I can't stress this enough. The time in which I looked at my phone and looked back up was impossible for someone, for anyone, to walk 13 steps. I ran back to Sammy and waited until we both heard the water in the bathroom running. Sam, my mom texted me. When that thing was talking to us, my mom texted me. She started freaking out. Maybe she meant to send the text earlier, but it was only delivered till now. It seemed valid. Apple is always glitchy like that. But we decided to call her anyways just to make sure. Just as the phone started ringing, someone knocked on the door. We went to see who it was, and Sammy was about to open it, but I put my hand in front of her. I was so terrified at this point that I was in tears. Sammy stared at me in confusion. Hey, Mom, I said into the phone. I was shaking, and when Sammy heard me say that, she looked like she was about to throw up. Open the door, it's freezing outside. I sighed in relief and threw the door open. My mom was standing there with the phone pressed to her ear and her shopping bags around her feet. We explained what was happening and it took my mom two minutes of hearing the story for her to climb up the stairs and walk towards the bathroom. She literally kicked the door open and found the tub almost filled to the rim. The window was open and the fly screen was torn. The rest of the night consisted of us trying to get over what happened. We ended up sleeping together in my mom's room and my dad came home early next morning. I started researching a few days ago about similar experiences and the only thing I could find was it was most likely the goat man. I'm still freaking the fuck over what happened this last weekend. I think it's still out there. I fucking hope so. This all began a few months ago when I moved here from Eastern Washington to attend the university. I recently turned 21, but I didn't have any friends around to celebrate. So I did the next best thing, rolled a blunt, and ended up watching some stuff on Hulu. I'm living the life here, recreational weed undeclared major, living off my savings. And finally, no more parents nagging at my door to do something with my life, or at least I thought so. The first time I heard it, I thought I was paranoid. I smoke a ton of pot, and living in the new city doesn't help either. People say I live in the party area of downtown, Belltown, I think they call it. It just seems like an endless parade of people and drug street kids skulking at all times of night. And to be honest, it doesn't really bother me that much. I drown that shit out with headphones anyways. I much prefer it to that cold, deafening silence. The silence so strong you start realizing just how bad your situation actually is. A silence that conjures nightmare creatures from the deepest reaches of your mind to explain the occasional noise and the environment of a quiet house. It was in that silence that I heard it. I was grinding some bud for my third bowl of the night. When I noticed the empty quiet that filled the space outside of my apartment. I'm on the ground floor, so I'm basically used to all types of screaming, singing, arguing, and fighting when the sun goes down. But not now. Not tonight. There was nothing. It came from the window in my quote-unquote kitchen because it's literally two burners and a mini fridge with a microwave on top. Despite what you know or think about stoner stereotypes, I'm pretty fucking immaculate when it comes to cleaning too. That's why I was puzzled when I investigated the sound. Small amounts of dirt speckle across the small excuse for a counter under the window. The window was closed. I cleaned off the counter and figure I was too high to remember making that mess earlier. 
Fear was overcome by a wave of relaxation when I hit my pipe. Purple Kush. Family Guy eased me into a coma, and by the morning, I didn't even bother thinking about the noise from the night before. But from then on, it kept happening. Night after night, after night, the same three. Always at different times too. One o'clock, 2.45, 1.37, There wasn't really a pattern to it. Just the same weird interval of scratches. It seemed to be getting faster every time. I just started assuming it was someone fucking with me. Maybe some guys picked a place to fuck with every night after they left the bar. And I just happened to get lucky. This explanation would actually help me calm down. And I was eventually convinced that this was all it was. I still didn't have any friends here. And with the cold snap and rain, I didn't really feel like going out and making any yet. The school semester was almost over, and I noticed that I wasn't getting enough sleep. The scratching was getting louder now, and joke or not, I had to get some rest before finals week. One of my classmates suggested going camping. She even offered to let me use her tent and sleeping bag. She said that getting out of the city once in a while and being in nature helps calm the mind. Kinda hippie sounding, but I was stoned when she said it. I took up the offer and made a reservation at the campground. I'm not going to mention where at, because it might still be down there, waiting for someone. The girl from my class met me at a Starbucks downtown and gave me her camping gear. I really appreciated the kindness, but I'm not sure if my high as fuck monotone voice and glossy red eyes convey any evidence of that. Didn't matter anyways, I packed a couple grams of bud, my pipe, and my old camera. I got inspired by all the Milky Way pictures that people post online, and sleep or not, that was my mission now. The trip out to the park was long. I saw maybe one gas station for 20 miles, and I ate my snacks on the way there. I stopped there to re-up the trail mix and cliff bars and muscle milks before I continue on my way. The clerk looked Native American, kinda old too. He had this weird look in his eyes when I approached him as if he was about to say something but cut himself off and silently rang up my tasty treats. It was his eyes though that bothered me. He had this look of sympathy and dread and sadness all in one. Maybe I was analyzing the situation too hard but it seemed like he wanted to tell me something. Whatever though, I had a galaxy to photograph. The campsite was okay. I pitched the tent fast even though some of the poles were missing and didn't snap all the way. I took a hit off my pipe and looked up at the sky, camera in hand ready to snap that winning Milky Way shot. Clouds. Nothing but a fucking gray sky. Too tired to drive, I got in the tent and listened to a podcast from my phone speakers. I don't remember when I fell asleep, but I did, eventually. And then, I woke up. It was scratching at the fucking tent. Get the fuck off my tent, douchebags. And again, I was met with that cold silence. No one responded. I was somewhat paralyzed from fear. But in that brief moment, I checked my phone to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I refreshed the news app and saw it update in real time. Kind of a dumb way to check that everything is okay. But I guess it doesn't matter when... All around the tent, I heard it scratching and scratching to a point where I thought I was just going insane. My heart pounded out of my chest. And my anxiety was at the highest point it's ever been my entire life. Each passing moment of silence felt like another calm to a storm of horror. The scratching in my imagination. I couldn't get out of the tent. I couldn't speak. I waited and waited. It continued, scratching faster and faster and suddenly, I heard something. My tent. My. The way it spoke. Definitely not normal sounding for a person. 
the fact that I was even questioning the humanity in its voice was reason enough to piss myself, which I did. For a grown ass man, I was on the verge of tears. This was too much. I grabbed my car keys and phone and weed and unzipped the front flap. I bolted to the car, not looking back as I ran. The keys fumbled around the lock and I could hear something behind me, turning. It sounded huge, but it sounded like it was on two feet. The key slid in, and that's when I remember I had a clicker. It was in this moment of dumb realization. I got the ignition started, turned the high beams on and reversed out of my spot to hightail it out of the camp. Nothing in front of me. I peeked the rear view mirror before hitting the gas only to see two long, hair covered legs lit up by my brake lights. Making giant strides towards my rear window, I stomped on the pedal. Whatever it was trying to catch up to me, but it gave up after I approached about 60 miles per hour. The drive back was a relief, and a part of me still could not believe what happened. When I got home, it was already morning. The sun was up and I could see people staggering back from bars and nightclubs. It was a moment of relief. I felt a little back to normal until I got out of the car to get the supplies. Huge gashes were scratched into the window and door and my tailpipe was slightly bent. At least I'm not crazy, I thought. I lifted up the rear hatch and that's when I realized I forgot that I abandoned that girl's camping gear out in the campsite. My stomach dropped. There's no way she would believe my story. But that's when I noticed something else in the back seat of my car. Dirt. Small amounts of it speckle across the floor and seats. I'm writing this from home. And as an update, it's 4.53 p.m. And I just want to let y'all know, it's back. I'm writing this to warn you, or to educate you. I haven't decided yet, but you need to understand something. I don't know what I saw, but I do know that I never want to see it again. And I'm warning you, don't go out looking for it. I live and go to college in a small mountain town in Colorado, but often go home to see family as most of them live in Texas and I'm actually attached to visiting my cat. Now, in order to get home, I have to make most of my drive through New Mexico, through Santa Fe, and about 160 miles through the desert, which if you aren't familiar with, don't try to get acquainted with it, or if you're planning to go out there. I hope this story will change your mind. On this drive, I had three other people with me, my younger sister Andrea, and two friends from school, Jess and Katie. It was our spring break and instead of buying stupid price plane tickets, we decided to pile into my little Mercury vehicle and book it back to Texas. Unfortunately, we left the valley a little later than we were supposed to because someone, which was actually me, was forgetting their wallet. So by the time we hit the stretch of desert, it was close to 1 a.m. It had been raining since before we headed through Santa Fe. Not super heavy, but heavy enough. It was 65 degrees. I do remember that because it had been in negatives for quite a while because of where I go to school. So I was pleased to see something over five degrees. For this next part of the story, I need you to understand something. I hadn't been driving that long. I was actually awake. I didn't hallucinate and I damn sure wasn't the only one who saw it. So please, believe me. We passed a white Prius. As he was driving away, I looked in my rear view mirror and saw something crossing the road. Caught in the red glow of the tail lights, it was walking with a horrible limp and dragging itself across the road on two legs. The motions were unnatural, even jerky. I slammed on my brakes, thinking someone had driven off the road and was stuck or injured. I slid to a stop about 20 feet away from it. The Prius had stopped as well, seeing the person in the road. I opened my door and stuck my head out in the rain to get a better view. 
it was inhuman. It stopped. The figure was illuminated by the taillights of both of our vehicles. It had to have been at least seven feet tall, possibly eight. The skin was stretched like a too small shirt, cracking, hanging off its frame in long bloody ribbons. The jaw was almost totally unhinged from its face, the cheekbones disgusting. The skin on the scalp was thin and spots of bloody white stuck out. And the smell, I had never smelled anything like it. As soon as I opened the door it hit me. Rotting flesh, meat that has been left out for months, rotten milk, the kind of stuff nightmares are made of. The Prius took off, squealing its tires into the night. But I stayed. Fight or flight hadn't kicked in yet for me. This thing couldn't have been more than 20 feet away. It slowly turned its head. Each vertebrate in the neck individually cracking like fucking bubble wrap. We made eye contact. But it had no eyes. Only darkness. I slammed my car door shut and sped off. At this point my friends all woke up and saw it too. Katie was in the back and hysterical. Jess was silent, her mouth set into a grim. Andrea just sat with a look of fear, tears silently streaming down her face. My friend kept screaming, what the fuck was that? What the fuck was that, Alex? I didn't know what to tell her. I just kept driving, my hands gripping the wheel as we broke 80. Then something happened that I still, to this day, cannot explain. The temperature dropped during the whole event. It was 30 degrees out. It had been 65 no more than 5 minutes ago. It then began to snow, heavy, wet snow. We ended up pulling over at a gas station called Klein's Corner. No one moved. Andrea was crying and Jess was praying. Kate was cursing and I was shaking. What the fuck just happened? Kate said. All color drained from her face. I looked at her. My face with fear. I don't know. I don't want to know. But we need to leave. I slowly put the car into drive and continued our trip. I don't remember the rest of the drive. All I know is that everything else was fine. We reached Texas by 6am. Nothing else happened. I'm not sure what it was. The closest I could come to was a skinwalker. Maybe it was a shapeshifter that had a bad change. I really don't know. Please believe me when I tell you this. I'm not crazy. I know what I saw. Don't go looking for it. Don't follow it. Because it might end up following you back. Okay, so... I've been a skeptic of creepy paranormal things my entire life. I have never believed in that type of stuff. But the things I have heard, witnessed, at my grandparents' farm shakes me to my core. My grandparents own a large plot of land in central Missouri. And they have owned that land for around 40 years. I've been to that farm over 10 times and every time I go I always get this terrifying feeling that something is watching me like there's always something behind my back. I have also had many strange encounters there that are downright bizarre. My first encounter with whatever the hell this thing was was when I was around the age of 7 or 9. I'm currently 14. We had brought our dog named Spot to that farm. He was a silver lab who I loved dearly. I was exploring the forest behind the house just enjoying the summer breeze when my dog started growling. A deep sinister growl that I had never heard him make. I turned around quickly to see what he was growling at, but I couldn't see anything but forest among more forest. While my eyes were scanning the area of where my dog was growling, some animal shot out of the brush so fast 
I could barely see what it was. And before I knew it, it was gone. I sat there for what felt like an eternity. Absolutely flabbergasted by what I just witnessed. From what I could see of it, it looked like a coyote. But the speed at which it moved was absolutely insane. It moved like at 90 miles an hour and made almost no noise. But the most creepy part was that the place it jumped out of didn't even make an imprint of where it was laying. And from where I viewed it jumping up, I should have been able to easily see where it was hiding. Shocked by what I witnessed, I just decided that was enough and went back inside the house. My second encounter happened when I was around 10. I was visiting the place and like usual, I was getting the feeling I was being watched. That first day was normal and nothing really creepy happened. I was just spending quality time with family. But when night came, that's when shit started happening. I was trying to sleep in the twin bed that was shared by my mom's brother when he used to live there. That's when I heard tapping. Not tiny little taps, but loud tap. Almost like it was banging. It was coming from the direction of the window. I slowly sat up and looked at the window, but there was nothing. So I assumed it was just some animal or something like that. Five minutes passed and no tapping and I was drifting off to sleep when this time not a tap, a slam, a loud slam directly into the window. I'm not talking about like a hit, it sounded as if something absolutely massive hit the window. I shot up so quickly I nearly passed out. I decided enough was enough and grabbed the flashlight in the drawer and shined it out the window. Nothing. 10 seconds passed. Nothing. I was about to go crawl into my mom's bed when I heard it. A screech. A screech that was not achievable by any human. So loud it pierced the quiet peaceful summer night. I can't put into words what that sound sounded like, but it was dark and horrible and I still remember it to this day. I froze, unable to move muscle. I was so scared. I was sitting there still as a statue, petrified by what I heard. That's when my instincts kicked in and they told me to run into my mom's room, which I did. For some reason, I didn't wake her up. I just cuddled up next to her and didn't sleep the entire night. All I could think of was that sound, that horrific, terrible, bloody screech. My next encounter was when I was around the age of 13. I was back at my grandparents, just enjoying my time. Like I always do, my grandpa suggested that we go deer watching. I agreed because I had been doing this since as long as I could remember. And it was never an issue and it was extremely fun. So we took the Polaris and we went around 6 to 7 p.m. to look for deer. We decided to go into the most eastern pasture because that's usually where we spotted the most deer. 30 minutes passed and we had seen a few deer but not as much as we usually do. But then this is where the ship begins. I get that feeling again, that dreadful feeling that something is there and the shadows watching me. But this time, it's a lot more intense, like if it's right up behind me, but when I look, it's never there. But this time, it appears that my grandpa feels the same presence as me too. And just to let you all know, my grandpa is a very laid back individual always joking and having a laugh. The only time I've seen him be very serious is when my great uncle died a couple of years ago. 
So when I started feeling that I'm being watched, my grandpa goes from a happy and laid back expression to very serious and alert. He gripped the wheel so tight, his knuckles turned white, and he was just looking around like to make sure something wasn't following us. He then made a massive U-turn out of nowhere and started heading back to the house. I asked him, what are you doing? And he replied with, we're heading back to the house. The tone of his voice was cold, like he had witnessed someone being murdered. At this point, he was gripping the wheel even harder and was absolutely going pedal to the metal full speed back to the house. I decided not to ask any questions until we got back to the house, which we did in no time at all. Once we were there, he rushed me into the house, checking his back to make sure something wasn't there. When we were inside, he closed and locked the door tight. His behavior was very alarming and it really shocked me to my core. I then decided that all of the stuff I had witnessed was enough and I only asked them one question. What the hell is going on here? When I said that, he looked at me and gave me a cold expression and said, I have some things I need to explain to you. We then sat down for 30 minutes and he explained that whatever this thing was, it was living on his property and it has been here since the day he moved in and he and my mother experienced the same thing that was happening to me the very first few years of living here. He explained that he has seen whatever this thing is and it doesn't like new visitors. He told me about all the things he had witnessed and experienced and they seemed to have been very pretty similar to what was happening to me. He told me that he knew this was going to happen to me and that he was always watching to make sure I never got hurt because he knew this creature better than anyone else. We talked some more, but all of it was the same. It was now late and he decided that I couldn't sleep alone. So he had me sleep with my mom. We promptly left the next morning. I have not been back since that day. This last encounter isn't really an encounter. Two things have happened at my grandparents' farm. Recently, we brought my sister's horse to the farm. The first night for the horse was hell. My sister's horse has always been very friendly and not shy. But the first night of my sister's horse being at the farm was bizarre. The next morning, my grandpa woke up and was doing his usual chores and went to go feed the horse. He noticed that the horse was acting very weird, extremely shy and timid. But when he took a better look, he was shocked. The horse had three 10 inch gashes down its side, like something had clawed at it. It was ruled out that the horse ran into the fence, but I think otherwise. Also, around the same time, my grandparents adopted a dog and named it Panda. Panda was a Jack Russell Terrier who was two months of age. Five days later, he was found dead with deep puncture wounds on his body and with his neck slashed up. They said it was a bobcat or mountain lion, but I also think otherwise. This story comes from a 28 year old young man who calls himself Leo. When he was a boy, his grandmother, a Navajo woman, would tell him stories about dark spirits and skinwalkers. He recalls he used to wave her off, telling her there was no such things. In fact, whenever he would go out at night, he would make sure to tell her and make fun of her that he'll be walking alone. However, his arrogance 
came back to get him shortly after his 17th birthday. On the evening in question, he is out cruising about with two of his cousins, just drinking a few beers, listening to music, and doing a whole bunch of laughing. From St. Michael's, Arizona, their purposeless selves takes them through Sawmill and then along the back roads in and around Chinle, where they eventually get lost for a while. Driving deep in the woods and looking for anything they might recognize as a way back to the road, Leo is sitting in the back seat on the passenger side and looking out the window. He recalls it is definitely after 10 p.m. There, deep in the trees, he sees a single fire. The flames contain to a small space and close to the ground. He is just about to say something to the others when they too react. Looking now in the direction they are pointing, he sees many more of these small fires, literally dozens of them, popping up there within the trees, burning brightly for a moment or two, and then going out, only to have others ignite but a few feet or yards away. This goes on all the while they are driving along through this one stretch and seems to be keeping pace with them. Leo first has the thought that it is maybe a controlled fire process, something the local rangers and fire department do to control the undergrowth to reduce the potential for out of control forest fires. But being that it is nighttime, he quickly discards the idea. Besides, he notices and mentions to his two cousins that the fire so close to the base of the trees should be setting them on fire as well. Yet not one of them goes up or, from where he's looking, even gets scorched. They're both spooked and intrigued. They pull the car alongside the road and get out, beers in hand. However, they stay by the car with no desire to actually go into the woods. One of the cousins starts calling out to see if anyone will answer. The other cousin is less eager, telling everyone to be quiet and listen. But there's nothing to listen to. The fires, which continue to flare up and die down, aren't making any noise. For example, there's no crackling of anything burning, not even small twigs. Then within seconds, they find themselves standing in the dark. Every fire has now gone out, and there's not even new ones. Not believing their own eyes, they walk into the trees towards where they had agreed that one of the near fires had been. But no matter how much they look around, they can't find any sign of fire. No smoke, no charred ground, and no ashes. Nothing. There isn't even the smell of burned leaves or wood they expect to linger. But what's even more strange is that when they do go back to the car, they can't help but notice the smell of smoke on their clothes. The next morning comes and Leo tells his grandmother and mother what he had seen. While his mother shows very little interest, there is a knowing gleam in the eyes of his grandmother, but she has nothing to say. Almost immediately after that night, Leo says everything that could possibly go wrong does. First, each one of his cousins that were with them are involved in unexplainable accidents and are hurt seriously enough. One of them receives a second degree burn when the gas tank of a motorcycle he is working on ignites without reason or warning. The second one suffers a broken collarbone when the branch of a tree in his yard snaps and comes down across his shoulder. He too has no warning, even though he acknowledges that it is the same tree that was hit by lightning a month or so earlier. Strange enough, both accidents happen on the same day and almost at the same time. As for Leo, even though it's much less painful, all of the family vehicles break down within days of each other. 
it is at this point that the family makes the choice to seek the help of the local medicine man. Together, they climb into his aunt's car. She's the mother of the cousin with the broken collarbone, which had worked fine earlier that day, but now it refuses to start. Leo suggests that it's the battery, so they attempt to jumpstart it with his grandfather's truck. It is not in the best shape. It's driven only locally, and it's not even registered or insured, but it always starts. But this time, it won't turn over. Finally, they find a neighbor who is nice enough to take them. When they get to the medicine man and tell him everything, starting with the fires, he says to them, you already know who is doing this to you. Leo recalls they all just look at one another, each without a clue. His grandmother, however, tells them that she'll explain it on the ride back home. She sends them out to the car to wait while she speaks with the medicine man. When she comes back, she tells them that it's going to be okay. On the way back, Leo's grandmother tells them about her great-grandfather. She says that the family had a 30-acre plot, which they had been living on for generations. When he passed away, and before his own children could lay claim to the property, a man and his wife built themselves a crude hogan on the far side of the property and moved in. When her great-grandfather's sons, one of whom was her grandfather, tried to evict the man from the property. He used dark medicine to chase them off. He even kept their own father from building a house on the far side of the property along the arroyo. She then tells Leo that the woods in which he and his cousins saw the fire is the outer edge of that property and the smoke they smelled on themselves was the mark of the skinwalker. She says the old squatter and his wife are both more than a hundred years old and even though no one has seen them for years, she's still sure that they live there, still. All Leo knows is that since the visit with the medicine man, he and his family have had no further experiences with the skinwalker. He says that there are nights when the dogs bark and it seems they try to break free from their chains, like there's something out in the darkness, which they want no part of. On those nights, Leo is sure to say his prayers, both in Navajo and the ones he learned in the Catholic Church. He's convinced the words will protect him from the old man and his wife, two powerful skinwalkers that he doesn't want playing around in his head. I live right next to the Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek, and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times, and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was 10 steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze 
Not sure what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation, so I whispered, Hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice. Hello? My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I was gonna faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale. And I realized for the first time that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets, nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wheeling my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush as it came further out and stood up on twos. I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, lay down, and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake, listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy! Amy! Come here! Hello? Stop it! My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they called Yi Naudroshi, or he who goes on all fours, or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required, and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me 
and that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window. Then, a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, I started calling my name, but drawing it out really far, like, Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. Many of you who love paranormal stuff may have already heard of the word Nagual here in Mexico and I would guess that also on some other countries in Latino America we call that way people who can shapeshift into animals. Well here's my story. It was a cold night I remember because it was really weird for it to get cold on that side of the country. This was in my parents house in a small pueblo or small town and back in the day it was one of the last houses outside of town not so many neighbors but a lot of trees and nature around the house has a long backyard where we used to have sheep at one side a small water stream and trees to the other side the sheep then started to bleat very loud something we could call screams my father then went to give a check on a window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly. And in a low, urgent voice, he told my mom, Ve agarra a tu padre y a tus hermanos y diles que vengan ya ahorita. Go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers, my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell us what he saw. In the barn, we had ten sheep. At the moment my father gave a look, all of them were together in just one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense, but he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one sheep there. This one sheep was screaming really bad. Then my grandfather told my mom to keep us inside of the house and to keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. So he made some kind of prayer holding his machete. So his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. He then went outside that's when my grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Vete de aquí. No tienes nada que ver aquí. Deja esta casa. Go away. You have nothing to do here. Leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming, by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and raise its head up towards my family. This thing was only staring at them. Not a single noise. And also no red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock. He picked it up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation. But I guess this thing was not that strong. Or maybe because it was six of us and we all had machetes but when the rock hit it this being turned its back and ran away to the forest running on all four legs like an animal would they then approached the sheep and my grandpa said how the sheep was on the ground 
but it was still alive, but it was completely unskinned. It was horrifying at least. My grandfather then sacrificed it to stop the suffering. After that night, a family friend told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was a Nagual. He told us he spoke to that man and he told him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar after that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube. And there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts. And at night, when it was pitch black, we would all play manhunt. Well, one time, we all got down to one person whose name was David. Growing up, he was super fast, and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him. He would always end up being the last person. Well, one time, it was down to David and we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. And with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale, but he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention, so we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening, so my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside, and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad. My mom, she tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. Then she realizes that she's unable to move, as if she's paralyzed. Still, in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam, only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad, and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, 
He wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it, but he has to admit we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves, and as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. She then has all of us pray, and now, every year, we hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona, within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say, an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation, were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped, and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house, and they summoned the local medicine man who came and said some prayers over him, but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. My older sister, who is Irish, Italian, recently got married. Not her first, to this guy who is Navajo. Shortly after they settled down together, she has a boy from her first marriage. They invite me to hang out with them down on the reservation where her new husband has a house and some property. I ended up bringing a few friends. Being a white guy, I know nothing about native or skinwalker lore. One of the friends that comes along, Gregory, however, is into horror and demons, things like that, and knows all these different werewolf, vampire, 
and even skinwalker stories. That first night, with not much else to do, we are out in the middle of a few hundred thousand acres of hills and wooded land. We end up sitting around a small bonfire, with him telling us one story after the next. The next day, we all take a walk to the elementary school to bring my nephew home. My sister usually picks him up, but she has some errands to run. Along the way, we pass this scraggly looking dude sitting beneath this tree beside the road. He looks kind of old, but in a way that is difficult to say just how old. Regardless, it's definitely creepy the way he's watching us. His eyes kind of flat and dull, as if unaffected by the sunlight. As we make our way back from the school, my nephew seems pretty quiet and shy. When he sees this guy, he ducks behind me and starts tugging on my shirt. I ask him what's up, and without taking his eyes off the guy, he whispers, I don't like that man. He's bad. The way he said it gives me chills. But I really don't think all that much more about it. Well, that night, Gregory and my other two friends, Jeff and Sarah, and I all head out to go check out this abandoned part of the reservation, which supposedly is haunted. We had been warned not to buy my brother-in-law. He says it is an inhabited place of ghosts of the past and some kind of dark being. Of course, that only serves to make us want to go even more. So we dismiss his warnings and ghost stories, take the keys to my sister's SUV, and off we go. When we first get there, I have to admit, it is a lot spookier looking and feeling than any one of us had expected, consisting of only a handful of abandoned structures, most of the faded and grain wood, and the biggest of which is only two stories. It looks to me to have been some sort of mining town, like the kind that you see on westerns on TV. Anyways, just about every window is completely busted out, with only a shared appointed pane hanging here and there. There isn't a single door still in place, and definitely not an item of any value anywhere to be seen. In fact, there isn't much of anything at all. As we walk around, going up to and looking into some of the places, but not entering, Jeff takes us to telling us how this reminds him of one of his past flings with some girl. Sarah and I roll our eyes, as we always do when he starts waxing old memories and then goes off a little ways. Leaving him and Gregory together, we find a cozy corner out of sight and start getting comfortable, if you know what I mean. We are going at it for all five seconds when we both notice it has suddenly turned chill. Just as we huddle together for warmness, we hear a blood curling scream. We jump up and run back into the direction of the SUV and where we last saw Gregory and Jeff. There, they are facing the remains of the storefront, their eyes staring straight ahead and oblivious to the fact that we are there. Sarah and I both look to where they are staring and we see this creature that it is a wolf-like creature but yet not being a wolf completely. I'm still not sure to this day if it was real or not. Either way, I for one am scared as I have never been in my life. Its body is fully covered in hair and it had these long wraith-like fingers which end in thick curled nails definitely claw-like. Its head is the worst though. Its eyes are just these two chunks of dark coal, flat and emotionless. Its mouth is full of small daggers. I'm not sure how long we stand there frozen. Finally, it takes a step forward and as if released from some spell, we bolt to the truck. Jeff and I jump into the front seat, he to the driver's side and me in the passenger. While Gregory and Sarah go for the back, Jeff doesn't have his license, but at that point no one's arguing. The keys are in the ignition. He starts the SUV, floors the gas, 
and we speed off gravel and sand flying everywhere. I look out the window on my side, and then all around, I see nothing through the cloud of dust and the darkening twilight. When I turn to look back at Gregory, the only thing he could think to say is, you got some lipstick on your chin. Just down the road some, Jeff slows the truck. By this time we are all laughing and making fun of each other for running away from shadows. Just then, a look of fright comes over Sarah's face, and without saying a word, she points a trembling finger out towards the trees along the side of the road. There, back in the dark of the trees, is where we see the shadow-like figure running just inside a tree line as if it's keeping pace with us. And we all yell in unison to Jeff and he again presses down on the gas. The SUV spring into life, but that thing, whatever it is, stays with us every inch of the way. It is only when we see the lights to my sister's porch that making the turn off to her. When we pull up to the house, my brother-in-law is out on the porch with this guy dressed in a long sleeve but in white shirt, blue jeans, and work boots. He later introduces himself as the local shaman. When we get up to the porch, the guy is in the middle of some kind of blessing. When he finishes, my brother-in-law simply turns to us and says, Now you know maybe next time you'll listen. Later, after the shaman leaves, he admonishes us, saying that by telling the skinwalker stories, we put everyone out there in danger. He said just mentioning them can make them come and seek you out. I grew up in the woods. I was raised by a single foster parent, Margie, and she was too busy to bother with me. So instead of hanging with my foster siblings, I went into the woods. By the time I could drive, I was spending more time in the woods than I was at home. In all seriousness, I don't think I slept at home one night my senior year. There was something about being in the forest that made me feel at peace. Something that kept Margie's shit parenting at bay. Over those years, I learned nearly everything about the forest that a kid my age could. Foxes sound like people. Cougars are perfect hunters. Bears can climb trees. And the most important thing, if the forest goes silent, something is wrong. If you're going to take anything away from the story, I pray that you make it that. Silence is not good when you're deep in the forest. Like anyone in my situation would, I moved away from home as soon as I could. I packed up my room, loaded up my truck, and found a nice outdoors town by a state over. I was beyond excited when I saw an ad in the newspaper about some trapping gear that someone wanted to sell. Trapping and hunting were some of the better jobs I could work as they paid well, and being born native meant that I could apply for a year-round hunting permit. Plus, it would give me an excuse to live up in the woods and only leave every once in a while with that idea in mind. I called the owner of the gear, his name was Clark, and asked what he was selling and what it might cost. He told me that the set contained eight different traps, an animal call box, snares, knives, and a Winchester 1200. He was selling everything for 2500. I had saved up money that I had made or that was gifted to me, and being young and dumb, I bought everything. Within a week of buying the gear, I bought my permit, and the state I'm in requires a separate trapping license, so I got that one too. All that set me back another 400, but I was finally ready to live like I wanted to. Clark said that there was a hunting lodge I could stay at. No one owned it, so it was free to stay. People would repair it when it needed to be fixed. And that was about it. From that point on, I became a woodsman, and I lived like that for a few years, spending more time in the woods than in my own apartment. Trapping had actually made me a good amount of money, and when furs and pelts weren't doing too well, the meat and the claws sold well too. 
I had become accustomed to the noises from the woods. Animal calls, god-awful noises, wind blowing through the top layers of the trees. All those sounds became ingrained in me. So now, I guess I'll tell you all why I'm actually writing this. Last weekend, I went out to the lodge to settle in. There was no one at the lodge when I got there, which is pretty normal for midsummer. I'm the only native that hunts up here, so I'm the only one that stays here all year. Aside from a single backpack on one of the beds, the lodge was barren. I set my gear down, grabbed a can of soup, and headed to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. As I walked past one of the windows, I saw something along the edge of the trees. The lodge was in the middle of a circular break in the forest, so the area around the lodge was just open. No canopy, no trees, just grass and ferns. On the edge of the tree line was something. It was a little too dark under the shade of the trees to really make out what it was, but something was definitely there. I tried to study the figure, looking for a shape or some color, but it was too hidden and I came up empty. Eventually, the figure faded out of sight, walking into the deeper part of the woods. As the sun started to go down, the watercolor sky changed from a light blue to a deep purple before fading out into blackness. I took out some of the snares, grabbed my shotgun, and walked out of the lodge. I like to set the snares at night. That way the animals trip them when they wake up to look for food. It just makes more sense. Clicking on the barrel mounted flashlight, I stepped outside. Something instantly felt wrong. Almost like if I was somewhere new. I had walked the woods at night hundreds of times, but they felt unfamiliar now. The wind blew far above the treetops, adding an almost musical sound to the surrounding area. After I got a few snares set up, I decided that I would finish the others once the sun came up, and I started walking back to the trail leading to the lodge. On the way, just before I broke the tree line next to the trail, I saw someone walking on the path just out of the reach of my flashlight. He didn't seem to have any gear, and he must have been walking by the light of the moon as I didn't see the beam from a flashlight. Feeling like a bit of a trickster, I clicked my light on and made my way silently back onto the trail. My plan was to sneak up on the guy and scare him. Seeing as he didn't have a gun, I figured I wouldn't get my head blown off. He was pretty far ahead of me, so I tried to walk a little bit faster, but he made it over one of the hills on the trail and left my line of sight. Expecting him to pop back up on the other side any second, I hustled a little bit to close the gap. When I got closer to the hill, a shriek ripped through the nearby woods. I heard every animal in those woods make every noise they could, and I still have no idea what could have let that scream out. It sounded like the call of some ancient, terrible beast. A creature that was far more intelligent than anything else in the woods. I switched my light back on and called out for the man I saw earlier, but he was nowhere to be found. Part of me was hoping he took off running towards the lodge, but every ounce of me knew that I couldn't wait around to check. So I bolted back up the trail, and that's when the horrible noise came tearing through the woods again. That's when it hit me. Apart from the noises and my footfalls, the forest was silent. No birds, no small animals, even all the wind had gone away. There was absolutely no noise. My boots stamped against the dirt, kicking up dust and rocks as I tore up the path trying to run. I've been hunted by cougars, bears, wolves, but this time, something felt different. I still felt like something was watching me, burning its eyes in me as I ran. Only instead of it watching out of a territorial need, or a need for food, was actually playing with me, like it was allowing me to keep going. Like it was waiting for me to catch some air. By the time the lodge came into view, another noise, another shriek. This time, it sounded much closer. 
I pushed the door open and when I spun around to slam the door shut, I saw the same man from earlier. He seemed very calm and he stopped just as he broke through the tree line. Nothing about him seemed normal. How did he end up behind me? I had been looking ahead the whole time and I never passed him. Apparently he was right on my heels too. At least if he was that close when I got to the cabin. But I didn't hear him behind me. When he started to walk, I slammed the door shut and locked it. Whatever he was, he wasn't getting in here. Using my flashlight, I went around and turned all the lights in the lodge on and then checked all the windows and entrances. Once the place was secure, I sat down on the bed and tried to sleep it off, thinking that the sun would force whatever I heard to retreat. Within seconds of snoozing, I was woken up by the sound of banging on a window. The grogginess of my sleep was wearing off as I neared the source of the banging. From afar, I could make out a vague, white shape in the window. The longer I stared, the more clear it became. It was the exact same guy from earlier, face pressed against the glass with his hand banging on the window. Hoping that I could just walk up and ask what he wanted, I started to walk ahead, slowly. When I got within an arm's length of the window, the man stopped slamming his hand into the window and instead, his jaw dropped. At first it stayed at a normal distance, but after a while, his jaw began to crack and it descended even further down. His mouth was hanging open and I noticed the sound, quiet at first, coming from his throat. It was a low, deep groan. After a few seconds of groaning, a voice came from him. Open window. That's all he said. Nothing more. Nothing less. He was just repeating that line over and over. Open window. Open window. Open window. No emotion. I told him to fuck off. That I wasn't going to die because he wanted to come in. When he didn't back off, I turned and grabbed my shotgun. Walked back up and placed the barrel against the window. Open window. Open window. He began to shake like he was having a violent seizure. Twitching. Maybe from the cold. Maybe from something else. That's when the same piercing shriek from earlier came out of the dark hole that was his throat. And he slipped away in the darkness, leaving the window. I was able to get a little bit of sleep that night but I was briefly awoken a few times by more noises and more shrieks. When the sun had started to creep up through the sky the next morning, I checked all the windows and then deemed it safe enough to go outside. Circling the lodge, I noticed a few things. Footprints leading from the same window that this man or thing was at back to the forest. And on the other side of the same window were deep scratches. Other than that, the surrounding area was normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was feeling safe enough to be able to walk down to the trail and to my truck. So I grabbed my gear and noticed that the same backpack was still there. It had been there since I got to the lodge. And I figured that someone might have left it up there and forgot about it. I figured I would grab it and leave an ad in the paper about it. I loaded up the backpack and left the lodge, not even bothering to check on the snares. The trail seemed longer than it had ever been before, and the hiking down felt uneasy. But it wasn't until I got within sight of my truck that I really lost it. Just as I came to the part where the trail opens up, I decided to take one last look into the woods and behind a fallen tree, I saw him, the same man from earlier, standing there, watching me. I tossed my gear in the back, jumped in the truck and drove off. As I sped down the road back to town, I noticed something in the woods alongside the car, just ahead of me. Looking outwards towards the road was the same man, but something about him looked different. His arms seemed to hang down to his knees, 
and his face looked more sunken, fearing that he would find a way into the car. I floored the gas and hoped there wouldn't be any state troopers out. I got back to town and headed home. I needed to rest, and a few days later, I decided to head to City Hall and turn in the backpack and warn someone about what I had seen. Before I even got to the permit section of the building, I was stopped by the lady at the front desk. She asked me if I'd been out by the lodge, and I told her yes. She asked me to wait in the lobby, and I agreed. After a few minutes, the sheriff showed up and asked to talk with me. Apparently a day or two before I went into the woods, there had been an animal attack. A hiking group of three people. One died, one was missing, and the one that made it back, really bad. The sheriff wanted to know if I saw any strange animal activities and I told him what happened. Instead of disbelief and a laugh, he asked me to take a look at a picture and see if I recognized it. When he took the picture out of his pocket, I almost had a panic attack. It was the same man I had seen in the forest. It looked like a driver's license photo or something. The sheriff wasn't surprised when I told him that was the same man. He actually thanked me and left the building. I wanted to just forget about everything, like it never happened, to go on with my life and keep living how I'm used to. But there's one issue. Sometimes, when I look out my window at night, I swear, I see the same man. But now, his arms are far longer than any human arm, and his jaw still hangs loose and open. I think it followed me from the trail and I'm not sure what to do. When I was eight years old, both of my parents worked full time. My dad was on third shift at his job and my mom was a school teacher. We lived right up the road from my grandparents in a very small town. It was getting close to my ninth birthday when I got strep throat and scarlet fever. I ended up severely sick. I could barely speak. Had the first case of cold sweats that I remember in my life. I could barely pull myself out of bed to even use the restroom. My poor mother was at a loss of what to do with her working and my dad needing to use daylight hours to sleep. The first day I was sick. My dad stayed up most of the day with me, made me food, wiped my forehead down, made sure I took my medicine, and everything else. But on the second day, my grandmother had called and offered to let me stay at her house so my dad could sleep. He said yes and woke me up around 7 that morning to drive me up to her place. My grandfather also worked at this time as well, so he was already gone to work when I got there. I don't remember too much of the early morning. I must have just slept in my grandmother's bed, tossing and turning when I would wake up feeling extra bad. She encouraged me to swallow my awful tasting medicine a little more gently than my dad did at least. She did fix me some tomato soup to try to eat and it was the first time since I got in sick that I had an appetite. I should mention that my grandmother had this little small dog named Samson. Samson came into the room and crawled up next to me as I dozed off. I do know when I woke up at some point, it had to be the early afternoon lunch time because I could hear the TV from the living room on some game show. My grandmother had a ritual of eating her lunch while watching a game show. I think it was The Price is Right. I was trying to fall back asleep because I got this really bad headache coming, maybe from dehydration. I was on the edge of falling asleep when I suddenly woke up by Samson scream that erupted from the living room. The dog curled up next to my feet perked up but didn't move. I knew I heard his name being called but it was strange. He didn't respond. Samson, my grandma called again. Samson, the dog still didn't run out of the room to her. I was confused as he was obedient to my grandmother. He was almost frozen. 
staring at the cracked open door, but making no attempt to go to her. She called again, Samson, maybe three or four more times, Samson, Samson, Samson. Then I actually got annoyed. I remember flinging the covers off of me. Of course, all of my clothes is sticky with sweat and I just feel uncomfortable and groggy. I stumble out of the room wiping my eyes and asking, Grandma, do you need Samson? He's in your room with me. I'm in the living room and I have to do a double take. The TV is still on and loud. There's a bowl of soup sitting on the coffee table and also an open Pepsi next to it. But my grandmother isn't anywhere in the room. Maybe she's in the bathroom. I crossed the room and went past the kitchen, but it was empty too. I got to the bathroom door which was shut. Nothing. I then opened it. No one was in there. The house is empty. It's not a huge house either. I went by through every single room. So yeah, my first reaction was to get scared. I could clearly hear my grandmother calling for the dog, but she's not anywhere inside. I can feel my hands and feet get all tingly. I start shouting for my grandma, but my voice is just echoing through the small cramped home. Samson had gotten up at this point and was sitting near the couch, looking completely undisturbed. I fumble for the remote and turn the TV off and yell to the top of my lungs, which you can imagine how painful this was with a scratchy infected throat. Grandma, the worst part happened next. That's when I heard my grandma shouting my name back, clear as ever, like she was standing only feet away. I start crying now, scared out of my mind. I feel like maybe it has to be a ghost. I grew up with scary ghost stories courtesy of my dad, and I'm convinced now that I'm in the room with a ghost. And then she, whatever this was, proceeded to call my name again. Then there was a second voice. Definitely not my grandmother's. It was deeper, definitely more masculine and terrifying as it said, Come to the front door. Of course I didn't go. Instead, I made sure to run back to my grandparents' bedroom, lock the door, and pick up the telephone on their nightstand. I called my own home phone and my dad's sleepy voice answered through a barely comprehensible voice. I managed to croak something like, Dad, there's someone in the house and I can't find Grandma. She's gone. My dad, of course, said he jumped out of bed, grabbed his army knife he kept in a drawer next to the bed, and ran down the road to the house in his PJs and bare feet. He ran up to the front door, jiggled the handle. It was locked. So he made his way around and since he knew the garage code, just punched it in and got inside. A quick sweep of the three rooms of the home showed no one was in there. It's not like there was really anywhere to hide. I ran out of the room once I was sure he was there and began crying in his arms. He kept reassuring me that there was no one here and then he asked if I knew where grandma was at. I said I didn't and explained that I woke up to her calling for Samson but she hadn't been anywhere there. This was back when cell phones were definitely around but there were no iPhones and my grandparents weren't going to be buying them anyways. My dad had a cell phone, but he didn't have it on him at the time. I could tell he was trying to keep calm, so he just said we would need to go back to our house. I was sure he was going to call the police at that point, just because my grandma still hadn't popped up. And her vehicle was still in the driveway when he got in. If she had left, she must have gone on foot. We hadn't even made two steps out of the driveway went from my grandma's neighbor's house. My grandma was strolling out, talking to the neighbor. She then saw my dad, and then she saw me, crying my eyes out, and immediately ran over to see what was wrong. She was super apologetic. She said she had stepped out right when she had heated up her soup to go see her neighbor, who had called about looking at something that my grandma was going to buy. My grandma figured I was asleep, and she thought she would only be gone for 10 or 15 minutes. At first, people may have assumed I was feverish, therefore confused, but I still stand by what happened. 
I know for a fact, I was definitely alone in the house with Samson, but the voices I heard were real. For a while, I refused to go back to my grandma's house because this happened in the middle of the fucking day. I later read stories at school about Wendigos or the creatures that would disguise their voices to draw people. This was the best explanation I could ever form about what I heard. I never shared to anyone that I thought it was for sure a Wendigo and chalked it up to maybe just a ghost. I'm close to my 20s now. Last year was the first time I shared the story fully to my grandpa who actually just used to say the fever you had must have made you had bad dreams. We were sitting on the front porch of the house smoking cigarettes and exchanging stories. When I finished telling him, for the first time he looked sort of disturbed about it. He finally put his cigarette out and just stared out into the road. Then he cleared his throat and looked over to me. You know, he said slowly, some funny things used to happen around that time, in the middle of the night. I would wake up to take a piss or something. When I would first sit up in the bed, I could hear your grandma sleeping away snoring he chuckled but his face grew serious again anyways i would always hear her calling for the dog i tried to remain looking calm but my voice still shook when i asked even when she was sleeping sleep talking uh no he shook his head i listened i actually heard her calling from outside maybe the living room she would call for the dog she would call my name All while she was really sleeping next to me. Sleeping like a baby. Well, have you ever told anyone? No, I don't want to scare her. She's real scared of ideas like ghosts. That's why when you were younger and this thing happened, I told her just to remember you've been sick, fever and all. Most likely having nightmares. He looked gravely at me. Don't repeat this to her, please. She's really not the type to be scaring. I wanted to cry. I had this itchy, creepy feeling suddenly about being at the house. Hey, Grandpa, do you still hear it sometimes? Of course, I still do. He was now reaching into his breast pocket to get out another cigarette. I hear him every night. But you just gotta remember not to do what it says. Even the dog figured this out. If it says come to the door, you stay away from the door. If it says come here, you just stay still in the room until it quits calling. And with that, he asked to borrow my lighter again. I have a story, it's not mine, but it happened to my uncle. He used to tell this story when we went camping and it scared the lights out of me every time I heard it. We live in Utah and my uncle Mark went on a mission at 19. They sent him to a native reservation in Arizona. They paired him up with a companion named Carl. When they first got there, there was a huge argument with the locals on the reservation about them going there. They didn't want my uncle and Carl staying on the res. Eventually, they came to a compromise that they would stay on the outskirts in a trailer. This reservation wasn't very big and was located next to a wooded area. The first night, they were trying to sleep when all of a sudden their trailer started to shake violently back and forth. Startled and not sure what was happening, they climbed under the table for cover. Mark could hear someone pushing it from both sides of the trailer, like a group of people. And then, after about five minutes, it stopped. The next day, they made rounds on the res and were talking to the locals. Carl made a comment to one of the families that their trailer was shaking the night before. The family got very quiet and then told him they had to leave. They thought it was pretty strange, but didn't think much of it. The next night it happened again. They were awakened by the trailer shaking back and forth. Again, 
They climbed under the table until it stopped. This went on for two more nights. Anytime they tried to talk to anyone about it, they got quiet and told them they had to leave. Mark started thinking that because of their arrival, the locals were doing this to scare them off the res. They then went into a store and they were talking together about how frustrated they were with the situation. The clerk overheard and said, they can't talk about it, it's forbidden. Confused, they ask, can't talk about what? The guy continues to tell them about the skinwalkers. He says they are evil demons that were once Native American witches. If they talk about it, the skinwalkers will come for their souls. They just walked out of there baffled. They thought the clerk was just trying to scare them. So that night, when the shaking started again, my uncle decided to be brave and confront them. He went to the trailer door, flew it open, and yelled. When he did that, he saw three animals run off. Two were a wolf, one was a bear. However, they looked strange, almost with human features. As he watched them run towards the trees, all three of them stood up on two legs and walked slowly towards the trees, making a human cackling laugh. It scared him so bad that they called their mission president that next morning and asked to be moved. They were relocated that day, and for a year, nothing happened. One day, they announced that Carl was being relocated to another city, and Mark was getting a new companion named Jimmy. They had to drive for about an hour to pick Jimmy up from the airport. The road they traveled went through the boundaries of the res. They arrived at 8 p.m. and picked them up. The mission president tells Jimmy, we're driving through a dangerous area at night, so we can't make any stops. If you need to use the restroom, you need to go now. Jimmy then says that he's fine. The mission president gets serious enough to even freak out Mark. I'm not kidding. Go do your business. Jimmy was insistent he was fine, so they hit the road. As they were about 30 minutes into the drive, they were going through the area of the reservation boundaries. Jimmy starts complaining that he needed a pee so bad. The mission president says, We can't stop here. You're going to have to hold it. Jimmy keeps going on. I seriously can't hold it anymore. So the mission president stops the car and says, But you will do your business next to the door. And if I say get in the car, you need to get in the car fast. Jimmy was looking confused and said, All right. And then he opens the door and starts to do his business. About five seconds later, the mission president says nothing and just pulls Jimmy into the car and floors it. Jimmy and Mark start freaking out. What's going on? The mission president says nothing and just increases his speed. All of a sudden, Mark sees something next to the car to his right. A giant wolf-looking man was running on two feet next to the vehicle. Mark then looked over at the gauges. They were going over 60 miles an hour and still going faster. The wolf creature kept right next to the car for 10 minutes until it finally took off into the trees. Shaking, Jimmy gets out of the car when they arrive. They didn't speak after this whole situation. And then he says, What did I just see? The mission president says, Next time I tell you to take care of your business, you need to take care of your business. I woke up yesterday morning very comfortable and restored from a full night's sleep. It was going to be a good day. I could tell. I heard the familiar sound of my mom fumbling around with her keys that she did every morning before she left for work. See you after work, she yelled from the door. I was so comfy in bed, but couldn't get back to sleep because I slept so long last night. So I got up and just played video games for a while. Everything seemed normal that day. I let my dogs out and sat on my bed playing on my laptop. I got hungry like any teenager does and went to my kitchen to get some food. I walked into the kitchen and was shocked at what I saw. Every single cupboard door was open and there was a row of bowls perfectly in line on the counter. I yelled for my dad who I thought made this mess. 
But then I realized that he was at work too. I thought nothing of this and just put all the dishes back. It was about 4.30, normally the time my mom gets home, when my front door opened. I yelled down from my room, Hey mom, but I got no response. Normally she is always happy to be greeted by me, so I was confused. I ran down to see what was wrong, but nothing was there. Now, I was starting to get worried. Then I heard, Hey Jake, from behind me. It was a monotone voice, nothing like my mom's. I turned around and my mom was there. Well, physically she was here. However, she just stood there staring at me, with her head cocked to the left ever so slightly. Her eyes were open wide, and her smile was huge. So I said, hey, in a puzzled tone, and she responded with, where is dad, in that same monotone voice. I responded, he's at work, just like he is every day at this time. I was starting to get freaked out. Very good, she said. Then she turned around and walked out the door. I was really scared at that moment. To make it worse, my phone started ringing. I picked it up and it was my mom. Hey honey, I'll be home soon. I got stuck in a meeting at work. What do you want for dinner? I just dropped the phone and ran out the back door. Now I'm at my grandma's house with my mom and we don't know what to do. It's like 5 a.m. and I have no intentions of sleeping. I'm not sure what came to my house earlier, but it really scared me. Why did that thing want to know where my dad was? I need to get all this sorted out, so I'll leave you off here for now. I'll update you all if I find out more about the situation. Every summer, when my sister and I were young, my dad would set up a tent in the backyard. I have fond memories of afternoons spent playing in our super secret clubhouse. To enter, visitors have to either recite the password or pay a reasonable entrance fee, one cookie per club member. The tent was ours, and ours alone, and we could leave it in a big mess as we wanted to without getting scolded. Comics, toys, blankets, and even clothes were scattered about on the floor but neither of us minded the chaos. On rare occasions, Dad would let us spend the night alone in the tent. Those nights were special to us, as they were the only times we got to do anything outdoors, you can say. We lived in the city, and the closest we got to nature was a small forest separating our yard from the neighbor's home. The trees were so thin and far apart from one another that we could clearly see through the other side. It barely even qualify as a forest, but despite this, I learned one night that something could hide in it, just out of sight. And that night was the last I ever spent in the tent. It happened when I was about nine years old. I woke up one morning to the sound of my dad shutting the attic door. The noise could only mean one of two things. Either he wanted to go down memory lane and wanted to look at our family albums, or it was time for the tent to come up. I ran out into the hall, only to see him pulling the lumpy bag that contained our childhood fort. My dad smiled as I squealed and bounced with excitement. While my sister and I were eating breakfast, he slaved away in the backyard, pitching the old patchy tent onto the freshly cut grass. From time to time, we would hear him curse, but whenever we looked out the window, he would just smile and wave. He wanted to make us happy so he would hide his frustrations as best as he could. In hindsight, he could have spared himself a lot of grief if he had taken the time to find the assembly instructions, but he always managed to figure it out on his own, eventually. We knew we were in for a special treat when my father disappeared in the garage, only to return with an extension cord and the small TV that used to belong to the kitchen counter. It had broken a few months back, but my dad had found a way to repair it. He ran the extension cord from the socket near the sliding glass patio door all the way into the tent, where he then plugged the TV. Upon his return, he said that my sister and I were gonna have a special movie night. We were excited. That night, dad brought us popcorn, candy, and some hot chocolate. He kissed us goodnight and left us to our marathon of Disney tapes. 
We fell asleep to the sound of crickets chirping outside and animals singing on screen. It must have been near midnight when I woke up, my bladder almost exploding from all the hot chocolate I had drunk earlier. It was quiet outside. If not for the sound of the static coming from the TV, I would have thought someone had swallowed all the outdoor noise. Just as I started to unzip my sleeping bag, the motion sensor porch light suddenly came to life, casting both bright rays and a strange shadow on the wall of the tent. Dad? I asked weakly, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. That's when I heard an unnatural shriek in response, unlike the call of an eagle. Though the sound was lower and more drawn out, I examined the shadow. Its proportions were stretched and exaggerated, as though someone had made a semblance of a human out of pipe cleaners. As the distorted shape drew near, I fearfully reached a hand towards my sister, shaking her sleeping bag. She was tucked in all the way with only her dark matted hair sticking out from the top. She had always been a heavy sleeper, so when she fell to awaken, I wasn't surprised. Dumping sounds resonated on the porch as the figure moved. It began to circle around the tent. As terrifying as its shadow was, it was more terrifying to lose it from view every time it reached the back of the tent. Little by little, the stalker walked around circles around the tent drawing even near with each rotation until it was within arm's reach. Its fingertips, or what I assume were fingertips, crept along the fabric, producing a noise like paper being torn. Fortunately, it didn't seem capable of piercing the protective mesh. Suddenly, the TV jerked violently towards the tent's entrance. The thing was pulling on the extension cord. The zipper began to unravel as the power cord lifted against it. I dove towards the TV as swiftly as I could and unplugged it. There was so much tension on the cord that my actions caused the form to fall back with an anger shriek. This time, I heard my sister moving. I barely had time to process what happened. When I saw something slide into the tent from the small opening it had just made, its texture was unlike anything I had ever seen or have ever seen since then. I would say it was similar to a lizard scales, only more porous. My instincts made me smash the TV against the finger, causing it to retract. Quickly I pulled the zipper back down to the ground, only to feel the creature pulling it in the opposite direction. It wanted to get in, but I wasn't going to let it. I may have been just a child, but I was stronger than I looked. In the midst of all my issues growing up that I had, my father once tried to lock me in a room. Despite the fact that a grown man was holding the door shut, I still managed to crack it open a few times by sheer force of uncontrolled will. Now, I was doing the same, but with a flimsy zipper instead. A snap resounded in the backyard, and once again, the creature fell and shrieked. I could only determine that the slider on its end had broken. Its ear-piercing noises made me quiver. I felt paralyzed but I kept my hands firmly in place. My sister, on the other hand, merely turned over in her sleeping bag. As I sat there in fear, I heard the creature's footsteps head towards the woods, where they grew more distant. Even when the motion sensor lights finally turned off ten minutes later, I remained vigilant, never letting go of the zipper inside the tent. I imagined myself as a brave soldier, protecting its post, until I eventually passed out from being tired. When morning came, I could still see my sister snoozing in her sleeping bag. That's when I flew out of the tent, sipping it back up behind me. I felt like she would be safe in the light of day, and I would be able to go get my dad. However, as I reached the patio door, I saw my sister sitting at the kitchen table, smiling while swinging her legs while she scooped up her favorite cereal. The sound of the zipper slowly opening behind me brought a wave of fear to my chest. My head turned slowly towards the tent, just in time to catch a glimpse of something running into the woods away from my house. Something with black matted hair and strange proportions. It was gone in a flash, but from what little I could see of it, I could tell it was smaller than what had been outside my tent earlier. 
My sister had woken up long before me that night. The click of the VHS tape coming to an end had actually woken her up and she had gone to sleep inside where it was warm. My cousin lived in the East Agency of the Navajo Nation in a community known as Crown Point. She was still living with her parents at this time and was a good girl. She had good grades, a nice ride, and was very popular that she even played on the basketball team. When she told us this story, it was very creepy, and the events that follow would also deepen my beliefs in the traditional Navajo way and the Navajo culture. My cousin was coming home from basketball practice, which ran past sunset. It was during the colder months and so it was dark by the time she pulled into her neighborhood. She pulled into a small housing community that she lived in. It was far from a fenced community, but there were street lights, and the neighbors weren't too far from one another. As she got closer home, she saw a group of dogs. This wasn't unlikely as there are random packs of stray dogs that roam the communities. These dogs don't belong to anyone, and they get food from wherever they can. As she got closer, she noticed that something was off about the dogs. There were four dogs, and they were all sitting in a circle, all facing each other. Surprisingly, this really didn't face her until she spoke about the event later. Since this was a housing community, my cousin couldn't barrel down the road, so she slowly drove past a group of dogs and kept going on her way. As she continued to drive, she noticed from the corner of her eye that something was running alongside her car. She turned her head to see that a brown dog from the group was trotting alongside her car. This actually didn't face her until she hit a speed bump and the impact of the bump made her car wobble. She looked over at the dog again still casually keeping pace with the car. She tried to ignore the dog and try speeding up, keeping in mind where the speed bumps are. The dog continued to keep pace as well. My cousin had to eventually stop at a stop sign. She began to feel uncomfortable and tried keeping her eyes ahead. But curiosity got the best of her. She looked over at the dog. It was facing straight ahead. She continued to stare and that's when the dog turned its head. But instead of the face of a dog, there was the flat face of a man, covered in hair and smiling from ear to ear. Fear shot through her body, and my cousin pushed the pedal to the floor, not daring to look back. She finally got home and barely pulled herself in the door, weak from fear. My auntie came to her, and my cousin began to sob. She told my auntie everything, and they scheduled a meeting with a medicine man the very next day. That same night, my cousin was trying to get some rest. She was tossing and turning and felt very ill. She could hear people outside laughing and talking in Navajo, but she didn't think too much of it because they lived in a community near plenty of neighbors. The next day, the medicine man told my cousin that she was very fortunate. He said that the skinwalker wasn't meant for her. The medicine man told her that she just happened to spot it when it was out to bring another person misfortune. He also told her that the laughing and talking that she heard in the night was the skinwalker talking to his friends and that he had scared her. The medicine man told my cousin that if the skinwalker had been for her and she had seen him like that, it could have very well killed her. After that encounter, my cousin suffered from being very ill and she actually had to stop playing basketball for a while. She had many ceremonies and even a cleansing performed on her and she eventually got back on her feet. This is one of many stories that my mom always tells us about, especially when electricity goes out at night. When I ask my cousin about it, she confirms it's true, but she also doesn't like talking about it too much. She also told me that the medicine man told her not to go around and telling people about this experience because apparently these skinwalkers can hear you and you're basically drawing them to your home. So this will be the only time that you hear from me. Whether you believe the story or not, I would recommend not talking about skinwalkers with other people.
the nighttime brought two rules we had to live by. No matter what family you come from, you are to not look outside or be outside. This one night brought my brother to sneak out to meet a girl who lived nearby. Teenage stuff, if you get what I'm saying. Anyways, the later hours of the night and he's sneaking back through his window. As he's getting ready to pull himself in from the absolute darkness of the night, he heard my dog growling a few feet behind him. The dog we had at the time was from a known, highly aggressive breed, but to hear him growling came as a surprise to my brother. He claimed to call out soft to the dog, but the dog was unresponsive. After a few seconds, my brother slowly began walking towards the dog, and as he got closer, the smallest glint of light hit my dog's face. As his face softly lit, my brother realized that the dog was not looking at him, but the area of the roof right above his bedroom window. As he slowly turned and looked at the empty space, he began to recognize that heart-sinking feeling of somebody or something watching him along with the sounds like if something was sitting perched on the edge of the roof. The more time went by, the more dread he felt. He was so scared that he rushed through his window and to our mother, panicking and telling her what he did and what was going on. She was so scared she wasn't even bothered by the fact he snuck out. I remember watching and listening from my bedroom door and seeing her turn pale and begin to shake. She told him to never do it again and to keep his window closed. It was from that day on that not only our neighbors, but people from the complete opposite side of the community began to open up about their experiences with the thing that walks among us at night on the roofs of the house. One of which includes a close relative who was home alone with an aunt. One night, she claimed to begin hearing something clawing and walking on the roof. When she noticed it, she said it was like it noticed her or knew she was there because when she tried to find a room to shield herself in, the footsteps followed right above. Think of your ceiling made out of glass and this thing always knowing exactly where your foot is falling and the exact moment you extend your foot there is another step it wasn't until i reached my 20s that i began experiencing this creature on a weekly yes i said weekly and i am not exaggerating it was like clockwork especially once snow began falling heavy footsteps before the sun was up that woke me up around 5 a.m at least once a week here and there those footsteps would be substituted for what I only imagine is a grown man in steel toed boots running with what sounded like chains dragging. I was so desperate for sleep and to not be bothered that I started putting holy water on my ceiling but it seemed to only hold off whatever this being was for a few days before coming back again. As time went by, not only did my neighbor but the residents who lived several houses away would tell my family about their experiences with the thing that lurked on top of our houses. One neighbor was simply sitting in the living room when he began to hear like somebody was walking above him. He said it left him paralyzed with fear and all he could do was sit and stare in horror at the area above him. Another friend who lived three houses down was taking out her garbage when she heard walking right above her doorway and left her so scared she ran inside and refused to be out at night for months. I can go on and on about the stories that left our friends, family, and neighbors shaken to the core for hours, but for now, this seems to be the most nightmarish creatures our people have continuously shared the space with since we were forced into colonization. Even though these stories and these experiences can spark a lot of interest in seeking out these beings. I simply ask that no one actually take the time to. You never know what might follow you and make your home its home as well.
Maybe those noises you hear in your attic at night when you're going to sleep are actually coming from your roof. And maybe it's something that has followed you already because of these stories and these experiences that you dig into. If you think you have one of these things making your home their home, I would recommend to call a priest or a medicine man somebody who's familiar with these things because if not next time it might be outside your window